uh, we're really happy to be here and to be sponsoring this together with um, the Nez Perce tribe. And Jim Harbeck, uh, it's been it's, it's with the, the Nez Perce department, it's really been wonderful to organize this together. And together with the, the staff from the lodge and Madeline with the ponytail and the white uh, top uh, is just a wonderful resource. So if you have any questions, find Madeline. And I think it's just wonderful to be here in this, 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 this beautiful building. Um, just a few things before we go. We have about a dozen or so people off-site, we know, and Desiree Tullis here, a uh, board member of OLA, is, is running the computer, and through Zoom, there'll be connectivity to those other people. Some of the speakers, I don't think it's today, uh, I think they're all tomorrow, will be, be off-site through Zoom. So we just have to be aware that there are, there are other people who have to remember to call on questions and a couple of speakers will be on our side. Um, during the session, let's not use this door, these doors. There's an exit over here and the toilets, the restrooms are there. You know, that's part of this emergency where it's a large block inside. Well, there's a door there. It's going to be okay to use it. Yeah. I, th I think it is okay. okay. So you can exit at the back and then re enter and go upstairs or, or just wander around. Right? Okay. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Uh, the food, so we, you know, we have, we've had breakfast. Please tomorrow, try and be here between 7.30 and 8. It's a little bit hard for the, the caterers to keep the food warm. Um, and likewise, when we have lunch, um, don't, don't run off and look at the down in the, these streams. Keep that for later so that we, we, we're sort of here pretty much for a long time. Um, and when you return your um, cutlery, in the bin back here, there's a separate little section for the cutlery and for the, the plates. So you can kind of do that sort of thing. The talks will all be 20 minutes, apart from the Nakia has to, to kick things off as 30 minutes. So 20 minutes, speakers. That's designed for a 15 minute talk and five minutes question time. The convener, like Jim, is going to be the convener for the first. We'll be holding up for five minutes. That means five minutes. That means after 15 minutes, five minutes left of the 20 minutes, and then a two minutes. So we really want to keep on time. So please be looking for that if you're a speaker. Uh, we have a pretty pretty big stick. But uh, you can use this. We don't have a laser pointer just yet. Yeah, sure. We might have a laser laser pointer later in the day. Wow, that's pretty bright. You can probably position yourself so that you're not right behind uh, uh, well, that. There, so between in the sessions, between the sessions, uh, please visit the foyer here. There are posters there. There are uh, about nine posters, I think. So there's information there that's additional to the information that talks. So please visit those. Um, there are there are some vendors. There's a CD3, Ed from CD3, Dylan from YSI Zylon, and later in the day, Ryan from the Nitrophics will be here. They've been our sponsors. Desiree, can you advance the slide? So uh, speakers, just ask Desiree to advance the slides. And sort of <laughs> Um, so please visit the, the sponsors. Uh, we're really grateful they've, they've helped with us, as have the, uh, the, the tribe. Thank you very much, Jim. So these are the sponsors of uh, OLA. The ones that are here, uh, the Nez Perce, have uh, Jim's cable outside, CD3, yeah, YSI, and Trophics. There we go. Um, and we have a silent auction. So um, Andy Shadell, our treasurer, OLA treasurer, will introduce, talk to you about the silent auction. That probably some people I know have visited the table. There's been some, some activity out there, some bidding. Uh, and he'll talk to you before, just after this session, before the first coming. And um, I think that's it. 
So welcome. It's so good to be here. Thank you for coming. Uh, have uh, a good time absorbing some new energy uh, and, and information. Uh, and Jim, yeah, thank you. That's fine. Right. Sorry, sorry. Jim Harbeck from the Nespers Fisheries Department is going to convene this session and introduce Nakia Williams. Thanks, Jim. And I must say, it's just been a pleasure to plan, plan this with, with Jim, together with um, um, Rich, Rich Miller. So Rich and Jim are the ones who came up with the concept for today's program a couple of years ago. Good plan. Thanks very much. Well, good morning, everyone. So good to see some old friends here and meet some new people on this awesome day. Um, and by the way, you know, uh, likewise, I appreciate um, our interactions over the past many months. And I'm going to actually use this not as a pointer, but more of a plug. Can anybody do that? Well, I said the phrase, good morning to you. Just said it. And I, I want to make it known that if we were here 150 years ago, I would have said to you, Pops may be, and you would have responded to saying, Pops may be. It's a next first phrase meaning or similar to good morning. But it is said, in a more heartfelt way, with a little more passion, maybe a little more genuine feeling. It's a deeper way to say good morning. So, good morning, Jody. Now, I'm about to say something that you're going to want to hear and respond to. So, have a seat and get ready. <laughs> So this morning, I want to say to you, tots may be. Tots uh, may be. Awesome. It's very appropriate that we speak those, those words. I'm sure you know that Nest First Country is right here. This is homeland for the Nest First people. So it's very appropriate um, that we say those words. And because this has been homeland for thousands of years. My pleasure to introduce to us today Nakia Williamson. Nakia is the tribe's cultural resource department uh, director. And he comes to us this morning from Lapway, Idaho. And he comes to speak about how deeply connected the Nez Perce people are to this lake and to offer a blessing upon our conference. So please welcome Nakia Williams. How many of you saw the Well Lake Marines for the first time driving up to the lodge, either today or yesterday? So several of you, great. Those Marines are spectacular, especially in the morning. And they're almost perfectly formed. And for me, this is key. Without those moraines, there is no Malau Lake. This morning we have um, here one of the world's experts on the Malau Lake moraines. And when I first asked her if she'd be going to speak, she said yes. <laughs> Before I even finished my sentence, she was saying yes. And in her humble way, she said, I would be honored to speak to this group this morning. So I, I very much appreciate that. Uh, she is the author of many, many geology oriented books. However, her most and it's all about Willow Lake and the many, many stories of this place. So now that I've promoted her book, <laughs> please welcome Dr. Ellen Fisher. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here and to present some information about the range of Wallow Lake. 
to such an august and well intentioned and expert group of people that also follow the key, which is quite good. Um, I basically uh, try to get through this in 20 minutes. I don't have any songs for you, but uh, let's take a look at sort of how these moraines formed and how old they are and why they're important to this lake. So I'll see if I can remember to send it in. Is this advantage? No. I don't know. <laughs> it's just like me. You can do that until I get this figured out. Sorry. Okay, next. There we go. Oh boy. Anyway, the moraines basically of Palau Lake. Are, they have kind of a complex history. And you can see, Jim, can I have that pointer? And then we're going to worry about the wax. Yeah. Do you want the laser pointer? This is the laser pointer. It is working. Okay, great. So I have two weapons. <laughs> <laughs> the important thing was getting this away from me. <laughs> so if you take a more aerial view of the terrains of Malawi Lake, you can see that they're they basically follow along the sides of the lake and then come around the bottom of the lake. Um, and that there's more than one, that there's a whole series of these moraines that come down actually all the way into Joseph's and the high school is built on the top of this more extensive terrain. The, um, so, let's, oh look. So let's take a look at what the moraines consist of, and basically it's just a really quick run through of the, of the geology of this particular area. 300 million years ago, the rocks of the Malawas were volcanic islands off the coast of Haiti. Uh, probably not all that far, but quite a long ways. And then, so we have volcanic greenstones, that would be these, you'll see these, this kind of rock. If you walk around and look at this, the rocks on the moraine and the rocks in, in the Willow River and rocks on the county park. So these are our ancient volcanic rocks. There are also ancient sedimentary rocks as well, but they're not as well preserved as moraines as they're more fragile. Then, <laughs> okay. And then these islands collided with North America, basically becoming the part of North America that goes from Idaho out to Central Oregon, and for that matter, most of the Sierra Nevada and California, uh, most of British Columbia, and virtually all of Alaska. So it's a very complicated and large set of uh, islands and microcontinents. Uh, it took geologists quite a while to figure all this out. Okay, we get all of these. So, the, the interior of the Wallawas, the lake's basin area, is composed of granitic rocks, some very large granite intrusions. Um, they're about 120 to 100, 100 million years old, and basically they were formed from melting of these rocks that were, they were part of this collision. Uh, then there's a long hiatus of nothing happening here. Stuff happens over further and further to the west of Oregon, but basically we have very little in the way of a record of, of any volcanism or sedimentation or anything happening here until the Columbia River salt sprout. And that basically, so if you look at Chief Joseph Mountain, the, the big long mountain that's on the uh, media west side of the lake, Basically, you'll see that it's it's formed basically of green stones in the bottom. Then there's sedimentary rocks on top of that. Those are all part of these ancient volcanic islands. And then um, you'll see dikes of granite going through there. And then on top of those older rocks is a sort of a carapace of Columbia River basalts. And the Columbia River basalts at the very top of Chief Joseph Mountain are called in Naha salts. And they, if you were to 
find their mates, the, the rest of those flows, you would go down to the town of Imnaha, which is at an elevation of around 1,700 feet, whereas the top of Chief Joseph Mountain is over 9,000. And so we have six or 7,000 feet of uplift on a fault that runs basically along the base of Chief Joseph Mountain and along the base of the Malawas and the base of the faults that uplift in that whole range between about 14 million years in the present. So until 14 million years ago, this was kind of a flat plateau. It would have looked more like Zumwalt Prairie does today. Maybe Kansas would be a better, more, <laughs> more you know, mentally accessible idea. Um, so, so that's basically the geologic setting. Old rocks, granites, salt flows, and then uplift of mountains. Still going on very, very slowly and subtly. We still have earthquakes of magnitudes ones and twos and threes here every year. Okay, so then the question is what's in the rain? Uh, most of you probably know this, so I'll just skip through here, but here is a uh, really good example of what the Malawa Lake Basin might have looked like if we were here 19,000 years ago. Okay, so moraine is an accumulation of unconsolidated gravel that is transported by a glacier and left behind when that glacier melts. It usually consists of rounded or semi-rounded boulders, cobbles of sand, and a ground mass of clay and fine sand. And the glacier basically is the importance is that it shows the location, path, source, the end, and the history and age and ultimately age, as you find out, of the glacier that formed it. So we give names to these things. Nowhere near as elegant as the Kia's names, but nevertheless names. So they basically show the extent of this long vanished ice, and you can imagine that if this glacier melts away, that basically you will have its, its outline, its ghost, so to speak. So the moraines here, you can think of them as, as being sort of a, a haunted house where they show the presence of this, of this ancient glaciers. So the terminal moraine, we call it terminal moraine, marks the end of the glacier. The recessional moraine marks where the glacier halted in its retreat. And that shows us times when glacial ice, instead of melting back, was rejuvenated because it got colder for a while and it just built up and just stayed in the same spot. And the conveyor belt of the glacial glacier kept carrying the, the uh, boulders and the sand and it eroded from its part of its U shaped valley. Um, and then lateral moraine are the moraines that we look at in awe when we drive in here, and that's these moraines in here. So that would be terminal, lateral, lateral. Got that little quiz again. So how do moraines form? Well, moving glacial ice acts not as a bulldozer, but more as a conveyor belt. As these glaciers move through the mountains, basically, they erode mountains, they chip off pieces of the mountains, they scoop them out from the bottom and carry them. And so glaciers and glacial moraines are handy because they basically show us where this particular glacier came from. Did it come from the interior of the Wallows? Was it an early glacier that was basically carving down most of those early basalts? And therefore all the stuff that's left here are basalts. Or was it a late glacier that carved out of the, uh, the deeper rocks and so it's leaving green stones and these granitic rocks? So <clears throat> lateral moraines basically are deposited as the ice melts and sometimes carried along at the top. And the, the moraines uh, often are quite a bit lower than the top of the glacier ice. So if you can imagine that 
um, the Malala Lake still looks like that first glacier. The ice in Malala Lake would have been 100, the ice in the glacier would have been 100 or 200 feet higher than those moraines. Those moraines come up about 900 feet above the water level and about 1,000 feet above the deepest part of the Malala Lake. I do have two hours for this right <laughs> <laughs> So, um, so, when we're looking at this, there's the terminal moraine, west and east lateral moraines. So, basically, if we look at the last 10,000 years, uh, or actually the four major glacial advances during the mid Pleistocene from roughly 300,000 years ago. And then some cold times within the last 10,000 years. Um, and moraines, as you saw earlier, can record multiple glacial advances. So this is a relatively young moraine, the Kennecott Glacier in Alaska. And you can see easily that there's a couple of glacial advances here. And this is all basically probably within the last 16, 18,000 years. Uh, because it's advancing down into a much, much larger glacial valley. Here. So this is a, these are very young moraines. So these outer moraines here, uh, or at least this one, may be related to the Little Ice Age in the 16th and 1700s. So moraines are really a uh, good help in understanding how and when these things form. We look at a, at a uh, map of Malala Lake and its depth. The deepest part of Malala Lake near here, and Joseph is up here. The deepest part of Malala Lake is basically kind of right in this area where this glacier would come down and, and the ice would continue to cut down and then it just kind of lose all of, all of its power. Right here. There. And the valleys coming down into Malala Lake, this one actually doesn't, this is Hurricane Creek. There are all these classical U shaped um, glacial valleys. So U shaped because it's steep here, flat on the bottom, and then comes up steeply on the other side. This is the Matterhorn. And basically back in here is Sacagawea. Which is the highest peak in the clouds. We all remember the key is named for that. So, Mirror Lake and the Lake's Basin are the headwaters for Malala Lake. And then the question is how long have these moraines been here? How old are the moraines? And the answer basically is kind of erratic, or at least it comes from the erratic. So so the way we figure out how old moraines are is using what's called cosmogenic radionuclei dating. Um, it basically uses the uh, spalling of cosmic rays, basically um, bombarding silica of um, atoms in quarks. So we all basically, at least a lot of us, we put on sunscreen we went outside because basically we don't want ultraviolet rays to damage our skin. And rocks have the same problem. They don't have any sunscreen, and it's not the ultraviolet rays that damage the minerals in them. It's cosmic, it's cosmic rays. And so consequently, if you, the cosmic rays put quartz nuclei producing beryllium-10, Two minutes. Okay, great. <laughs> so here's people sampling boulders. And then most erratics on the east and west moraine are granite. They have lots of quartz in them. So the Cardi and Clark in 2004 used um, cosmogenic radio dating to date the moraines at Malawa Lake. Basically, by, by sampling, as you saw very, very briefly, people taking cores of those granites and then taking out of those cores, just the surface quartz and counting the amount of beryllium in there. 
And so the dates that they got initially were 21,000 years from the outer East Moraine, 17,000 in the inner, and 16,900 in the west. So the, this log moraine goes all the way to Chosen because the high school on it is around 21,000 years old. And actually, you should see a second on that. Um, and then the East Moraine is 17,000. 16,000 was the, the average age on the on West Moraine. And so consequently, there's a couple of ways of advances in the very late Pleistocene. So the decay constants, as science always is discovering new things, which is really confusing some, to some people, but nevertheless, <clears throat> the decay constants changed um, with better calibrations. And so now the dates that we have on these are about 23,900 to 24,000 to the outer east moraine, 19 to 18,000 for the inner, inner moraines. <clears throat> When the Q was talking about 16,000 years, he was referring to a um, Esper's village called the Tiki, which is at Cooper Creek or Cooper's Ferry on the Salmon River in Idaho. It's been dated by work with uh, Oregon State University archaeologists in collaboration with the Esper's tribe at 16,500 years. And those people who settled there moved to that place because they were driven away from their home by a big flood. And we know that the Ice Age floods basically affected the Columbia Basin um, as early as 20,000 plus years ago. And so it's quite possible that. I didn't do that. At any rate, so so it is not only possible, but it's probable that the Nez Perce people were here at the time the brains basically when looking at this, you would have simply seen piles of gravel here. With and we know that there were Columbian mammoths and potentially woolly mammoths that grazed this area and wandered around this valley, along with most of other places seen animals we know that sockeye had been coming up into this lake. Uh, as soon as the glacier began to melt back, probably. Uh, I think Shane and Robin are more details on that. But at any rate, that's all I'm going to say. Thank you very much. Hey. Thank you very much. I usually don't say this out loud to people, but except maybe on occasion to my wife. But I'm going to share it with you this morning. She looked like you're saying I used to think that I was a really good fish biologist. And, and However, when the Nesper's tribe hired our next speaker, I quickly corrected my And I won't say much more than that, other than um, please welcome my colleague, my friend, and a very great and excellent fish biologist and researcher. Dr. Shane, okay, I have a set. It's way better than that. <laughs> See how this goes. Well, uh, thanks, Jim. Um, not sure if I'll be able to live up to that introduction, but I'll do my best. Oh, I can already see that PowerPoint has changed the font of my slides. So I apologize, some formatting is off here. 
So today I want to talk briefly about um, how we're building capacity um, to evaluate Blau Lake's food web, as well as other potential limiting factors for sockeye reintroduction to Blau Lake. And before I get into that, I want to acknowledge to be from the center. Um, we'll start out with Nez Perce Fisheries. Um, I want to thank Jim for helping put together the conference. Um, he's also been a steadfast uh, supporter of research on the Law Lake and our field office and department. Um, Sam Williams is here. He's a biologist working on the lake with this project. Um, we have several other biologists that are contributing to it. Um, I'm not going to list everyone's names. Um, Meyer Memorial Trust has provided us with a capacity building grant. Um, uh, we're in our fourth year in funding there. It's got a lot of funding, but um, it's allowed us to get our feet on the ground for our built with water. One of our primary partners is ODFW. Um, you know, without the work that they've been doing on the lake for decades now, and that we're currently working on. Uh, we really won't be able to answer a lot of the questions about the uh, lake. Um, we're also been working with USGS. Ken Tiffin and Dave Beauchamp provided valuable advice on you know, designing studies for the lake um, and also providing a boat for all right. Then we're also working with Bruce Benny out of Idaho State University. Um, his isotope lab is running our stable isotope samples, and we're also working on a paleo technology project here for Bruce. We won't have time to talk about that today, but in the future meetings, it's a pretty cool project. So, my goals for today um, I want to talk about our capacity building efforts. Um, most of the presentations can be about a bioenergetics model and approach to looking at coconut consumption in the lake. Um, and then I briefly want to talk about some research questions that we're proposing um, really specific to um, sockeye reintroduction to the level. So I'll start off with capacity building. Um, about five years ago, um, some interest was expressed in our field office in Joseph to make some research on the lake and we're here to go to NW. Well, I don't think we even had a second. So we're really starting from the bottom up. Um, and thanks to that funding from the Byron Memorial Trust, um, we've slowly been accumulating uh, field and lab equipment and supplies. We have a small research boat, um, basic limnological gear, uh, lab where we can process soil plankton samples, um, fish stomach samples. Um, and also a part of that, of course, is staffing. And we've also started a summer internship program um, where we're recruiting travel members, um, trying to target kids going to college, I shouldn't say kids, young adults going to college or early career professionals. Um, and that's been a really rewarding experience for both, I think, the interns and for our field office, and hopefully a way to recruit travel members to come and work with their tribe here in Northeast Oregon. And then also uh, building partnerships. You know, if you want to co-produce information with your co-managers, you need the capacity to do that. And I really think that's one of the better models for co-management is when you work from the ground up and you're co-producing that best available science and information that we're using to make management decisions. All right, so where are we? Uh, let's look at the broader scale map here first. Star here is Joseph Law Lake. Um, I wanted to include it's a little hard to see on here, but these dots here are the eight main stem dams, four on the Columbia and four on the Snake River, that sockeye salmon that are as juveniles leaving La Lake would have to go through, and then as adults when they return. And it's approximately, I haven't had a chance to go through the GIS exercise, but I think it's around 700 mile migration. 792. 792, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, if we take a, a little closer look, here's a bathymetric map. It's probably the same data that Ellen had for her map. Um, you can see that Malala Lake. So, at the north end here, that would be the outlet. That's where the dam current is at. We're down here in this corner by the inlet. Um, it's a deep oligotrophic lake. 
These contours are feet, so it's over 300 feet deep. Typical secchi depths in the summer, I think 10 to 12 meters. So definitely an oligotrophic system. So what's swimming around out there? So this is a very simplified pelagic food web conceptual diagram. Um, the arrows represent energy flow, so essentially consumption of resources. We'll have to start down here at the bottom with phytoplankton, primary producers, the primary and only food resource for most zooplankton. Mice and shrimp have been introduced to the lake. Um, they will also consume phytoplankton and zooplankton. Um, Kokanee salmon. Um, in a lot of systems, their primary food source is zooplankton. Maybe their sole food source um, in systems with mice and shrimp. Sometimes the mice are available for consumption, sometimes they're not. And then lake trout have also been introduced into a lot of lake. Shooting a lake trout in particular can be good at consuming mice and shrimp and get through, get them through the growth bottleneck to become larger lake trout. Are then able to be piscivorous so they can eat the fish, such as coconut. And in some systems, actually several systems here in the west and northwest, we have this combination of mice and shrimp and lake trout doesn't often bode well for coconut horn systems where they're still solid. So taking a closer look at coconut monitoring, this is data that NordMW has been working hard at for well, since 2008. We also have some other monitoring data that goes back much longer than that. These are based on hydroacoustic estimates. So this is coconut abundance and the vertical bars from 2008 to 2021. You can see that abundance has ranged widely from you know, maybe less than 100,000 to all the way up to a million. And then in the black dots here, that's the average size of spawning token. And so if you look at this kind of, it looks like there was potentially a boom and bust cycle going on. There's at least a loose relationship, depending <coughs> on how you look at it, maybe a strong relationship between abundance and the size of um, spawners, which suggests that coconut are probably food limited also based on information from other systems, that's not unusual. So one of the approaches in lake food webs, when you've got, if you're interested in consumption, so your predator demands, and then your prey supply, is to use a bioenergetics model. Um, bioenergetics is basically a way to compartmentalize a fish's energy. It's a mass balance equation. It's well established for both lab and field tests. And it's really based on this equation where consumption of an by an individual fish, so calories in that energy, is equal to energy it takes from metabolism, which is primarily respiration, energy it takes from waste, so excretion and ingestion. And what's left over goes into growth, so both somatic and reproductive growth. So the bioenergetics approach that we're using on the law lake to look at coconut consumption is you model average individuals. So you can look at different cohorts or different size groups. Um, in order to do that, you need to know growth, diet composition, and thermal history. Um, all very attainable metrics, um, especially in, in a lake such as Wild Lake here. You need to know the caloric value of prey items, which we can easily get from the literature. Um, you have to have a, a model that's been parameterized. There's a very good model for Snirka, um, for Snirka, Sakai or Tokini. And then if you have population estimates, you can scale those individual consumption estimates of the population scale. And in this case, we have that the hydroacoustic data, hydroacoustic data on the well link. So in order to get that data, um, we have to get our, our hands on fish. Uh, so the approach for that has been to use a combination of angling or creel, uh, trawling, and gill netting. 
The goal is to collect samples from fish in at least spring, summer, and fall so we can get seasonal data. That's when most of the growth occurs from fish in temperate lakes. So when we do get our hands on fish, you know, length, weight, um, stomach samples, uh, stable isotope samples, so a muscle tissue sample, um, and also keep track of what depth that we are capturing this fish. So first looking at growth and diet composition, I don't have a lot of data to present yet. Um, our age and growth analysis, we're really just getting started there. Uh, it's an extremely important input into the bioenergetics model. Um, we're building up a good, good data for that. Um, really just getting started there. Um, our stomach content analysis, so looking at diet composition, that's in progress. Um, we've got through quite a few samples. Um, we've got more than 250 samples we've had in the lab. Um, just uh, some brief notes on what we have been observing there. Uh, these are really qualitative assessments. Um, mysis have been um, present in more than half of the stomachs, which is encouraging for the COVID population. Um, midge pupa have been common in the spring and early summer. summer. Um, and also, um, as expected, a lot of some plankton in the stomachs, uh, both podosterans and copepods. And of those podosterans, um, as we would expect, appear to be the preferred soil plants in the crater. Yep. So another way that we can look at um, the diet of kokanee and other fish is to use stable isotope analysis. Um, these are example data from 2020. Um, just briefly, uh, nitrogen 15 fractionation. Um, is indicative of trophic level, so higher nitrogen values, higher up in the food web, lower and lower down. Um, and then carbon, the further to the right you get on here, tends to be more of the floral or terrestrial food sources, and to the left, more pelagic. We've got different species that we sampled for the 2020 data here at least. See lake trout, we have bull trout up here at the top, see kokanee and mountain whitefish. Down here, another approximate trophic level, as well as suckers, rain, and trout. Then, when we add in mysis and zooplankton, um, this is another way that we can both corroborate the stomach content analysis. When that data is not available, we can actually infer diet information. So, this is really an exploratory assessment. I put this together yesterday. First time looking at these data. Uh, but we're also interested if kokanee are um, experiencing any kind of change in their diet um, as they grow in larger, some kind of ontogeny. So I looked at fork length, these are kokanee samples from 2019 to 2020, and then nitrogen 15, so essentially trophic position. And it does appear that there might be something going on there. Um, we'll have a better idea once we can uh, compare this to the stomach content analysis and also add a bunch more samples in that we're collecting in 2022 this year. So we've also been going out and doing limnological sampling approximately every month. This year we did a little more intensive every two weeks. This is temperature on a heat map gradient essentially. Um, you can see the lake stratifies here starting in May. Stays pretty stable through the summer and see when uh, the lake turns over here this fall. Now, for the bioenergetics, we know what depth we've been capturing fish at. And then, so through the season, we can then assign temperatures to the fish. We get a thermal history for what an average individual fish has experienced. And that really feeds back into the metabolism of the fish, which then will allow us to estimate how much we eat. Um, this is just a brief look at interannual variation. Um, this is first week in August, some temperature profiles. Not much different year to year, difference year to year as we'd expect. Um, we see a little more variation in the spring and fall. So future work, we're pulling together those pieces to estimate company consumption. 
Um, we're also sampling the prey items for coconies, the zooplankton and lysis, um, which should allow us to look at predator prey relationships and potentially the carrying capacity of the lake. And the bioenergetics input, inputs and the prey monitoring in and of themselves you know, can be really informative. They also provide us with uh, valuable baseline information prior to a slot cutter being finished. Uh, just briefly, these are some uh, research questions we're proposing to look at in the future. I'm really focused on sockeye reintroduction, uh, migration corridor, particular thermal conditions for adults that are going to be returning to the Lava Lake, uh, non native species, as I mentioned, uh, that combination of mysis and lake trout and several systems to not go well for sockeye. Spawning habitat, in particular, we don't know much about shore spawning in the Lava Lake something we'd like to investigate more. Um, and then I mentioned some issues about the productivity and growth. This is not the same food web the sockeye used to return to. We've had more than a century of no marine derived nutrients returning to the um, And then we'll get into more operational stuff uh, directly related to reintroduction. We have a presentation on that later. And that's, that's all I got. Thank you. We got 20 seconds for a question. I could have built 20 seconds. So, you mentioned the uh, and how do you think that like our like the activity of our people who have never been to the lake or talk about that? I've thought about it, yes. And I mean, at minimum, I'd like to do some chlorophyll A sampling. But that's part of building up capacity. So it's not something that we explicitly can look at. Okay, one more question. All right. Thank you. Our next speaker is one of the most well-rounded ODFW biologists that I know. Uh, he's worked extensively on the west side of the state for um, ODFW, and he's also applying his expertise on the east side as well. Um, he's a proficient researcher in small streams, large rivers, and in lakes. This guy didn't do it all, and he, and he does it. Uh, you are uh, very diverse. Uh, I, I think this guy's handled more uh, different kinds of fish than probably anybody else. So he's really good at what he does. Um, however, I, I'll have to say this uh, what I admire and appreciate most about um, our speaker is that he has an undeniable willingness to work. And collaborate closely with our local nest first fisheries staff. And I sincerely appreciate that. And I know for a fact that he has spent many, many long, cold nights out on this lake <laughs> pulling nets with nest first fisheries staff standing side by side with him. So please welcome Dr. Michael Bailey. Thank you, Peter. Thanks, Jim, for inviting me. Um, I don't think Jim knows too many of you. <laughs> Anyways, um, so kind of like Shane's presentation, this is really um, kind of early, early stage work for him. Um, and a lot of the stuff I'm doing is really just kind of basic uh, sampling, um, monitoring type work. So um, kind of a general talk. Um, I would like to note that um, we've got a lot of impact contributions this week in the lab that I work with between uh, ODFW and this week's tribe and the Fish and Wildlife Services coming this year. Um, and then, yeah, we worked a lot at night and during the day and all that. Um, it's been a volunteer effort to come out with like this. A lot, of, a lot of great people have come out and helped us. Um, a lot of people smiling with their fish during the day, but then uh, it's dark nights. So, anyways, um, I just kind of want to talk a little bit about um, 
just officially done on the final day, and then just a very little bit about what we can do. Um, so just a quick history, um, some highlights that I pulled out. Um, prior to the 200s, about 30,000 sockeye salmon probably came here in the Pacific Navy, in the Ocean. Um, after 1850, there was a couple of canneries operating on the lake. Um, they canned up to 60,000 pounds of sockeye a year. Um, and then some things started happening a little different in the 1900s. Um, sockeye salmon collapsed, um, and this was part of the hatchery practices and part of the dams and structure that blocked migration into the lake. Um, but kokanee persisted, so um, I don't know this group very well, so I may mean, um, just state some stuff that you know, but um, kokanee is a landlocked sockeye salmon. Um, they're just a different place compared. So things were going along with the Coconut in the lake, and then stuff really started happening in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. So the Malau River was channelized. Um, this was part of the flood control, um, then also development. So state park development, bottom of land lawn, things like that. Um, this, this definitely altered spawning habitat for most of the fish in the bay that probably degraded the water Um Also during this time period, bull trap wrecks were created. Make trout were introduced. Um, the kokanee population collapsed. Um, and then kokanee were reintroduced from uh, sources outside of this uh, drainage. So likely the, the indigenous genome disappeared after that. Um, and then mice and also also There's a lot of stuff going on. Um, after that, um, the lake itself as a fishery it was primarily managed for the payment of trout production. And also, company um, fairly recently, there were a number of state record company taught in this lake and one of the um, And then, bull trout were also introduced um, in the late 90s. Um, I, I'm not really involved with future stuff, but the stuff that people are talking a lot about now is rehabilitating the dam. And that's fairly important because. Um, that will likely require consideration of fish passage for all native migratory fish. So that there could be a big change to the fisheries. Um, and then for some salmon reintroduction. Okay. So um, there is some annual monitoring that goes on. There's a lot of effort um, towards coconut. Uh, Shane talked about that. And then rainbow trout are stock damaging so that is a sport fish. Um, there's also some focus on bull trout, and that's primarily in the stream. So the east, primarily the east of the Colorado River, but, but all upstream to the Um So, you know, when I looked at, you know, what's going on up here, um, you know, there's some things that I thought we could just fill in, and just really basic stuff on you know, what's out there, about how many are there. Um, and then this was one that I was really interested in is uh, our bull trout use in the lake. Um, I've worked on bull trout lots of stuff that's interesting. Um, and then, you know, getting some of this information certainly could help us when we're talking about rehabilitating the dam and what we need to consider. And then also, you know, looking at the sockeye salmon issue um, a little bit more holistically, um, you know, not just with. What the company are doing, but you know, what else is out there? We shame talk about that a bit too. So basically, we went out and sampled the fish sampling. We are sampling the fish sampling, and I'm just going to keep that real simple. Um, basically, what fish do we see if we go out there? And what Sam we use to give the technique. Um, we're using gill nets. Um, we've been sampling primarily in 2022. We've been in spring summer sampling. We've been doing a lot of sampling in about two weeks. Uh, we also have some data from 2018, which we out um, a little bit more half past. So this map shows Willow uh, Lake. Um, these green dots are where we place benthic gill nets, uh, red dots are suspended gill nets. So these benthic gill nets, they sat on the lake bottom. Um, we sampled anywhere from about three to 38 meters deep. So in total, the fungus means 
I've got in the flat the, the suspended gill nets are suspended off the bottom of the lake um, a different than the strata. It's in the zero to 42 meters to the surface down. Um, and those were usually suspended in at least 45 meters of the um, And we just looked at what species we caught, the numbers, um, and the length, and then we took some biological samples of this character. Samples of tissue for age growth analysis, as well as samples. So, real quickly, what we saw you know, we caught bull trout, lake trout, kokanee, noodle trout, alpine fish, and suckers. Um, this is the numbers we caught of uh, different cultures. I think we will get that suspended. Um, so, this is just kind of an idea of relative abundance. Um, I do want to note that. Um, well, this isn't a estimate of accurate for like absolute abundance by any means. We're likely underrepresenting token in this um, just because we, we sampled those habitats where they would be a little less. We're likely underrepresenting lake trout because we didn't sample really deep or juvenile It just gives us an idea of what's out there. Um, here's some length frequency distributions. So just work length on the x axis, uh, the number of individuals per bull trout. Uh, suckers. A couple things I want to note here, real quick, is that um, you know, the bull trout and lake trout do grow quite large in this lake. You know, anywhere from the biggest bull trout is about 700 millimeters, lake trout over 90 millimeters. These are, these are 30 to 40 inch fish, um, certainly piscivorous. Certainly piscivorous, are about 500 millimeters. Um, so Big fish, lots of lots of age classes. Um, kokanee primarily in this size group, and this is the same sense of tension between the trawl around. Um, one of the benefits of using these gill nets is we do get a larger sizes also, which we can put down the bottom. Um, so up to I think about five pounds was the biggest gill nets. Rainbow trout, um, not a whole lot to say there. Uh, about white fish, kind of clumps here. Uh, these suckers are fairly large in this um, so that's what it's really nice to see. Uh, I want to talk about these some of these species individually. Um, so we'll keep going to the time probably, but um, so bull trout, this is um this is a native migratory species, a state migratory because it will require some consideration for the answer. Um it's a native top level predator. Um, it's also listed as threatened throughout the United States um, and a sense of species in the state of Oregon. In Malawi, Lake, it has a really complex history. Um, this map here shows the Malawi um, subbasin. Um, we are here, uh, most of these streams flow south and north. Um, so, bull trout currently are in places like Boston, Bear Creek. Deer Creek, the Minor River, and really densely populated in the Little Minor River. Um, if you actually went downstream a little bit, so kind of up here is the Wanaha, that's also a fantastic bull trout fishery. You go downstream even further to the snake, and then, then back upstream, you end up right over here, which would be the Inaha. And the Inaha, the Wanaha, and the Little Minor River are some of the the highest density of bull trout in what we call the Midwest Columbia region. That's, that's a massive region that's from uh, basically John Day uh, east into the Clearwater, which also has a huge bull trout, um, all the way north to Washington. So this is really a good bull trout strong. Um, so this was a great place to get bull trout historically, and it's still in a lot of ways it is. However, they're intentionally extirpated in the 1940s. So basically, a pier was placed across the stream. And that was primarily for rainbow trout management, but it gave fish managers the opportunity to <coughs> catch and kill any bull trout that was moving upstream to spawn. And this was to benefit from uh, rainbow trout management for fish. So this is a piscivorous fish. They didn't want to. So they effectively extirpated bull trout um, in the in the 40s, 50s, 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 50s. Yep. Okay. Um, 1997, there was what I call a haphazard reintroduction of 600 bull trout into the lake. This was 
rather than the Lao Valley Improvement Canal, which is in the Pinching and Grand Venetian Tunnel. Uh, um, there's no real records of why they did this, and they had thought it was just, you know, needed a place to put fish while they were salvaging fish. So, uh, I call it haphazard. Uh, our bull trout started showing up in the recreational fishery in 2000 after this, in the 2000 after this reintroduction. Um, we know that they were in the West Fork and East Fork of the Loud River upstream of the lake as early as 2010. Um, recent genetic data strongly suggest that the fish that are in this, this stream are from that um, green reduction effort. Um, however, in 2005, or as of 2005, we have to consider the state of the lake. And as recently as 2015, um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service um, recovery plan for bull trout um, basically says there's some potential that bull trout in the Willow River. Um, may have an absolute component. What that means is they spawn in early areas of the stream and they spend uh, most of their lives in the lake. So, as early as 2015, there's really no definitive answer to the animal trials this lake. Um, I would argue that, you know, they are extended this lake. Um, this is an uh, angler caught fish in the lake just a couple of years ago, very large. Um, and our own data show that yeah, there are bull trout there, just to the size of glasses, stage glasses. So, um, if anything else, I, I don't think we would consider what this is being occupied by the Um, real quick, lake trout, non natives, top level predator in the lake. They were introduced in the 1950s and early 60s, which um, I suppose the the Game Commission wanted a large, isoporous sport fish uh, just about a decade after they eradicated the large isoporous <laughs> um, That's as far as I'll go on that. Uh, they outnumbered bull trout five to one, so this, um, <coughs> in our sample at least, and like I said, our sample is probably under practice since we talked trout. This could be a concern in the future. Um, lake trout are associated with um, declines in both company and bull trout in areas throughout West So um, this might be one to watch, especially when we start getting outside that introduction. Um, Kokanee, we talked a lot about this. Um, they're also a native migratory species. Um, you know, they were abundant pre-1800, um, collapsed in, in the 1900s. Uh, native token collapsed after that, um, originally these tokens. So, um, I should be looking at people know about token already. So, uh, rainbow trout, another native migratory species that we have in this lake. Um, they, uh, this area is well within their native distribution, so there's no doubt they're here uh, historically. Um, however, since the 1940s, about 33 to 35,000 um, rainbow trout have been stocked in this lake. So uh, it's unlikely there's much of the chicken left um, here. So I'm uh, really um, highly bullish in support of this Mount whitefish, another native migratory species. Um, they're kind of bottom oriented. They will prey in the pelagic zone. Um, I don't know what to do, it's limited. Um, they primarily spawn in streams. Um, they will spawn in lakes, but I don't think we know anything about kind of their life history in this lake. So that might be one thing to look at and we'll get some more information on them. Um, they could play a pretty important role in the future of this game. Um, and then finally, suckers. Um, the suckers in this lake are gorgeous. They get big. Um, we probably have two species, large scale and bridge lip. I think most of the clover catch from large scales. It's kind of cryptic, trying to tell apart. Um, you know, they're usually in the shallow water, the spawning streams and everything. So you can go find out there. They're providing biology here. And 
So other fish to think about, brook trout have been stocked throughout the high lakes. Um, they trickle down, they're in the streams now. Um, they hybridize with bull trout, um, which is a problem. Um, actually, in this system, hybridization rates for about 16% of the char and trout and trout in the system. So that is an issue. Um, we also have sculpting species. Um, and we don't get them in our sample to get a pair And that, that's where I'm going to end. Um, Mom's got through it all. <laughs> There's a few minutes for questions. Anybody have a question for Mike? Do you know what year the mice is? Did you say 65? 65 on that thing. Is that what you're going to be watching? You know, it's kind of debatable. I don't think we know. Um, that is one thought that they could be coping and that could be positive. Um, that same time period is when Lake Trout got introduced and started ramping up. So could be the two, could be Lake Trout. It's tough to say. You know, usually these things all happen right at the same time. It's kind of confusing. Why couldn't you get Which? Shrimp. 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 Oh, um, so <clears throat> I think it's to be like maybe. There's some lake in the, in the Northwest where uh, biologists recognize that um, kokanee production is just phenomenal in their primarily fishing prices. And so there's this big push across Western North America to stock prices everywhere where you want to go. Um, the problem was this lake that they're basing it off of, they later found out you know, maybe decades later that there's some interesting upwelling in the lake that forces those mices into the water column um, and make them, them more susceptible to open production. Unfortunately, in most lakes, you don't have that, and the mice is competing. So it's uh, unfortunate, to say the least. I wonder if you'd be willing to comment or write an update on the dam modifications and whether that seems, if you know, but like whether it seems like what might happen. You know, I, that's, I'm not involved in that. Um, Becky, you'll be talking about that later. Sorry. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, there are any I mean, there, there's land right down, downstream of the lakes, but I don't think there's anything um, up here. No, I believe there's a Oh, not in the lake, but in the and the tribe is in the uh, transportation that way. So they're all. Thank you so much. Yep. Um, we feel, I think we have a 15 minute break now, I Permission here. So, anyway, we've got uh, four really interesting talks this session uh, about different stock iron production programs, including uh, the Lava Lake itself is going to be the last one.
So first up here, we have uh, Eric Oberly. Um, he's with OFW. Uh, he uh, has his background from Southern Oregon University in Oregon State. Um, he's worked in the Tucker Willamette, and uh, right now he's working in the Deschutes Basin with OFW. And um, he's been working on the reinvention program on the uh, Fisheries biologist for Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. I want to thank Theo from the Oregon Lakes Association and um, Jim from the Nez First Tribe for inviting me and my wife here. I've been here a few times. I hunt elk in the area and I've been here on working uh, with uh, Kyle and Yankee back in the back in the day. So it's a pleasure to be here again. It's my wife's first time and she absolutely loves it. So uh, I want to recognize Megan Hill. She co authored. Uh, this presentation, and I, I did modify it for this, but she uh, is a natural resource manager at Portland General Electric and, and funds funds me, so it's always nice to recognize your funders. <laughs> Let's get going. So I work in the Deschutes River Basin, and if you've lived in a cave for the last few years or you're not from the area, um, the Deschutes River is a very popular area. It's a tributary to the Columbia River here. We're going to be focusing in on the Metolius River uh, and the Subtle Lake area. That's uh, that's where we're trying to reintroduce a, a sockeye population. I gotta say, I'm also in charge of trying to reintroduce a summer steelhead and spring chinook population to the population. So there's there's a lot going on. Uh, but you know, I'm gonna focus more on the Metolia side. There's Lake Billy Chinook, and as you can see, let me go over to the side real quick. Here's the, the dams that we'll also be talking about that were built in the 50s and 60s. So History of sockeye in the basin. So the lake is one of only two historical lakes that have sockeye. Obviously, the other one is right out of our window. 1914, the USGS stated that there was a run of bluebacks that ascended the Subtle Lake each year. Okay. By the 1930s, passage barriers uh, suppressed the sockeye population, and, and the Game Commission at the time started a hatchery supplementation for an angle call. Briefly talk about that. Uh, so I just wanted to show some pictures that I found from historical fish passage barriers that were in the basin, uh, Power Dam, Subtle Lake Outlet in the 30s, uh, Lake Creek Dam, 1925s, the 40s. So Lake Creek actually wanted to build a swimming pool for their for their guests. So they blocked the, the creek and backed the water up and built a swimming pool. They still have a swimming pool now, but it's not, it doesn't use uh, lake water. So there was a, all kinds of human disturbances that happened in the 30s and 40s, and then the big, the big dams went in, Pelton in 58, Brown in 64, and that was the end of any sockeye program. Yep. <laughs> You did that. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this is a this is a great example of uh, or a, a picture of, of what happened in the basin for sockeye releases and kokanee releases. You know, had about if I remember correctly, it was about 1.3 million sockeye were released in the basin from a, quite a variety of stock origins. Some of these being actual sockeye programs, others. Uh, a mix of sockeye and landlocked kokanee. And the, the graph to the right there is real interesting to me. I think the numbers total about 13 point some million, million fish got stocked in these water bodies from the Deschutes Basin. And why I pick these water bodies outside of Odell Lake, Crescent Lake, Palina, Wikia, 
they all have a direct connection to the Deschutes. So these fish, and we have found that these fish do migrate out of these water bodies down the Deschutes and into Lake Billy Chinook. Whether they actually out migrate out of Billy Chinook is unknown, but we had millions of kokanee in the basin that were going back and forth and some going downstream. So quite interesting, and I just thought I'd share that with you real quick. Quick limiting factors on sockeye. This is uh, Subtle Lake. So Subtle Lake, again, was one of the only two nursery lakes for, for sockeye in the state. Someone put smallmouth bass in there a few years ago. So that's the first, that's the first bass that I caught through sampling. Uh, it also, Subtle Lake also has uh, the robust population of brown trout. So to reintroduce sockeye to Sutter Lake is, is going to require some, some management actions, in my opinion. Obviously, we have some all kinds of other um, limiting factors to sockeye that, that you know, pretty normal in a fish biologist world, trying to trying to work and, and restore populations of fish. We'll talk about a few of those, but just just know that the Lake Billy Chinook and Sutter Lake, where we have our two kokanee populations have a lot of other native and non-native fish species in there. Plus they have a uh, robust standing uh, form. So we do, uh, we, when I say we, I mean a lot of other people outside of me. I've been collecting a lot of information through hydroacoustics and, and uh, mark and recite on our Lake Village and Kokanee population. That ended in 2019 and we don't know if that's gonna continue we would like it to continue, but we'll see if there's funding there. But you can see we've, we've seen a variety of populations of the kokanee and Lake Lily Chinook, and uh, hopefully we'll continue monitoring this in the future. Can you mention what the SWW is? Okay, so the free SWW is the Selective Water Withdrawal. So in 2010, that was installed, and I'll get that's coming up right now. Post SWW is after, after we installed the PGE installed. So let me. I think that's the next slide. Well, I want to talk about managing a recreational sport fishery because I worked on the districts for a long time and that's what I did is I managed the recreational sports fishery. And whenever you're trying to do a reintroduction program, you have to you have to account for a recreational sport fishery. So in Sutter Lake, we have a very liberal uh, harvest on, on kokanee because they're very small and they're fun. So we want to remove as many kokanee as we can to for one to, to grow a kokanee that the anglers actually want, and two, hopefully one day we'll have a sockeye reintroduction. Billy Chinook, more uh, conservative uh, angling regulation, uh, five kokanee per day. Obviously, anyone who's got over 16 must be released for sockeye. Uh, we have a robust ESA festive bull trout population in Lake Billy Chinook that love to eat of our American population, so we want to maintain that. We also have bass and brown trout in, in So this is this is what I was talking about, SWW. This is our juvenile fish transfer facility. I thought I'd share this with everybody. This is how we get our fish out of Lake Village. Okay. Obviously very expensive. Uh, I don't know the final price tag on that, but it was uh, it was very, very expensive. But as you can see, the fish come in to the two bays right there. They get, come through, they get processed through human beings through there, they get loaded on trucks and get shipped all the way down below the three projects down to the lower Deschutes to continue their migration down the Deschutes through the Columbia into the ocean. So I have another picture of it, what it looks like from the air. Uh, yeah, that's what we use to get those fish out of the ocean. So this is what we've caught. Our PGE, you know, runs those runs that facility since 2010. Somewhat unimpressive, except for the the 2016 number of adults that came to our adult trap and the two, 2017 number of juvenile migrants that left. Uh, this is all sockeye or ochre But really, I mean, you look at it. Uh, these numbers aren't going to get us anywhere to achieving our goals of a successful reintroduction, which is a harvestable and a sustainable side of the population. So we're, you know, we're, we're sitting here considering what to do. You know, Andrew, who's going to speak, I think, after me or, or today, and, and others have, 
have really come to the conclusion that our current Onurka populations in Subtle and Lake Galishinook are not, not uh, out migrating in enough numbers or expressing or re expressing their anadromous life history. So we continue to pass any fish that comes into that million dollar, multi million dollar facility or Onurka, and we get minimal adults back. So we're going to have to change something at some point according to the genetic work and the numbers that we're getting back just aren't going to achieve. So here's what I came up with um, for the previous presentation. Is I really think there's two management strategies that we need to use to, to achieve our goals. And the red X means that we're not doing those currently. So either we, are, we collect fish, come to the adult trap, and pass them upstream, which we do with our mark with our fish that are not marked. But we get strays from other basins that come to the facility. But we put them back in the shoots frame. So either we pass those fish above or we take those fish and create a hatch. Both uh, require a lot more planning. One, the hatchery program requires space. We, and I, I mentioned before that we have a summer steelhead and a spring chinook reintroduction program, which is taking up hatchery space right now. My thoughts is that I would use net pens in Southern Lake. I've seen that happen before. I'm not a sockeye biologist, but I'm learning as I go to more of these talks and talk with Andrew and AFS was outstanding in Spokane, so I'm learning. But we need to figure out a way to get true sockeye gametes into our reintroduction program. And if anybody has any suggestions, feel free to talk to me at dinner. <laughs> so I, I, I put some conclusions on there. You know, decades of fish passage have resulted in, you know, a non anatomist life history of Onurka in the Upper Shoots Basin. We have a lot of issues with, with uh, non native species and, and native species too. That we have a very popular fishery, fisheries in some. So kokanee, lake trout, brown trout, bull trout, you can actually keep a bull trout in Lake Galicia, and it's one of the only places in the north where you can do that. So you gotta you gotta think about that. Um, you know, the number of the under juveniles passed downstream is inefficient and just not gonna achieve our goals. So we have a lot of work to do, even though we've been doing this for over 10 years. Uh, we've been really focusing, as far as I know, so I've only been in this position for a little over a year, but I've been around. And we've really been focusing on spring chinook, summer steelhead, and sockeye was just, we want to recover a sockeye program in the upper shoots, but we were just releasing the owner that they came to the, they came to the we really didn't do much management. So there's a lot to do, and I'm really excited for the future of this program. Uh, let's hope for some above average water years, but I didn't really talk about that. I'm tired of talking about water in the Chiefs Basin, but we are experiencing <laughs> record drought in there. So even though the, the sockeye used the Metolius primarily and, and the Metolius is spring fed, our springs are dropping like you would believe. So there is impact to spring fed streams during this, this historic drought, at least in Central Oregon. It sounds like in this region you guys are doing okay. But in our region, it's, it's pretty good. So the, the last point, you know, the reintroduction may benefit from incorporating true sockeye gametes into a local broodstock program. And I really believe that that's the next step. It's just reaching, obtaining those those gametes is, is one hurdle, and then being able to rear uh, the offspring of those is another hurdle. Too. Something we're going to look into in the future. Uh, I was hoping to leave some time for questions. I don't know how I did, but. At this point, that's all I have. And thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. Um, two, two, two things. You mentioned strays. So uh, the fish are pretty good at homing in on their nasal uh, regions, but some, some do it wrong. Is that what you're talking about? Right, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, all fish stray, you know, spring chinook or salmon steel population. For the most part, they go to the same basin that they were. They were born and raised in, but some fish just stray all over the West Coast. And so we do get fish, we do get adult sockeye back to our adult trap that are marked that have some 
unique bark from another basin in Columbia. And at this at this time, we just returned them back to the like, to the to the river for sacrifice. So just a follow up: in what would be some considerations for that final point? So the the the, the sockeye gamete. So these are these are fish who are currently in abundance, as opposed to kokanee stocks where you hope that they could re-establish um, an animal. Sure. And um, and so there would be an issue of the pluses and minus, I suppose, of taking fish stocks from one watershed, one geographical region to another. Right. But then there's always an intermixture from these these strays anyway. So sure. Maybe that but what what are the pros and cons there? Well I mean I think you you can use out of basin fish if the, the local basin is comfortable with doing that. I mean, there's there's disease concerns, there's genetic concerns, but the, there's no, in my opinion, there's no other way to to reintroduce sockeye to the machine space. The expression, the genetics that we currently have up there are not gonna, they're not sockeye anymore. They're just land. They've been they've been landlocked for over 60 years, and I think that there is some. I mean, Andrew's data and others show that there is. Some naturally happening with our Lake Village shrimp population, but not enough to achieve our goals. So we really need to obtain genetics from a different basin and use those as our things. Like, and we can mix. I mean, we can always use a male so sockeye and a female kokanee from Lake Village shrimp and see what happens. But there's a lot of ways. To I'm not a geneticist, but there, there's it's definitely been done in other places for sure. Right. So, in comparison, how successful has the steelhead research been? Good question. Uh, it's it, it's not meeting many people's standards. Let me just say that we're we're just not getting enough adults back. Well, we're not getting enough albinos. You know, so so PGE and the tribes and co-owners in the project have really been working on. On trying to get fish to the facility, to the fish transfer facility to get small down. The, the, the lake is so big and it, the way it's shaped, it's, it's not like Malau where it all comes down in there. I mean, we have three trips coming in and then a basin where all three trips kind of meet. So it's not, it's not, the reintroduction program is not performing like most of us would like to see, but I think there's some adaptive management that can be done to. To increase our numbers of non small small spaces, but also. Yeah. Would you have seen the beginning of the is that not the target for the reintroduction? Because I understand that that is an historical nursery lake. But it seems to me you've got more populations up there that's not the least of which is the habitat. Right. And it used to be maybe there's not now, but a lot of extreme conversions between cell and Metolius. Isn't the Metolius better spawning grounds for the fish in the location of the battle of the tribes? Yeah. So, what's, what I think what Andrew's saying is, is instead of using subtle as the nursery, fish would spawn in the Metolius and use Lake Billy Chinook as the nursery. And I think that is possible. Uh, but there's been some movement in the recent years to look at subtle and as the nursery and Link Creek, which is a tributary, the only tributary to subtle, as the spawning grounds. But as Andrew pointed out, there's a lot of complications to that with a, with a huge population of, of resident kokanee in subtle, brown trout population, and now small, vast population. So I don't know which one would work better. But you might find those fish actually make their own way. True, true. Yeah. So there's there's a couple different options that we've got. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right, uh, next up, we've got uh, Andrew Metallic. He's with the Yakima Mission Fisheries. And uh, he has uh, tons of experience doing fisheries genetics. Um, he's worked the work for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in the past, and also <laughs> the River of the Tribal Fisheries Commission. So, we go over there. Yeah. 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 
Thank you so much. Let me preface this by saying I'm never going to get through this. I had 80 slides and I cut it down to 40. <laughs> there is way too much to talk about. So please uh, acknowledge all the co managers there. I don't have time to get into all of that. I'm just going to kind of move right on. Up. We're going to be talking about uh, a program that has been spearheaded by the tribe to reintroduce the population into the lake system where historically it thrived. So this is what a timber crib dam looks like at about the turn of the century. And a timber crib dam, at least in this case, does not equal extinction or extirpation, but it, it really does. This is what we would call function extirpation, complete the population so much that it, it's no longer functional. You still see fish, but it can't sustain this. This was this picture was taken in 1910. Uh, by 1933, then we had this big earth and concrete dam go in at the end of the lake and the fish passage. And this is what you call full of extirpation. So by this time, then we almost talk how you do In fact, there were no patterns of fish. Uh, in, in the early uh, 19, uh, 1990s, just prior, there were a bunch of feasibility studies that were conducted to understand uh, the likelihood of a population thriving. And I'm not a lignologist or ecologist, and so everybody in here knows more about this than I do, but this is amazing to me. <laughs> Ultra oligotrophic low nutrient levels, remember no marine derived nutrients in almost 100 years. Uh, low primary productivity, low soil plankton density, small standing of like vertebrates, blah, blah, blah. And, oops. and uh, <laughs> Putters in the bottom, it's the bottom button. Yeah, I was trying. Okay, so, uh, and yet it was estimated that that lake could uh, support uh, up to 3 million smolts and up to 50,000 spawners. Um, in, during the feasibility studies, then uh, the, the folks that did this for DOR and Department of Ecology and NOAA uh, decided that. The, Smolts were in fact able to locate the outlet to the lake, and so that wasn't going to be a limitation either. And based on all these feasibility studies, the program went forward. I think it was in 2005, uh, this wooden flume was built on the spillway, and this is how the smolts currently exit the lake. Uh, here we just have a picture of the trap and haul process for bringing the adults up to the lake. Uh, there's uh, no local source, no, no local gene pool for this, and there's no hatchery to run. And so we take um, the outland fish from the Columbia River that are destined for upstream uh, naval populations. Um, and, uh, yeah, okay, so uh, this was the, the first outlining year, and it's a big tribal survey. Thing. Both tribal members, public. In, in, uh, so this is the location here. This is uh, uh, the Yakima River Basin. There are actually four uh, historical nursery lakes, three of them located in the upper Yakima, one here at Cheesy Books, and the upper Yakima is to the Yellow. And uh, it was believed that this system produced as many as 200,000 internal sockeye salmon a year. The Yellow is believed to be the largest producer. So, uh, currently, in the Columbia River proper, there are only two standard sockeye salmon populations. One is in Lake Wenatchee, the other is Toboggan Lake. And so, when we intercept fish here in the mid Columbia, gathering these two fish in some fundamental mix. What we've identified is um, that they are genetically highly distinct. Uh, I would say that they might as well be. Giraffes to lions because there's virtually 100% identification of these two stocks genetically. And in fact, the same thing with uh, most of the working populations that characterize them. So you can see the anti genetic stock idea of this fish is identical. 
by this stock of wood. Um, Natchee fish tend to be a bit older in margin. There's very few, in fact, less than 1% of three year olds in that population, but a significant number of three year olds in the studies. And then we have a, a difference in spawn time from mid September to mid October, mid October to mid November. I'll use the slaves to look at how to change it because this part of the same thing. So, juvenile monitoring. Uh, here's the lake 215 river kilometers downstream. It's our chamber, which is our fish facility. This is where we monitor the out migration current. There's also here's the crosser dam. There's three ladders to count the returning adult fish there. And then they, those adult fish eventually make their way up to the those adult facility. And here they are traveling all the way to the lake. Those are the wild fish returning to our system, in addition to the fish that are out connected from the fish travels. Okay, so here's what the demographics look like. This part of the histogram here represents the uh, mean fourth lane size smolts immigrating from Lake Wenatchee. This part of the histogram here represents the natural lineage wild smolts immigrating from our system that are derived from that natural population. And they were confirmed as age of onions and parent. So, first thing that pops out at least that wild we're going to take the smolts are in the upper Same thing for the slaves fish. Here's fish exiting the slaves lake. Here's the slaves lineage wild. Fish exiting our lake, big fish. Kind of strange given its feasibility studies in the state of the lake. However, what we also see is a fairly uniform fourth lane size for those matching fish from one year to the next, and a high variation from one year to the next for those soyuz fish. These are one year olds. These are one year olds. These are from 2016, these are from 2015. And these are all certainly a mix with ones and twos from, uh, excuse me, this is changed. So, over those three different years, there's all this kind of variation in the size of the fish eggs thing, which are presumably mostly one year olds. Here's what the accounting looks like for productivity. Uh, this would be the total adult spawners in 2018, the stock portions of the adult spawners. Notice 16.7% were natural fish. But two years later, as the age one plus immigrant, uh, small immigrants are heading out, our sample includes 51% of the natural fish. So this 16% appears to be producing a lion's share of the small is coming out. This is what the, uh, this is, excuse me, this is not what the lake looks like in early spring when fish are getting ready to migrate. It looks more like this because it's stored in the spring. As lake is turning into stored, it doesn't more like early spring. If that water doesn't reach the spillway flume, the fish can't get out. So, as a consequence of that, we have a uh, high variation in from year to year in the in, uh, Access to its maturity. And therefore, the small immigration does not follow the natural schedule. We also see from this, I'll call it fish cover, okay, is toroidal particles, missing eyes, descaling, disorientation, maybe as much as 70% immediately of the top of fish. So, let's see if this starts. I have a video of what it didn't start. Can you see? What's it? Um, can you? Um, why don't you? Can you do it? I'm not sure where. Okay, so it's a lottery, whether you used to like that food or not, right? But there's a lot of fish killed in that tail base as soon as they come out. But here's the solution. The OR and the Department of Ecology are building 
revolutionary juvenile uh, trends. It's called the helix. And basically, what it does is there's all these uh, tunnels in the lake bed that feed underground into this helix design so that fish can access it at almost any reservoir level. And they come out here and they go down the water slide and they out into, into the river below. It's a 200 plus million dollar project. And this is kind of what that looks like on the inside of that helix. It's not done yet, it'll be done very soon. And this, this is what those tunnels coming out to the lake. Okay, don't want uh, spawning ground surveys. So we have this area right here in the exposed lake bed and the reservoir trunk. You get all these braided parts of the river through here. Really good substrate, lots of hydrated flow. And the stock I love, they spawn in the mass here. Uh, just all of these. The other one is up here. This is another, uh, another dense area of spawning. This is the upper index survey region, including Cooper River, which is a tributary. All fish just they love it. And the substrate is perfect. Oh, by the way, just pointing out, this is what the lake used to be. And now this is what it looks like as a school. Okay, so here's another quick video. These are fish spawning in uh, Cooper River. And who doesn't want to get it? And I spent hours watching these guys fight. They just went at each other and at each other. And then their and then their ladies went at each other and see how it's making it hard. Hit me up anytime I've got days of videos. <laughs> okay, let's see. No, let's move on to the next one. There we go. Okay, so within this spawning area, what we see, and this comes from the natal populations, it's not a surprise. We see that the Wenatchee fish are picked up earlier on the spawning grounds. They're spawning earlier. And the Soyuz fish are almost quite exclusively fine after October 22nd. And so we have this temporal sort of mating going on here. There are a bit of hybrids that start to show up, and what I'm calling a hybrid is just a stock mix, right? One would answer very well. In addition to that, however, what we didn't expect was the spatial sort of behavior. So we see that the Wenatchee fish use all three regions of this area for spawning. Now, the dense down here in, in excuse me, the dense down here in, in region three. But remember, that's earlier in the season, so not really overlapping with the soybeans fish. But you see very few soybeans fish up here in these top two tiers. And I think part of that might be because of the flows in the river at that time. It's just, it's very get up. You probably just settle for what's down all the system energetics works. Um, we're also conducting regularly in the fall, and now I think also in the spring, uh, gill netting to remove. Uh, non-native non lake trout. And so this is pretty extensive uh, effort. And uh, we remove, I, I want to say remove hundreds of fish each year given this. It's, it's not for nothing. And some of these fish are just massive. Interestingly, what, uh, what we found when we were doing these gill nets for this is we would get all this sockeye bycatch. And they would be these spawned out fish and they would be spilling gamines. And so we concluded that Sockeye also utilizing the lake shore spot, but but we don't pick up any one actually in the shore. It's only the soybean fish. We get some coconut and some coconut soybeans um, hybrids, inner stock hybrids. But the only soybean fish appear to be utilizing the lake shore. So that's an interesting thing. Um, to the best of my knowledge, uh, those, that stock, the sway stock, does not make spawn in those swings. So, for some reason, we do it here. Okay, again, count the productivity. So, here's our 2016 spawners, about 42% from Menachee. And four years later, with our wild return, they were responsible for about 47% of the fish coming back. So, again, a slight advantage for the management. Okay, so here's one of our biggest issues in the Yakima Basin. This is the confluence with the Columbia. The red here equals lethal 
by last week in June, first week in July. These temperatures can reach 78 and 80 degrees, and the fish will not navigate through this water. So what happens is they stack up in this area here, or they wander all the way up to the uh, Soyuz region, in the snake, down in the Utila, they wander about, and a lot of them want to hold it out and, and get up the Yakima, but they just can't do it. So what they do is they end up spending a lot of time in that confluence area. Here's our, here's a peak, our first peak of our return, but fish tries to come back before, uh, say, the middle of uh, July, even the beginning of July. <laughs> this is where they're holding out in that confluence because they can't get up. And so all of a sudden, in the middle of September, we get these big groups of fish coming up here, showing up at those dam. They're no longer prone, no longer, they no longer have sea lice, they're wet and they're ready to spawn and they're emaciated and tired. Wounded, sitting in areas where pelicans are sitting. And these were all pelicans. This, is, this, is, this was a confirmed pelican. In fact, we've gotten pit tags recovered from the little fish. Uh, pelican colonies. So the pelicans are consuming the little sockeye. You're probably grabbing a bunch from there. And then you get a, you get a higher uh, prevalence of uh, um, and, and variety of diseases. These fish are going out in warm waters for a while for periods of time as they weaken. And so this is this is a major thing we're dealing with. And so as an example, we did a tagging study. Sorry, we did in 2020. And so of uh, the fish today. Uh, tag at bottom of 31 of those fish who determined to be the Yakima River origin of the wild fish from our failed population. And 27 of those protected them here in Florida that never should have left the Yakima. So, you know, even now, as I can, every one of the fish that should have left this is lost escape. The estimate in 2020 for the Yakima population as much as almost 12,000 fish, we only saw 2,300 that year. So we lose emission strain, wandering, and mortality due to global emissions right now. It's not the biggest hurdle in addition to the uh, The other thing that is a consequence of that late return and that, and that sitting out in the confluence is because of the energetics cost of doing that, we see a lot of spawn mortality for those bigger than two fish. So this is how we find them on the spawn. Okay, real quick on life history. Um, last year we started doing this thing called Lamp Paris in the reservoir to start capturing and detecting the fish within the reservoir itself. We found three age classes of we call them smolts in the lake. This is our typical age one. We didn't age these, but I'm just guessing we put two other age classes based on the size of this fish. Lo and behold, that's what we saw in spawning records. Thousands and thousands of unnatural sockets alongside animals in the ocean. And so here's that gene onset I showed you. Here's what we like in spawning records. We're not quite sure why that's happening. So, so it's amazing. Interestingly enough, however, if you were to look at the gamete size of these little guys and little gals, you'll see that by the naked eye, there's really no difference in the size of these gametes. It's pretty amazing. Obviously, there's even fewer this size of the eggs, and the size of the eggs is one of the biggest factors to this. It's a kind of thing that we do because these larger eggs is always a thing that we buy. That's what I have to buy my mate. I'll be around till, uh, after the first session tomorrow. Okay. So, thank you very much. Great. Um, so, next, uh,
so we have uh, David Benjamin, um, he earns bachelor's degree from South Dakota State University, his master's from Montana State University, and he's worked in Idaho Department of Fish and Game's research on the findings by various forms of salmon supplementation. His research interests include his existing hatchery infrastructure and conservation area. Currently, he is principal research biologist supervising the biology. Sneaker of a base in Sakai, a good program, and a shield of the brain. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction, and thanks to the uh, Oregon Lakes Association and this first opportunity to uh, present here today. Um, I took the opposite approach from Andrew. I should get through this. But you're going to have to take a few things on the bank because when I pull something out and blindsides you, that probably means that there's a 20 minute talk to get to that point. And I just, uh, and I, so we went that way. So um, as we move on, uh, yeah, today I'm going to talk about uh, um, an effort in Idaho to keep uh, Snake River sockeye salmon uh, on the map in the Uh Certainly want to. Oh, okay. Um, perfect. Um, I want to uh, acknowledge my uh, my co-authors, Eric Johnson and Eric uh, um, Our program is an incredibly cooperative and collaborative uh, program. Um, it's a joint effort between Idaho Fish and Game, the Shoshone Banner Drives, North Fisheries, um, the Northwest Power Planning, uh, Power and Conservation Council, and, and Bonneville. Administration. So um, we, there's no uh, uh, fisheries, uh, fisheries and permitting, and yeah, very collaborative. Um, thank all of them. Uh, today, basically, I'm going to give a really quick uh, history of uh, sockeye distribution through the Snake River Basin, since no one else has uh, touched on that. Um, talk about our programs, fruit stocks, and their genetic management. <clears throat> um, Go into our uh, why we have come to a uh, uh, our current strategy of using uh, adult releases from natural production in the lake and hatchery small releases uh, in order to uh, rebuild population there, and then uh, talk a little bit about uh, uh, some in lake production both from uh, uh, various types of early lake history releases and uh, animal production. So, let's see if we can do it. Nope. Another one. Ah, okay. Um, Snake River sockeye uh, historically were present in uh, four branches in the Snake Basin um, the Blau River here, Blau Lake, um, two lakes in uh, Payette uh, drainage, um, Payette Lake and Little Payette Lake. Um, there was one lake in the uh, South Fork Salmon drainage. <clears throat> lake, and then there were six lakes uh, in the Upper Salmon River, um, where this pro where my program is is continuing on program is uh, currently working. And uh, these six lakes sit basically at the foot of the Sawtooth Mountains that sit here. Uh, and uh, so there were Alturas, Pettit, Redfish, Elrar, and Yellow Belly, and Stanley Lakes. Uh, unfortunately. This is no longer the case. Um, currently, Snake River Sockeye is present in Redfish, Alturas, and kind of thing. Um, but hopefully, after a whole lot of hard work and good luck, um, we might get a lot of late might uh, actually come back on this list. So, getting into the various aspects of our program, uh, Snake River Sockeye was listed as endangered in 1991. Um, and in response to that, in preparation for coming on, uh, I do fishing game, show band drives, and uh, you know, fisheries, we established capital fruit stocks um, from all the fish we could get in our hands on from the lake between 1991 and uh, 1998. We actually, uh, well, these fruit stocks uh, consisted of any adult that returned to the basin, any smoke that we could trap leaving the basin, and actually residual sockeye uh, that were still in the lakes, uh, we could get off of their 
Twitter shows. Um, we actually uh, we can create two duplicate rootstocks, one at, in Eagle, Idaho, um, and one at um, McNoah Fisheries, uh, Burley Creek, and Manchester Marine Lab near Seattle, Washington. And we did that to protect the population in case there was a catastrophic loss in either one of those facilities. So these rootstocks have three goals prevent extinction, preserve the genetic identity of the population and um, propagate or expand the population of the country. So since we have this very important genetic conservation role, um, who gets spawned with who in these rootstocks is pretty darn important. Uh, and our uh, methods of doing that have evolved over time. But currently, we're using a uh, pedigree-based technique to correct our spawning that identifies in uh, many various lineages uh, represented by each individual either from the broodstock or in Adam's return that we want to maintain in the broodstock. So those fish are retained for spawning uh, into the broodstock to perpetuate it. Anything that's left over, adults that we didn't meet due to their lineages, very similar lineages in the broodstock or in Adam's return, returns are released to spawn naturally. But um, once we get into spawning, we spawn fish randomly because all the lineages are there. We care how we get them together um, in a, a one by two vector global sequence. Each female is going to have half individual males. <clears throat> um, uh, individual male, two individual males per female, and then each male gets spawned with two females. So what we have is, is rootstock that we perpetuate. Uh, using broodstock and anatomous fish. We also have a natural population that's integrated with broodstock because broodstock fish is along the lake and natural genetic returns come back here. So, suffice to say, or you know, move on, is that we've actually been pretty successful. We've managed to maintain about 95% of the original um, diversity in the, uh, in the population, and that stacks up pretty well against other uh, programs. So obviously we're producing we can release fish, we're producing uh, more fish from our root stock than we need to just uh, perpetuate the stock. Um, we spawn, we spawn about 500 females at Eagle, 500 uh, females at Manchester. Uh, with a new factorial cross, that's about 2,000 individual different crosses that we each year. So this, um, <clears throat> I did forget to mention, I'm going to run back real quick. Uh, and after spawning, we, we retain 1,500 eggs, is, is what the brood stocks are about, eventually, per brood stock. So we spawn 2,000 crosses, we keep about 3,000 eggs. That's a lot of eggs that uh, get left over. So that's, we're going to move on. Uh, from there. Sorry, I, could, I got way ahead of myself on that. My bad. Um, so we produce about 2,400 adults per year in the rootstock, spawn about uh, 2,000. So that gives us about 4,000 adults that can be released. About 4,000 adults that can be released, or 400 adults that can be released. And then um, we produce, um, like you say, we spawn. Thousand females keep three thousand of eggs. Where do they go? Well, for one thing, our brood stocks are a little larger now, a lot larger now than they were originally. Uh, we have increased the size of them because of where we went. But the additional eggs then are used to fund kind of our uh, <clears throat> our, our juvenile life history releases, release release to release fish to get an adverse return to that juvenile population. So. And now we've come to, and when we now we've come, we settled on this hatchery small groups because that's and that's where we're using these things. Uh, we the two rootstocks provide approximately a million eggs to a million eye eggs to our, our hatchery. Um, in the past, we've used uh, in the past um, 
I'll get this. And here's where I'm pulling things out of the spice to say that we can come to here and uh, we we have a reason to come. Um, put a thousand a million eggs and uh, are dedicated to um, sockeye hatchery in eastern Idaho. And the idea was to rear the smolts, released into Redfish Lake Creek. The adults would return to Redfish Lake Creek and we would, we would collect it. And it. That was the original plan. Uh, what we found, unfortunately, um, we had massive and almost complete mortality in Redfish Lake almost immediately after these, uh, these fish. Um, we identified the water <coughs> hardness differences between uh, Springfield Hatchery, which is incredibly hard, very hard, and Redfish Lake Creek, which is very soft, um, was the culprit and led to this mortality uh, response. Um, then what we found was that if we acclimated um, smolts at uh, Sawtooth Hatchery, which is about four and a half kilometers away from our uh, Redfish Lake release site, um, for about two weeks and then released them into Redfish Lake Creek that greatly improved their survival in the ACD Lake system. So this year is the first year that the first uh, fully acclimated group of uh, uh, Springfield fish were coming back. And um, glad to say that we have seen that acclimation has uh, substantially improved our survival. Um, for adults, uh, our adult returns this year have uh, increased to right about 3,000 adults to Bonneville Dam as compared to essentially zero in previous years. So big, uh, big improvement to Bonneville. Of that 3,000 that came to Bonneville, uh, about 1,100 is we uh, estimate we made it up to the, uh, up to the basin based on our pit tag expansions. And uh, we've actually trapped um, a little over 760 of those fish so far and, and more on so, so what we've seen is, is now we've actually, um, hopefully we're getting enough fish back now that we can fine tune the recipe and, uh, and, and even build from here. So how did we settle on small release uh, strategy? Um, that's how I'm going to tie up and come back to kind of some of the things that these other the eggs have been used for. Uh, we got here through a spread, what we call the spread the risk strategy. And that's where we looked at a whole bunch of different life stage releases um, and to see where we were getting on most, the most of uh, adult return bang for our buck, um, which, which, uh, <clears throat> so which strategy would the best. Um, obviously, adult. Natural production from lake has always been the ultimate goal of any recovery strategy. So adult releases, that's always been on the table. And that's that's gonna, uh, what's going to have to stay because that's where we want to get to. Uh, but then it was how do we how do we argue that? So dive into uh, each of those a little more. Um, adult releases here we see after the capital group stocks were um, established, we've been able to release between. Uh, 100 and 1,100 females each year uh, to spawn naturally. And here you can see the, um, the uh, captive females are captive broodstock, extras are in gray, and then these are the white bars are natural. So we like we track females because females are hard seed eggs. So actual numbers released are about the uh, place we we'll see here. And how do they work? How well do they work? Uh, fortunately, it's, it's nice to see that uh, as we would hope, a uh, number of females released, number of smolts emigrating one or two years later, a very nice relationship between there. Uh, more fish in, more fish out. That's nice to see. Uh, but to put this into a historical perspective, um, this is potential egg deposition and basically it just um, Standardized is difference in the fecundity between captive and um, natural fish. But so, the number of eggs and uh, the number of smolts. Uh, what we see this is current uh, production productivity out of the lake. Uh, this is historic data from the 1950s, 60s. So, these are lake productivities, which looks pretty similar between. Uh, 
between these two. So productivity of lakes really hasn't changed much in the last 60 or 70 years. So um, that may or may not be a good thing, but at least we know what we're looking for. So at least we know what we're looking for. Now moving into the uh, juvenile re releases. Uh, again, here we have by type of uh, releases of, of eggs, par, smolts. Um, and then here's what I would be talking about. This is the spread of risk period while we were working on you know, formulating our strategy of how we were going to move forward. And during, um, during this period, uh, we released about um, 600,000 um, 600, pied eggs, 500,000 or 800,000 um, par, and 300,000 swimmers. So obviously, it's, um, so that was that was where we uh, that's what we put out. Um, the smalls a lot, and you can see as we move ramped up, uh, we went to the small releases here. But this is what we this is what we were able to release rearing the nose. So once you get once the fish went out, then um, the way we evaluated evaluate this was see how what our back buck was. Was we looked at how many adult recruits per female we got from each of these strategies. So <clears throat> as you can see, if the two the small releases um, were the um, was the small releases here in, in this uh, yellow and brown. Uh, these were the only release strategies uh, that returned fish above our replacement, uh, which would be two adult project per female. So. This slide right here is the takeaway. This is why uh, we decided to put essentially all our eggs in this particular so to speak. So um, I will uh, note too that, um, that uh, you know, these brown bars that work especially well were the octopode hatchery snakes. So that bodes well for uh, that bodes well for uh, Potential. Um, let's see. So, as I wind down in conclusion, uh, I just want to uh, our captive brood stocks, we achieved our goals. We prevented extinction, uh, we preserved the genetic identity of the, pro of the population, and we were able to produce enough patient to enable uh, our spread the risk of strategy as well. Um, future goals for this is we're going to continue keeping on. Uh, Maintain genetic diversity, maintain the genetic legacy of the, of the population, and hopefully uh, um, even develop some, some better methods. Uh, we have a really good research staff labs in that system uh, working on ways to actually be improve what we've done so far. Uh, our hatchery small release strategy, um, yeah, there were some major bumps in the road, um, but I think we. Uh, We've at least identified any issues and hopefully we've addressed them. Um, and I just wanted to make sure that get out that, that there was a recent choice, I and mean, that was a recent choice. We, we didn't just go this go there and take what we take. Um, it, it was uh, we have a reason for that. So obviously our, our future goal there is to uh, refine our culture recipe at Springfield and uh in our and others. And then our spread the risk strategy overall. Um, Again, that was where we tested most. That's how we uh, made our decision on what strategy to use. Uh, we looked at a bunch of different ones. We found the best. Uh, those that would be a small release, one, one, one that brought back fish above replacement. Uh, we're going to continue to get natural production out of the way uh, to maintain the connection and in, in the integration between the hatchery and uh, populations. Um, in the future, um, some of our goals are to look at and find ways to hopefully improve uh, in lake production and, uh, and also explore any novel or new uh, culture or rearing and opportunities that might show up. And with that, I will take any questions. Thank you. 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 Absolutely. Um, last year, a perfect example. Um, 
to lower Grand Dam fish ladder you know, got hot, got too hot. That was well, they, they stopped operating it essentially, and so we got uh, special permit, we a permit, emergency permit in place, and we picked up uh, we got fish from lower Grand Dam. Uh, and we see that in the lower snake, <clears throat> even above all the snake above Grand Amputation. Now, that's a big problem for us. Yeah, Dave, this may not be the right place to ask this question. Is there, or could there potentially be enough production in that spring field to assist the production here? Anything is possible. <laughs> Anything is possible. Sky's the limit. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm heading home this afternoon, but I'll, I'll stick around until at least half the lunch. Thank you very much. But, uh, so the last speaker of the morning here is going to be Dr. Johnson, a Canadian fisheries biologist, uh, has worked in this first trial past 30 years. She's responsible for overseeing the tribe's housing program. The uh, tribe operates several countries in the state, uh, based in producing approximately 13 in juvenile population, spring, summer, and fostering global standards of state. And, Okay, Okay. thanks very much for having me. Um, so I I was hired um, by the Nest Tribe kind of fresh out of college in 1993. And uh, came down to I went to Eastern Washington University in Cheney and uh, came down to the lab with this area when fish were just being listed and we make it to this effect. Um, and I was given an assignment to give a presentation um, at a group where there was a lot of my travel folks, and I thought I gave this fantastic presentation about uh, salmon and PSA and what we we're hoping to do. And I had a tribal elder named Pips Suit. Uh, his name was Jeff Green. You know, I didn't even talk about sockeye, whatever. But sockeye was pretty much gone. Um, so I came fish and I wish to make right. And I got had him get up and he said, All I want to know is when you're going to put sockeye with you. And uh, I never been to Glow like at that point, but it made a real impression upon me. And it was just the beginning of learning um, how important sockeye hurt to the best fish tribe and how much they was inspired to come back. So I'm super excited to be able to talk about this today because I'm getting to be closer to a, the reality of that after I've been on for a long time this morning for spring. Um, this presentation, actually, I wish that uh, Jeff Yankee was here. He had provided slides for this, and this is actually a partnership um, to be able to push back in the lake. Not only the tribe, but then um, the DFW members, many other people involved, as you can see as we can So it's not just us, but I want to. <laughs> I want to uh, just give the idea of kind of. I mean, this is my my um, presentation is more of a story and less dated because we don't have like that in So I want to talk about what used to be here, what went wrong, and then what challenges we face for getting sockeye back, and kind of an idea of what we have to stop it, right? I want to start though um, with some historical background, and you have a lot of really good stuff that you can explain about the tribe. Um, for those of you who aren't from this area, it's, it's kind of important to know, I think, um, some of this history from a map perspective. Ah, so, this is a map of pretty much of the Snake Basin, and um, I don't know how well you can see it, but the black line out, out, out lined on the Snake is what the Indian Claims Commission identified as exclusive Nez Perce use area. That's for the tribe. It was exclusively Nez Perce. And Nikia talked about the different managers that lived in different places, um, but then came to allow the lake to have the stock price. So that, that was the exclusive use area. Um, when Governor Stevens came to sign treaties with the tribes um, in 1855, the tribe reserved uh, reservations 
for the 1855 treaty, and that's outlined in red dashed lines. I'm not sure how well you can see that, but it's a portion of the, of that. I think it was 13 million acres. Um, that included the areas that we're standing in today. That was part of the 1855 reservation. Um, I'm going to talk about the abundance of sockeye um, a little bit later, but basically in 1855, when the tribes signed that treaty, there was closer to 60,000, 100,000 sockeye that actually came back to this place. So then um, a lot of things happened, including gold being discovered in the Clearwater area, and there was a renegotiation of uh, a treaty with the Nesmers. In 1863, and the reservation was diminished or smaller um, in this yellow solid line. That's the current reservation today. The bands in, in Northeast Oregon did not sign that treaty. Uh, there was actually a, an effort to develop a reservation over here, and it actually went forward and then was withdrawn, I think, by President Sagan at the time. Um, and that resulted in a removal of mass commercial in this area. Um, so I, I think it's helpful to get that perspective from the map um, and understand uh, where we're standing today. It's so much um, it's kind of went off the top, but uh, so to talk about uh, stock abundance and a lot like um, when I Shortly after I got chewed out for not, for not having a plan to put a stock in Malawi, I got assigned um, to work in North East Oregon and figure out how we can help to increase the abundance of homes. Um, well, to put sockeye in from the back, actually. So we're also not but increase the abundance of species. And one of the first things we did is we contracted some, um, some folks that were knowledgeable in this area. One of them was a retired from EFW biologist, his name is Dan Biddy, to do a feasibility report. And so the feasibility of restoring sockeye and home in the park story. And so a lot of the information that I provide today comes from that piece of the that was done in 1997. Um, and this is the information that Ken put together with some of the staff that documented, there was no like sampling taken for it, but it was talking to people who lived here and uh, et cetera, et cetera. This was a timeline about what, what they saw sockeye wise in the lava lake. Um, and so um, I heard somebody else talk about this. There was some canneries at the lake. I mean, that, there was a lot of fish coming back here, right? And in order to have canneries. Um, and you can see that um, that's how they estimated that there was about 24 to 30,000 fish that were returning at that time. Um, and then they have this very small run, run very few fish seed. Even though it was a very small run, very few fish seed, there was still thousands of fish coming back in that time. And all this was you can see in the early 1900s, they actually decided to start hatchery to reintroduce and restore the abundance of sockeye to be back. Um, and they trapped fairly good number of fish we see today. Because like 2,000 sockeye made it over the Lord Rain Sand this year, right? It was originally Redfish Lake. Well, back in the 1900s, day, that was 2,700 females that they caught, captured money. And so there's like about 5,000 fish. Um, so that's the story of the diminishment of the abundance of the sockeye. I want to just um, also highlight that there was a lot of harvest pressure on those fish in the world also around this time. And so the reason that we think that there was about 60 to 100,000 sockeye back in 1855 treating time is because in the late 80s, there was this tremendous amount of harvest that was coming in for the river. They harvested about 50% of the sockeye that came back to stone there. And that's how we got to the 30,000, 20,000, 30,000 fish that came back to. They sustained a 50% harvest rate, and then still 20, 30,000 fish. So by um, the early 1900s, this little law, like Sockeye Island, sustained um, over harvest was a part of that. The other thing that happened is that there was um, a lot of the valley was being developed for agriculture, and there was a lot of diversions, irrigation diversions that were put in, and those weren't screened. They weren't screened, and there was sometimes a problem with adult fish passages as well. Um, so this was a, a little section of that piece of the building where I just pasted it in here to give you a schematic. So if you're not going to be able to read this, this is what I want you to know. Here's the lake. The blue, the blue lines are the river, right? So here's the lake. Here's Joseph. This is the Malawa River. And all these black lines that come off of here, those are irrigation divisions. 
So it was very much developed, the valley was very much developed uh, for agriculture and, and irrigation for antiquity and to gene. So that had an impact as the most of them, they weren't screened as most of the wild. Um, the probably the nail in the coffin though was what we call misguided fish culture. And um, unfortunately, um, I, the folks that look back that I think we're trying to again increase the abundance of socket in the lake that seen really decline. And so they decided to start a hatchery. Um, they tried they actually put a weir in a couple different places on the Malau River. The first one um, or in Grand Ronda, the first one was down by Troy. And they collected in 1902 8.7 million eggs, a lot of eggs, a big hatch river. And in 1903, almost 4 million. So there, the misguided fish culture was they didn't understand that the stock they needed to take. And so they took the eggs and then they put them in the ground while they were. And so those more eggs didn't have a chance because they had to like to rear it. And so pretty much wiped out um, the stock and then they were leaving that And then um, they, they, in 1903, um, they built the dam from where else is a picture of it in your mind. Um, by that time, the soccer population is pretty much gone in 1907. They didn't see anything in the back. So, in just a matter of a few years, um, pretty much, you know, but for me, soccer. Interestingly, I found that in 1908, they were recognizing that hmm, we should do something to help our soccer population. The after program wasn't working very good. And so, there was a screen that was actually installed at the outlet of the lake to keep the fish in. So that they're but um, apparently the bars in, in the screen were big enough to grow the tooth and still got out. But there was acknowledgement that something was going wrong in the community. But um, all folks pretty much of restoring Saka um, ended when the Lao Lake Dam was built at the mouth of the lake. Um, this is in 1916 um, and then raised in 1929 with no visual issue. So that was, that was pretty much that. And then um, I know you guys heard this earlier today. Um, another thing kind of went wrong as far as like maybe being a big flies company um, that were here for a fruit store, stretching the thing to restore them. Um, was there was a whole bunch of uh, impacts like uh, the channelization of the Lao River up here um, that impacted the amount of spawning that was And then lake trout, the lake trout. Company from a bunch of different places and places. I really changed how the wild thing is. Changed the um, so, in order for us to reduce sockeye in wild lake, we have a whole bunch of challenges ahead of us. And I kind of listed them down here. I'm going to step through these and talk about where we are with these and what we're trying to do. One of the important things I wanted to say from the top is thankfully the harvest issue we have never has been resolved. Um, harvest is managed in the Columbia River through the U.S. Department of Management Agreement, and that grew out of the Columbia decisions back in the 1970s. And so the current, and it has been for many years now, the current harvest rate of Sakai, the of Sakai in the Columbia River, is now about 5 to 7 percent. So it's much different than the 50, 60, 70 percent of us early in the 1900s. So, um, I'm going to focus mostly on rootstock source, um, what we can do with passage at Wild Lake Dam, the screen, screening and fixing the passageways with the irrigation programs, um, spawning house a little bit. Um, I think the folks that um, talked earlier today were going to talk about plankton and fish community and Wild Lake. Um, I'm not going to talk so much about climate change, but that is a challenge. Um, about more water temperatures in which can um, and by the way, we really haven't been here with this. <laughs> so we're this is gonna be an all hands on deck effort to try and put Lao Lake, I was talking back at the Lao Lake, but we don't have like a dedicated funding source like any of this. So we heard some great talks on sockeye, and I hope we got um, the the message that there's a few options that we have to push back to um, one of them is the company population that currently exists in the lake. Um, and in the various studies, we've determined that there's really no anatropine. They don't actually have anatropine tendencies. Plus, they're really the, the native genome is basically not there. Montana, so you can't push it to 
So then, um, as far as upriver goes, um, we've got the Upper Columbia option potentially we can add to the students. Um, and anything we've talked about, kind of what we're seeing there, I think, the you know, music in those talks. And then we've got State Mason, uh, Red Fish Lake Spot, that did. So there's a whole bunch of things to consider. Um, one, I believe that we get the points. Two, the Upper Columbia stocks are not considered to be a dangerous species act, and the same for some of the species that's danger. So we are going to have to step through all the fun consultation steps with no fisheries to be able to put much money. We do have to find a lending source. Uh, if, the only way we're going to be able to do this really is in the Patrick program. The impacts and mortalities of these fish rates as they um, go up and down the hydro systems are phenomenal. So you have to have a hatching program to, to get enough fish to survive the journey um, out and back. And so we have to find some funding to do that, some hatchery space. Um, and we actually are starting on this um, with a pilot project. I'll tell you a little bit about it. But we're in the planning stage, and so we still have to go through the ANC consultation. Um, but we're not standing around waiting. Um, I, I put this graph on here so that you can see abundance wise kind of how stock I returns to the front of your look. Um, might be a little hard to see, but the darker lines are um, fish counts at Bonneville and Rock Island Camp, which is on the upper Columbia, that is the point action in Osuyas. And then the gray line is um, the Snake River fish, but the, plump, the counts for upper Columbia. Columbia are on this side, and Snake River fish are on this side, so you can see the snake in the population is a fraction of the size. That's part of the available change. Okay, well, I'll like dam fish passage. Um, the dam was constructed without fish passage. We are currently looking at ways to incorporate fish passage in the redo of the dam. The dam was condemned in 1986, and we are working with Lao Lake irrigators to figure out how we do that. There's a lot of um, challenges we have with that confined space. It's a storage vegetable that we're going to link up and down. Um, so we're looking at um, for upstream passage, either a fish ladder or a traffic call system, um, and for downstream, um, actually the volition. And so there's a team of us working with the well in the irrigation district on this system. Right now, um, it looks like the ladder is probably not going to be feasible. Part of that is because of the water lake, the elevation of the lake, the water is up and down. Uh, the other thing to consider is that there are not native species that like, you can come on and they can make any addition to this right there. And so when you have a traffic on the land, it should be controlled by the land. Um, downstream passage, you know, we think it's going to be a service bypass, and it's not anything close to what you see in the lake dam. There is a group of folks that are working very hard on fixing the irrigation diversion of Pine Street um, and the adult passage barriers that exist from Palau Lake down to Jason and Enterprise. Um, this, these are Jeff Yankee's slides, so I won't read into them, but if you have questions, um, please come to the house. There are some pictures of what we're seeing. Um, there is a big effort in ODFW is pretty much leading this level of working closely you know, to. Um, Figure out how we can screen those barriers and provide fish passage. This picture is all those different versions that were on that schematic. And here's some examples of that uh, Silver Lake and Farmer Stitch. Those, those irrigation versions actually go out to the dam, right at the dam, and we're working with consolidating those, looking for funding to do that. There's another big diversion that's just downstream called the consolidated diversion. Um, and that provides a fish and passage problem with the adult passage problem. We can have ways to fix that and funding also. And then um, downstream, there's some, we currently have Chinook and Steelhead that can actually make it, uh, uh, that we see up above Joseph, um, but there are some partial barriers that need to be fixed, especially for stocking. Um, and also, um, some of you might have heard about this. There was just a dedication a few months ago by the um, area out here. We love places like this and sometimes on the conservation piece. And we're super excited about that, um, protecting that for some fish habitat this morning and um, 
that's a, that's something else I'm working on that's a, that's a good thing to do. Okay, so I'm not going to get into a lot of details on the pilot project, but we are working to acquire some eggs and we're working with our partners and, and um, we are hopeful to be able to actually have some fish department to put back to like some time between the 2026 and the That's our goal and our target. But this pilot project is going to be a small group of fish because we don't have a lot of money and we want to learn from the fish. We, we don't know. They've been gone for 20 years, right? Um, so we want to learn where they're going to spawn and how they're going to rear. We understand the importance of the new fishery in the lake. We know what about that. We just want to, to learn from the fish. And we, we want to learn how they make it through the dam and how they get them back up. And we're also at the same time want to learn from our partners, maybe this group them that I have better efforts with on those things. So you might think this is going to be a big challenge, but I want to tell you some good news. We have experience with being reducing animals. This is a very cool story. This is where I'm going to end. Um, Coho was also extinct in the Snake Basin. Um, and the tribe started a project in the late 90s to reintroduce them. We started in the Clearwater River. This is a graph of Coho animals that were granted in the last time they come back from the way up in the Caribbean. You can see that they were extinct. We began our restoration project here in the late 90s, and uh, last year we had 24,000 people. So that's a fraction, like 10% of what you see here. So we know it's possible. We know we can learn from fish. Um, a cool part of this is that we expanded this to the Grand Long Basin in 2017. We released Coho that had been gone here for 50 or 60 years into the Lost River in 2017. So these are pictures from 2021 in the Grand Ronde. This is a, a fishing, but Oregon angler, the Potico of the Grand Ronde River. And these are, this is a spawned out fish. Um, we estimate in 2021, we had about 5,000 of the total of the 24 that came on the Lord Rennie. They were right here. And um, there was about 100 red per year. So we know it's possible. And this picture I got from our staff yesterday that operates the last year of the year, the first coat returned yesterday. So we'll see. Any of you are interested? Yeah. <laughs> so if any of you are interested in visiting that area, please let us know. We're happy to give you directions. And things. I don't know if they got from right there today, but it's so I diverse a little bit, but I just want you to know, even though it's a, it's going to be a heavy lift, um, I really think it's possible. So. Questions? Yeah, good morning, everybody. How are we feeling? It's a pretty nice place to enjoy the morning. Yeah. It's not even super cold. Nowhere near a frost. Very nice. Thanks for sticking around. So today we've got uh, Lake Ecology this morning and Lake Management this afternoon. Uh, a couple of announcements. At 7 o'clock there will be dinner. So they've, um, there's enough food, you know, cooked food that they've, 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 they've kept. They, they just over-budgeted uh, occasion a little bit. So there's no cost to us, but I think it would be nice if we left a bit of a tip. So so seven o'clock uh, we can we can have food here. The bar will be open from five to nine like yesterday. So it'd be really nice to stick around. Um, tomorrow for the checkout uh, is be out by 11 and um, I'm not going to be around um, don't know that anybody else will be. Let's not have any expectation that, that any OLA person's here. Uh, you leave your key down here, there'll obviously be somebody from the, the lodge. Uh, if you leave early, see about re recycling these. Uh, there's that bin out there, but um, I'll probably leave at 10, uh, eight, eight o'clock or so and take that. But after that, don't worry about it. So any, any other questions about that? I don't think there's any other procedural stuff we have to go through. So same same deal as yesterday. We've got the five and two minutes. Desiree is going to be the chair this morning. Right. So a lot to manage, but I will do my best. Can somebody else do it? It might be a good idea. Okay. But I'll, I'll try. I'll do it until it's screwed up and then I'll ask somebody else. Do you, do you want to do it there? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, good. Thanks, Dan. Thanks so much for running that, uh, Desiree. Don't forget your stay. <laughs> <laughs> And we've got Zoomers online at nine. Uh, we did hear from Tony that the Zoom went pretty well, not so well for the audience questions. So maybe if you're asking a question from the audience, really sing out loud. Um, and Ron's there ready to go with the first talk. So Dan, take it away. 
Okay. You ready to share your screen? Yeah, I'm going to share a screen. Thanks, I'm Dan Scott. I'm with the Oregon Department of Environmental Quality, uh, the chair of the session this morning. Uh, first up, we have uh, Ron Larson. We'll be talking about satellite tracking, climate change effects at Oregon's uh, Fire Lakes. Okay. Oh, and I guess for time, I'll call it simple. You guys are ready. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Yes, Ron. Yes, thanks. Okay. So I hope everybody's uh, had their coffee and ready to settle in. Um, this morning, I'm going to talk about a different kind of lake than what you guys uh, covered yesterday. Uh, Playa Lakes uh, are, of course, very shallow, very turbid, warm, and without fish, most of them. So these are much different than uh, Lake Balawa. So Dorothy Hall and I um, have the shared interest in Gray's Basin Lakes, and we were interested in how climate change might be affecting their hydrology. And because these lakes are shallow, we thought they'd be sensitive to a drier climate, and thus changes in the surface area could be visible in satellite images. And this would be a way to study the effects of climate change on their hydrology. And because um, images made by the Landsat series of Earth observing satellites date back to the early 1970s, they could provide nearly a half century of data. Satellite images have brought a whole new way of seeing the Earth in both time and space. Here, for example, is a familiar scene from Southern Oregon, Crater Lake and Upper Klamath Lake, taken by the Sentinel-2 satellite. So let's talk about how satellite cameras see the world and how the images can be used to study fly lakes. For this talk, I'm gonna concentrate on one of the browsers that allow for viewing of satellite images. Um, and it's the Sentinel Hub, EO browser. And um, the browser allows for viewing different images made by satellites using different combinations of red, green, and blue wavelengths. By selecting one of the buttons over here on the left side, you can get a different combination of um, bands in order to view the, uh, the image. And two of the most useful ones that um, Dorothy Hall and I found were, are this highlight optimized natural color and this SWIR, which is the short wave infrared. The Sentinel Hub's satellite cameras take images based on 12 different uh, bands. Whoops, excuse me. And um, only a few of these are within the wavelengths that humans can see. These are the shortest wavelengths, the blue, green, and red. All the other wavelengths are in this red and infrared band zone and they're beyond what we can see. Satellite images of lakes generally show up very dark blue or black. And that's because um, the red component of the RGB image is the short wave infrared or, or swir. This is the dark color is due to the absorption of the long wavelengths by water, the scattering of the blue light and uh, the near vertical viewing angle, which means that there's very little light that's actually leaving the lake from this vantage point. For this image of Lava Lake, it, the, the short wave infrared um, bands were, was used as the red component and consequently the lake is nearly black owing to its high clarity and 
resulting lack of light scattering. Down here in this graph, um, it shows the, the percentage of light loss in one meter of seawater um, of different wavelengths. And fresh water is very similar. Um, but the important thing is that um, red light is attenuated very quickly in water. And these, these numbers here, this is just for the downward direction. If the, the light is scattered back upwards, there's also a similar loss. So in one meter of seawater, you could have over 80% of the red is lost when you're viewing it with a satellite. So now I want to turn your attention to playa lakes. So what are playa lakes? They're basically big mud puddles. They are often more beach than lake, hence the name. And it's, this comes from the fact that they are very shallow and, and usually they're located in arid environments and thus their surface area can vary greatly over time. And in fact, most of the time these lakes are dry because playa lakes are often shallow and have clay substrates, they can be quite turbid. And this can cause classification problems when using satellite images. So this was the first question we wanted to evaluate was, can we actually use uh, satellite images to study the hydrology of uh, Playa Lakes. And down here at the bottom, I've got uh, some examples of turbidity samples from lakes. Um, the first sample over here at the left is relatively clear, and this is probably very similar to what with Lake Palau water would look like. And then Moving over here towards the right, you can see progressively higher levels of turbidity and down below are the associated um, nephilometric units, which is a way of measuring uh, water clarity. So generally, the playa lakes fall into this um, zone of over here on the right-hand side being highly turbid. So why should we be interested in these shallow, basically mud puddles? Well, it turns out that there's an amazing variety of uh, invertebrates, uh, plants, and some vertebrates that live in these lakes. In fact, most of these invertebrates and the plants that I've shown here don't occur anywhere else. They're all the good uh, fly lake or vernal pool uh, species. And the biodiversity is quite high, and they've adapted to this life in this highly turbid, shallow, um, temporary environment. So here's some examples of Oregon playa lakes. Um, these are pretty representative of what you would see if you were flying uh, at low elevation over um, south central and southeastern Oregon um, in, during a wet year, you'd see scattered over the landscape are these uh, small, highly turbid lakes. The examples I'm showing here are um, in the range of about 30 to 60 acres in size. But some of them like Lake Aver, Goose Lake, uh, Malheur, Harney, those playa lakes can be much larger. So here I wanted to show you how um, Lake Abert appears in using different band combinations uh, of sentinel images. On the left-hand side is what's termed natural color. The image was made using the visible RGB bands. And note over here, at the north end of the lake, uh, you've got some gray coloration. This is alkali and mud. Lake Ebert is a salt lake, it's a soda lake. So as the lake 
desiccates, it leaves behind a lot of alkali. In the second image in figure B, this is um, made where the red component is the short wave infrared. And you can see over here on this ply up at the north end of the lake, it's very dark colored. And this could cause problems when using the, the scene classification algorithm. And um, over here in figure C, you can see that actually that happens. Um, the scene classification classified parts of the playa as being water. And so that obviously it could be misleading. So uh, now I wanted to turn to um, showing you some comparisons of satellite and aerial photos. Um, over here on the left, you've got two photos um, taken a low uh, elevation um, along the eastern shore of Lake Abert, looking uh, north and then south. And the main thing I want to show you here is that there's, there, there is some water. This was taken last year, last summer. And, but most of the lake is, consists of alkali uh, and mud. And nearest the water area, there is some damp mud. So you can see that in both directions. Now turning over here to the natural color image, um, there is this is where the water is. And the rest of the lake bed is relatively dry with just alkali and mud. In figure D, the shortwave infrared shows a lot of blue color, which could be misleading. Um, and sure enough, over here, when you look at the scene classification image, the classification indicated that a lot of that alkaline mud was either ice uh, or snow. So that was definitely misclassified. So let's look at some of the playa lakes that were concerned about these smaller ones that are very turbid. And we've got two examples here from um, on Abert Rim, Skookum Lake and Featherbed Lake. And in the natural color image, the lakes are shown pretty accurately, both the color and the, the size. Um, in the shortwave infrared image, uh, the light blue color could indicate problems, but in the scene classification um, scene, the water area was accurately uh, classified. So in summary, here's what we found um, using the Sentinel Hub EO browser, that the natural color images usually showed water pretty accurately, although there, there could be some problems that to be aware of. Shortwave infrared images usually identified water areas being dark, blue or black. However, in some of the images such as Lake Aber, alkali covered mud appeared light blue and consequently could be mistaken for water. And the scene classification mapping sometimes misclassified alkali or mud as being water. So based on these findings, we found that satellite images are useful for monitoring playa lake hydrology. However, ground truthing is recommended to ensure water areas are accurately identified, especially if scene classification is used to identify water. And you know, that's just standard practice in science that you wanna to try to have multiple lines of evidence when um, you're making any kind of measurements. And finally, um, Dorothy Hall's team, which is funded by a NASA grant, is working on some algorithms for measuring water quality parameters for Great Basin lakes, such as total suspended solids and chlorophyll A. And next year, um, we hope to present some of that uh, data. So thank you for your attention. I'm hoping there's 
a little bit of time for questions. Um, Ron, I'm curious to hear if you have, if you've been working on Lake Abert, if you have any updates on sort of the status of the lake after this dry year and any kind of conservation efforts that are happening for the, the lake. Yes, there actually is. I'm really pleased that there's quite a bit of efforts um, ongoing. Um, there's a collaborative process that started in the Chihuahuan Basin that's hopefully uh, we'll find some, perhaps some solutions to get getting more water to the lake. And, and also the USGS is starting up um, a program um, that is focused on salt lakes throughout the Western US. So I'm pretty encouraged, but I'm really proud of what Oregon Lakes Association is doing under uh, Theo's leadership. Great, thank you. Uh, Ron, um, how far back does, would that time series go with the same sort of satellites so you have consistency and can, can establish time series for given lakes? Well, the Landsat series of satellites, the, the first images I think came out in like 72, 73, but unfortunately the quality of those images, it, it, it's really <laughs> not, they're not so useful, unfortunately. So, but by around 1975, we're getting much better quality images. Uh, the images are gonna be limited um, for use in the lakes that are around 30 to 50 acres in size because of the resolution of the satellites. But I've been pretty surprised at how useful they are, especially for lakes at the size of uh, Lake Abert, which is um, 60 square miles in area. But you, you, I don't think you mentioned Landsat in your talk, didn't you? You, you, you were using Sentinel, which is, doesn't go back anywhere near as far as Landsat, or, or was your conclusion that the natural color uh, format is fine and that's what Landsat delivered? Yeah, the, the Sentinel hub um, has access to both um, the European Space Agency satellite, which is Sentinel, as well as the Landsat series. So you can, you can go to that site and access um, pretty much all the images from the um, government-owned satellites. Um, I think the Sentinel Hub uh, browser is the most useful. So it looks like Joe is getting ready to talk. Oh, Randy, we've got two minutes. Ready, ready. Yeah, Rod, Randy Jones. Um, I'm really interested in the relationship between our Oregon lakes and wetlands. Um, so fringe wetlands, um, wetlands within the watersheds, and uh, let's say climate change here in the context of your talk, do you think the Sentinel um, Hub browser has application for detecting changes in fringe wetland areas? Maybe even Dorothy's work with NASA around water quality functions? So, uh I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't get all that um, question. Unfortunately, the audio quality uh, of the of your system is not very good, and I'm having trouble understanding what uh, what the questions are. Yeah, I mind. Sorry. Speaker right here. Yeah. So Ron, how about this? Is that coming through? Yeah, I'm still, uh, I'm still having questions. 
Okay. So maybe we can maybe we can um, use the chat to do some more. Yeah. I can follow uh, up later. Yeah. So, uh, next up, we have uh, Joe Ellers from Maxtep Products. His talk is gas emissions, regulation, and market lakes. Thanks, Dan. Nice hearing from Iran. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, gas bubbles of late, and it's a topic that I uh, never had any intention of working on until it started costing me money in the field. And uh, I'd just like to acknowledge my co-author, uh, Ben, my son, who's an engineer, and he is responsible for all the hydroacoustic works uh, that we've done. <laughs> So uh, it turns out uh, there are a number of gases that are that emanate from lakes: CO2, methane, and you know the, the sulfide, nitrogen, and uh, they can uh, come from a variety of sources: groundwater, uh, decomposition organic matter, and in case Oregon, certainly volcanic activity. And the time of these can be highly variable from continuous, such as what we see in, in diamonds, seasonal, and, uh, and then sporadic. So hopefully at the end, if I've got time, I'm gonna talk about some examples of sporadic gas emissions in Oregon. So uh, I first bumped into this issue uh, working on Diamond Lake, where we began doing some uh, paleo-logical work, uh, trying to reconstruct uh, Fisheries effects on the uh, on the lake, and of course we went to use the original map shown in blue over there on the left uh, that showed no significant variation in in the uh, slope of the lake. Uh, and so, uh, as we often do, we went towards the deepest area of the lake, like at sediment core, and then just on the uh, on the idea of having it back up, we moved out up to the northwest into shallower water and collected another core. And uh, after we had done that, uh, we, we began finding out additional information on the lake. And when we, in fact, uh, had conducted hydroacoustic survey to remap the lake. We found that, in fact, the slopes were not constant throughout the lake bottom, and that there were a number of these depressions. And just to give you an idea of scale, some of these are uh, two, two and a half meters deep, and they can extend over wide areas of the lake. And uh, hydroacoustics is great for identifying gas bubbles because it's a hard target, so you get a really strong echo. And then what you're seeing here this is the second echo on the uh, hydroacoustic. So, uh, so then when we uh, remap the the lake, uh, we find that it indeed has uh, you know a much more complicated bottom, and that the depressions coincided with where we were seeing these uh, fairly constant emissions of uh, gas bubbles. <laughs> And this is where it caused me pain, is because the uh, first time we collected seven cores before we had this information on the uh, on the gas emissions, uh, this was the core from the deepest area of the lake, and this is the uh, uh, led to activity, and this is the core from a, a slightly shallower depth. And so this is B is what you would expect to see for uh, a normal accumulation of uh, lead activity. And uh, core A, which was collected, uh, now we know in a depression, uh, showed uh, a considerable mixing down here. And so that's an undateable core. So there goes a thousand bucks. Anyway, <laughs> so we were curious uh, as to what, what, what the gases uh, were coming out of this. In particular, at that time, I was interested to see if we were had a strong volcanic connection because of the uh, proximity to the crater lake. And uh, we did not see any uh, sulfur gases in there. Uh, we saw this strange mix of you know, nitrogen, methane, and, and oxygen. And apparently what can happen is gases come up through a consider considerable amount of sediment. If they're moving fast enough, you get these transition uh, composition of the gases that that help to explain uh, a rather uh, bizarre set of, uh, of percentages. Moving over to uh, the Newberry Crater, which is east 
the northeast of the uh, diamonds. Uh, you find another interesting case of gas emissions. And so in East Lake, you find a lot of gas coming up just as you're, you're motoring around your boat or paddling, whatever. In Palaya, uh, we found none. And uh, some other folks have really done some, some nice work. So that's just an aerial view of the two, two lakes and the crater. And, and this is what you see on just a cheap dish finder in these vertical uh, look like trees coming up, arms back, uh, fairly robust emissions of gas coming out. And uh, so Brumberg uh, just recently published a paper uh, quantifying the, the CO2 coming out of East Lake. And uh, they, they looked at seasons and then combined during the summer. Uh, and so there's considerable amount of CO2 flux. They, they focus primarily on CO2, uh, but particularly over here in the southeast corner, there's quite a bit of hydrogen sulfide and also uh, mercury gas coming up, which also explains the high mercury content in the fish. Uh, so they didn't quantify the, uh, the sulfur gas, but uh, uh, but the carbon the CO2 was, was pretty impressive in terms of, of uh, gas coming up. And in a uh, kind of a, a similar uh, a parallel study by Lefkowitz uh, published earlier, they saw these same things of, of CO2 and hydrogen sulfide coming off in Eastlake. And, but you don't see that in, in Polina. They hypothesized that you have these, the, the whole system, Newberry Crater, is fed by the geothermal fluids, and that there's some gas separation uh, under east. And Paulina receives solutes of you know, iron, silica, and arsenic, uh, but East Lake receives the gas. So it'd be interesting to see if someone else comes along and, and studies that further to verify that hypothesis. And, 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 and things. Yeah, working on it. Oh, so this shows the uh, uh, temporal distribution of the CO2 coming off where uh, after the ice melt, uh, of course, they're able to measure a lot of CO2, but generally the uh, CO2 is coming in at a very constant rate, which just being expressed uh, uh, very. Uh, my third lake is actually not in Oregon, but it's of water, water from Oregon, so I, I'm including it this much. And we were doing some uh, uh, fishery type of acoustic work for Pacific Corps. Uh, and this is the, these are the fish counts uh, what you see uh, for fish targets during the day. And then, and then what you uh, usually do when you do these uh, hydroacoustic uh, investigations of fish populations, you take a look at the night because the fish are more active at night, they come off the bottom, so you get much higher uh, counts uh, during the night. So we went out uh, during the night, and so this is a hydroacoustic echogram during the day, and this is what we saw at night. Uh, and this is, this is simply the uh, uh, gas bubbles. Uh, they're coming up vertically, but we're moving, so they appear slanted. And uh, what what appeared to happen was uh, during the late afternoon, a uh, very strong low pressure system came in. This was during the uh, during the fall. The lake turned over that night and virtually exploded in terms of gas uh, coming up so we could no longer see, it, see the fish for the bubbles. And so again, there is another wasted day, but it was a really interesting uh, experience in terms of the episodic uh, emission of these gases and the, the degree to which these gases uh, are liberated. And, uh, and so the, now, start, the limnologists are starting to recognize this is the study I think from Canada uh, that uh, that fresh water is a, a major source of uh, CO two and methane, and uh, so folks are starting to uh, take a look at this as the uh, uh, source uh, throughout the world. And, and it bears in mind that a lot of these are coming from the reservoirs and 
Zang and folks uh, have uh, documented the number of lakes uh, and reservoirs around the globe. The number of dams globally is increasing. So in North America, you know, we see the number of dams is largely stabilized. Same thing for Europe. But if you go to Asia, uh, Africa, and South America, they are still building a lot of dams. And so we would expect, uh, you know, we have a opportunity, a uh, convergence of global climate change with water and temperature increasing. And then we continue to build uh, sources that, that uh, emit a lot more uh, CO2 and methane. And so, uh, so I don't know if this is going to be incorporated in some of the uh, global models or not. Uh, how many times? Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Good. Now I can talk about the sporadic. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, in in Crater Lake, uh, there was those so so called thing of birth of 1945. <laughs> <laughs> Put that on your calendar. And uh, he reported these these uh, clouds of smoke or gas over the lake that appeared several times uh, from September to uh, December of 1945. It was documented by the Park uh, Service. And uh, so there was never any uh, attribution as to uh, you know, the source of gas. Because uh, it's largely just went away. So, and I'm kind of aware of any uh, any gas emission since uh, the folks finance more information on that. It turns out that that is not the only uh, gas episodic gas event. In 1919, there was a statewide wide reports of gas emissions coming up from Diamond, from Marion, and Miller, all three uh, fairly deep lakes, all, you know, bordering the, uh, the crest of the Cascades. In, in the, the case in Diamond Lake was pretty well documented. The uh, park ranger from the National Park Service looked down from on high and saw the coloration of Diamond Lake and that was very unusual to him. And uh, went down to look, and there were thousands of uh, dead trout uh, along the shoreline. Uh, Diamond Lake, it started stocking about 1910, and it was a really, really successful fishery. So here are these very large multi pound trout on the, on the shore, and the lake uh, exhibiting bizarre color. Uh, and uh, so those are uh, some of the weird things that that, that occurred. And now, if you look back at our sediment core, uh, where where structure occurred, the the actual uh, discontinuity is pretty close to the you know, 1920 era. So I don't know if we we're looking at at uh, that historical event or not. Whether it's just a coincidence. Uh, but when we went down and took a look in uh, August uh, 2001, a similar event had occurred. And people reported that the lake erupted using a very similar language to what uh, was reported in 1919. When we went out and, and looked at it, there was a, a huge amount of Aquatic vegetation that had been dislodged from the lake. Is that these large uh, clumps have just been uprooted in the sediments? And uh, this is the dissolved oxygen profile, and that looks pretty normal until you look at what the DO percentage is. And if you were looking at uh, about 50% uh, DO saturation from the, the surface down to the Venolinium. And normally this lake is anywhere from about 88 to 120 percent. And so uh, something happened to bring a huge amount of organic matter up into the water column and uh, take away uh, a lot of oxygen. In this case, it wasn't quite enough to cause a fish kill, uh, but had, had gone down a couple more uh, milligrams per liter, we probably would have seen a similar event. And these are just some images of what it looked like. Oops. 
back then. So, uh, so anyway, uh, uh, bubbles have been the bane of some of my investigations, and uh, uh, I find them really fascinating. And I've become more aware uh, that they are quite important in a number of uh, organisms, and uh, yeah, maybe globally, I can start paying more attention to those as well. So anyway, any questions? So, uh, what's the potential relationship between lake depth and gas emissions? So, uh, so if you have a higher uh, productivity, you have a greater opportunity to have a deoxygen. So the further you go down on the redox chain, the greater potential you have uh, for methane collection, which is you know, about 20 to 25 times more uh, impactful for climate than the CO2. So, uh, so that's uh, the relationship. Yeah. So if the shower is described, I expect this to be gas and more on the energy and more CO2. And would you expect the shallower system to be more susceptible to meteorological events? Uh, it, well, no, a shallower system is presumably is going to be exposed to more continuous mixing. Mm -hmm. And so uh, and I, I see whether the actual air is being more deeper systems. Okay. You mentioned low pressure systems. That's all. Thank you. <coughs> Um, okay, Trish. Um, so most of your data of the CO2 and methane emissions from warming this volcanic facility, do you have the data from other facilities or is this maybe especially related to volcanic? Um, well, the, the issue in, in Diamond hasn't been verified. I've asked the USGS if they would like to take a further look at this with me and say it's your mind. So, uh, so we haven't found any money to go after that. Certainly in East Lake, it's, it's attributed to volcanic activity. Uh, uh, but I think most of the lakes, it's, it's unrelated to volcanic activity, more related to the productivity. Uh, Joe, I thought you were going to mention those events in Goma in Rwanda a few years ago. That's a big city. Yeah. And there were, did that, was, you know, there were, um, I think there were multiple events over a couple of years. And it's certainly volcanically connected, I believe. Right. And I don't remember if it was uh, CO2 or methane. I, yeah, I, I, my right life is CO2. Yeah, I think so. Too. And, and uh, you know, build up CO2 and <laughs> in, in the, uh, the high wind made until but uh, massive uh, that affected big parts of that city. Yeah. 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 I don't think we have any goals here. <laughs> And the second, um, I'm curious about the bowl bubbles versus just the gas and the solid gases of water. So, in terms of like, how important is the emission versus overall heat gassing? Joe, you've done a lot of great core work over time since so kind of diagnostic, and you said it did influence one of your cores you collected. But have you have you seen how this could affect doing cores? Do you have a way to fill up a legit core versus when you know this real did it? Yeah, I you know unfortunately uh, we couldn't tell it in diamond like the uh, uh, the sediments look fairly similar in the two cores. I've got photographs we couldn't see. 
you know, mark this kind of limiting so it gives it a clue that, that something is genetic to have it. You know, we, we had an idea that we're going to when we saw the uh, DNA. And so I, I wish I wish I knew if there were a way to get yeah. this. But we had uh, several cases of cores that you know, get, get disturbed from our variety of agents. And it's, it's, so far, I haven't figured out how to determine that before, before I spent a lot of time. Thanks, Joe. Great. I'm um, Pierre Dreyer from the University. Uh, this talk is Sana Ab Genomes. I'm the uh, Rapis and Warren Machina. Warren Machina. All right, thanks, Ben. Yeah, so uh, in the hat world, we, we really talked a lot about microcystis, the phanazomenon, and anabina in the past of Bellicose uh, Durban. Uh, but most of us, when if you look at a lot of lakes, do come across a number of others, including these two, Moranatunia and Uh, But they're not really talked about that much. And so uh, I'll report some uh, genome analysis work that we did and some, some monitoring from a couple of lakes that, that these, um, these data were from. Uh, so this is work from OSU with my colleagues there, with Robin Matthews, who retired from Western Washington, uh, university and was the source of the Warren Achillian. And uh, Frank Wilhelm and Sarah, Sarah Burnett uh, from the University of Idaho, who worked on Willow Creek and uh, Linda Rafus. Thanks. So, um, so these are the two lakes. Uh, why is a lake in far northern uh, Washington, just north of your place, <laughs> Casey, Western Washington University? Which is where we had a sample of Warrenachinia, Nagal the, the, the species that is typically found is Nagaliana. Uh, and Willow Creek Reservoir, which is uh, right next to Hep in the weed country of the Columbia um, uh, Plateau, where Limnorapis was, was derived from. And so let's first talk about Warrenachinia, Nagaliana. So this is from the, the, the sample from which we derived the genome was from late September 2018. This is what it looks like. So it's characterized by these, these fairly circular or often kidney shaped cells because in the process of dividing. Oh, it's the top button. Uh, sorry. Uh, you, you, you get this fissure here and, and there's, there's an, um, uh, an, 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 an embayment as these colonies are dividing. Uh, but what's really uh, striking is that the cells are on the surface of the colonies rather than with microcystis where the cells are distributed throughout the interior of the colony. So that means that as you would focus up and down through this, they'll come, the cells will come in and out of focus and around the periphery you see a concentration because the cells are on that, that surface. <clears throat> so this is uh, data from a long period of time from uh, 2007 to 2019, collected by the Washington State Program, uh, that's reported at this website at the bottom, the Toxic Algae, Algae website. They do analysis for toxins and do a sort of dominant, subdominant presence sort of uh, identification of the cyanobacteria. So there are lots of lakes. These colors aren't showing up that well, but the orange ones are the ones that uh, are instances where in that period a lake was reported as having a sample in which Warren and Chinia was either dominant or subdominant once in that period. Uh, so we don't know about frequency so much, but there are really quite a lot of lakes. And there are a lot over here in the, in the western side where Warren and Chinia was, was dominant. This is one of these guys we don't really talk about so much, but it is actually pretty prevalent. And if you plot the number of occurrences in which these, these different cyanobacteria, this is across the bottom, were dominant or subdominant in a sample. Warren and Chilean features quite a lot. The, 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 the biggies are the phanazomenon, which is always phanazomenon plus acrine, and dolichase verbum. Microcystis is almost always toxic, so we're quite concerned about it. It's pretty frequent, but not as much as these guys, and actually not as frequent as Warren and Chilean. And the little small columns over here are from the east side. 
So it's primarily occurring in Washington in the western lakes, west of the uh, Cascades. <clears throat> it's often associated with, with toxins, mostly uh, the black bars microcystin. And so over here, the, this less than MDL pair of columns on the right is where the toxin is not detected. So this is this is the black is microcystin, microcystin toxin, and the grey is anatoxin. And then these other columns uh, show instances where there are increasing levels of toxin up to above 50 parts per billion. So this is pretty high. Uh, and we see that there are really a lot of cases over the over more than 40 cases where Warrenachinia was dominant or subdominant in the sample, and where at the same time the toxin was quite high. So obviously the question is, is Warrenachinia a toxin producer? We know that microcystin is, and that they often coexist. Warrenachinia coexists with a number of those other uh, cyanobacteria. But the question is, 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 is Warrenachinia actually a toxin producer? So we took a um, a sample for DNA sequencing late in this season. This is monitoring data in Wiser Lake over the 2018. And the Ws represent cases where the Warren and Chinia was, was dominant across that season. So, so it was present quite persistent. Um, <clears throat> there's dolichospermin present also, there's microcystis present. Um, but Warrenachinia was present over a long period of time and especially uh, predominant in the late season, uh, which is when there was a, a phycocyanin peak. This, um, gosh, these colors are really they like They're not showing up at all. Yeah. Um, can't remember what color that was. Is that blue. Blue, okay. And the green down here is, is chlorophyll. So, so Warrenachinia was, was dominant when the blooms were the biggest. Um, the toxin analysis, the, the, the microcystin is the red line. So that peaked actually in the middle of the season, seemed to coincide with microcystis, but there was some at the end. So you really don't know whether, again, whether a Warrenachinia could be produced. So we sequenced the genome, and we'll get to that in a sec. But from the genome sequence, we can extract the ribosomal, 16 this ribosomal uh, RNA sequence that's often used for producing phylogenetic trees like this, the, the plot, the relationships between uh, different um, uh, uh, organisms. And we see that the Warren and Chidia sample, there are two of them because there are two ribosomal genes, uh, coexist on a very, very distinct uh, branch with other Warren and Chidias from around the world, Belgium, China, um, and so on, Czechia, Czechia uh, Asia. Uh, very distinct from the nearest neighbor branch, which are these snowalpas, which look fairly similar, but evidently people are using morphological characteristics pretty accurately to separate these because some that's not always true. Uh, sometimes morphological logical characteristics are not really pro don't provide enough distinction. And we see that genetically then things are mixed up. That's not the case here. And the closest relatives to the, the other relatives to these then are Sinecocystis and Sinecococcus, the micro um, uh, small cell sized um, uh, cyanobacteria, and Prochlorococcus, which is green. <laughs> so um, <clears throat> we've looked at the genomes, so I won't go through that now. We've compared them to uh, these other prominent uh, bloom formers. And all of these, you know, being very successful at, at being able to establish large uh, uh, populations of cells in, in water, uh, all are buoyant. They all have gas vesicles. Uh, they're very good at, at utilizing nutrients to, and, to, to drive growth, and they have very efficient photosynthesis. We can see that from, from the genes. Uh, what's interesting about Warren and Chin, and but what two things interesting about Warren and Chin, firstly, we did not find any cyanotoxin genes. And it's actually consistent when you look at it with reports from other cases. Probably Warren and Chinia is, is in most cases, or perhaps in all cases, not toxic. Um, the other interesting thing is that it's got a really big genome. These are, this is 7 million base pairs, as opposed to about five for these, these, these other cyanobacteria. If you look at the, uh, and, and that means that it can produce, it, or it has, 
uh, a much larger number of protein coding genes could do lots of additional interesting things compared to these other cyanobacteria. bacteria. However, if we uh, look at genes with known functions, which is what this KO uh, annotation uh, refers to, the gene numbers are about the same. So there's not very much difference. It, it doesn't look as though Warren and Chinia has a huge number of additional useful genes that we, whose function we might know. But it does have a heck of a lot of jumping genes, these transposonics genes. And if you, so these are known to be quite prevalent in cyanobacteria. We've talked about quite a bit for microcystis. Microcystis has uh, about 8% of its, of its protein coding genes as transposonics. Well, that's nothing compared to Warren and Chinia. This would suggest that this could be a massive challenge. How, how can a genome remain stable when you've got the jumping genes going, firing up all the time? And so it's a bit of an open question, the answer for, for that, uh, but certainly an interesting. So let's then talk about Limnorathus. This is a member of the Oscillatoriales. These are characterized <coughs> by these, these, these very potentially, can mostly very long films fairly stiff, so pretty straight or curved like this. Um, they, they're unbranched. They don't have um, uh, differentiated cells like aconine support, nitrogen fixing heterocysts. Uh, and most of them have cells that are wider than tall, so they look like a stack of doing like stack roots. And in this case, you can see that there are sheaths. In this case, the filament has, has, has died and has left the empty sheath. They're actually quite hard to see here to be certain that there's a sheath, but it's an important characteristic for limnorathus. But unfortunately, by most of our um, 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 the phycological um, people who identify the phycological samples, like Jim Sweet, for instance, who does a lot of sampling in, in the Northwest, he's not taking um, note of these sheaths. And the result is that in the past, uh, these have been missed mischaracterized as oscillatoria or lingvia or planktothrix, and some of that is still happening. So this is something to pay attention to, that whether or not there's a, a sheep. So in Washington state, because of this misnaming, it's only sort of useful to look at very recent data when, when people have become more aware. So if we take 2019 and late 2018, there were 35 lakes in Washington both sides of the Cascades that reported Limnorathus. So it, it's sort of out there, it's a fair bit of it. It was dominant in Moses Lake in late September and 2019. So that's east side, uh, as is Willow Creek where these samples were from. So it might be something that, that leads to really big, obvious blooms more on the east, where it's, um, it's sunnier, water temperatures are perhaps higher. It's like Warrenachinia, often associated with high levels of microcystic. So you can again wonder, is this a producer or not? So in <clears throat> Willow Creek in 2019, uh, um, Sarah and, and Frank uh, collected this monitoring data. So there were huge apanazolamon blooms in, uh, what is it, June, July, to, to, to late July. There was a glow eutrichia, bloom for a short period, the green one. There was a microcystis period, this purple line at about the same time, sort of mid-season. And the big fat red line at the bottom is limnorathus. So it never was, was present at huge standing sort of, sort of uh, concentrations. Although at this time of sampling, it actually in parts of Willow Creek Reservoir, it was very thick and very soon, very unusual for, for a cyanobacterium. Where we generally say if you take a stick like our pointer and put it into the bloom and lift it up, uh, the 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 phanazomenon, the uh, microcystis, it will all shed and not stick on them. This this was very stringy and it came up and and there was very very goofy and very stringy, which as I say is unusual for a cyanobacterium. So there was plenty around in the late season, but the other cyanobacteria were not present in the late season. So then the raphas became quite dominant. Uh, towards the end of the season. The columns represent microcystin concentrations. Now they're from two different sites. So there's huge ones at the end of the season, but not from the site that we sample or from this monitoring data. But um, again, you can see that now probably these early 
um, 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 Collins co um, uh, 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 present at the same time as the micro sister spleen. Uh, but but you notice that there's certainly late microcystin when there doesn't seem to be very much microcystin. So again, is is this a producer? Of How are we doing for time then? No, a little five. Five. Thanks. So uh, if we look at the <clears throat> relationships from the genome sequence, um, again, at the bottom here is the limnorafis, again, two ribosomal genes. And the it's, it's again in a branch, not so deeply divided from the, the closest sister branches we saw for Boromachidia, but it's, uh, its mates in this branch are other limnorafis uh, isolates. Again, from around the world, We've got UK, China, Czech Republic, Mongolia, Guatemala, and USA. In this case, oh, was that? Right. Thanks. <laughs> um, USA here is Clear Lake in California, sort of north of Napa Valley. It's it's a really unclear <laughs> lake. It has, it has lots of lots of names, but it got stuck with that name early before it got um, went eutrophic. Um, and, but you do note that some of these samples here, like this limnorafis, was previously called lingmium. So I talked about the mis misnaming earlier. These are all from fresh water, except one is from a brackish sand. And actually, that was reported as being a benth, although all of these have gas vesicle genes, so they really should all be buoyant. Um, and all of these are non toxic. And again, the reports, the reliable reports about it in the RAFA suggest that it really is non toxic. Um, the closest relatives here, these are all benthic, they don't have the gas vesicle genes, and they're not. And then the many other limnorafuses up here, uh, sorry, oscillatorians up here, such as oscillatoria itself, um, formidium, uh, planktothrix. It's a bit of a mixed bag up here. You can see these different colours, uh, which represent names, named genera. They're mixed up. So this is a case where the, the, the morphological characters aren't consistent or obvious enough, and the genetics isn't, isn't following the, the morphology. <clears throat> uh, yeah, we've seen this, but um, so we sampled at this time point where there was some microcystis around. Um, the genome showed that this is not toxic as I mean. <clears throat> But the question is, where did these, where, who's the toxin producer? And the way you do this genetic analysis is you actually take a sample and you sequence everything that's in it, not just the target organism, you know, like the, the, the limnorafis. And that's, that's called a metagene, meta, big, 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 is establishing the, the genetic sequence of everything that's in the sample. So you can go dig back through that data and, and look for microsystem genes. And we did that, and they were all from microcystis. So microcystis is the producer in, in the toxin producer in body green, not cleaner So to conclude, uh, these two uh, cyanos are really quite prevalent. We, and, Probably everybody's known, known, known that, but, but they're, they're not paid very much attention. And we pay more attention to toxin producers. Now that we're really quite sure that these aren't toxin producers, maybe we've done the right thing in not sort of talking about them so much in the past. But they're certainly out there and they're pretty interesting. And anytime you have a big standing group, it's not a pretty sight. And the limnorafis, that stringy crap in Willow Creek Reservoir, it is, it is not nice. So it's, it's, it's still a problem, even if it's not a toxic abuse. Um, yeah, we'll leave it at that. Thanks. I'm curious if either of these, uh, do you know if they're like nitrogen fixers or have other mechanisms by which they can facilitate the toxinogenic uh, sign of it? Nitrogen fixers, no. No. Are there other mechanisms by which they might sort of set the scene for microcystis, for example? They're often they're often in mixed blooms. So we've talked about ones where they're dominant, and, but but I think that's less less common. I think they're often in very mixed blooms. So so yeah, are they sort of important? I, I don't know. Okay. 
bit hard to look at others. But nice question again. Yes. Thinking about lingia and the genes for hydronychine toxic the contact are testing those genes are known. And can you could you check for those? Because I think it would be interesting to look in the graph this for uh, those genes. Okay. They're not the lipopolysaccharide. No. No. Okay. Uh, can you yeah, send send me the data the information you've got? The, the the genes were isolated from lingia, were they? Right. Yeah. And they're um, some freshmen. Okay. Yeah, we looked we looked for all of the toxic, you know, for anatoxin, saxotoxin, right. cylindro, but but not for this. Yeah, no, I just put it into the system. Sure, it'd be good to look. Yeah. But I think it would be nice today, yeah, especially with these like Yeah. Yeah. If you can give me the information, yeah. we can chase that down. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Alex. Yep. Okay. Uh, last talk before the break. Yes. Here's on the break. It's me. I don't know what's going on with the lights. There seems to be some dimming thing that happened. Oh, the dimming? Yeah, let's, we can. I don't know. It's something deliberately dim the light. Yeah. Oh, so you can just use the grill and the colors seem to be off on the projector. I don't know what's going on. Is it the people want some light? So, what would you like? Great. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, I just actually want to start by saying thanks to all the folks who organized the conference Theo and Rich and Jim. And yeah, all of it was just takes an army to put this stuff together. I just really enjoyed it. Uh, being your last place, just supposed to fix. And also, um, kind of maybe seems weird to be talking about a dam removal at a lakes conference, but um, over the years I've come to realize how important, as a, my primary focus in research at Oregon State is on rivers, but you can't ignore what's happening in the lakes and reservoirs upstream because they're driving all the stuff that we're seeing happening downstream. And early in my career was focused on sediment, hydraulics, and I've tried it everything I could do to stay away from water quality because it's so complicated. <laughs> Over the last maybe five years, in part due to a conversation with Joe and Theo, I kind of drank the Kool-Aid and now I'm <laughs> on the water quality stuff and I can't seem to escape it. And so this is partly uh, related to that because the climate dam revolts are happening. The um, drawdown is expected to have, they're going to remove, well, anyway, it's, it's, it's happening. And there's the biggest story here is not about sediment as it is with most dam rules. It's about what's going to happen with the good bed and water quality. So they're currently very tightly linked. So I'm going to show you some data around that and then what's going to potentially happen when we remove on, when they are removed. And I'll just say um, there's a uh, fund, this project's funded by Oregon Sea Grant in partnership with the Art Tribe. It's a really cool partnership I'm really excited about. Now it's my not turn. Going. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, what do I? Okay. Oh, boy. Point the oh, there we go. I don't, I mean, oh, you're oh. in the wrong space here. <laughs> <laughs> it's a mystery. How do I make this all work? All right. Try this again. Hang on. Now I lost my pointer. Sorry. <laughs> oh boy. Something else is on the wrong screen. Oh, that's more. <laughs> yeah. I'm just going to close all of them and start it again. Thanks for your patience. There we go. Okay. Um, just a brief overview. We are pretty far from the climate right now. Since uh, this is um, Southern Oregon, Northern California, the climate is a really interesting place for a lot of reasons. But part of it is a big part of the geology. Flat upper basin uh, used to be one of the largest wetland complexes in the U.S. In the lower basin, it's really steep. You can barely see, but there's a ton of rivers draining into the lower climate. It's steep. It's canyonized in a lot of places. 
And then right in the middle is this pivot point where it transitions from that flat to super section, and that's a great place to build a bunch of hydroelectric facilities earlier in the century. They don't generate a ton of energy. It's around 170 megawatts, but they generate a ton of cyanobacteria and other issues. So when they uh, applied for their FERC relicensing, FERC uh, imposed some additional requirements, and it was decided it was no longer economically viable to keep the dams in place. So this is Iron Gate. This is just the colors that's showing up here as well as it should. But um, if you know anything about the climate, this is one thing you might be aware of is this is super toxic alpha blooms that occur <clears throat> for a long period throughout the summer. So in addition to storing sediment, there's around 13 million cubic yards of material in those four, there's in the behind the four dams, um, they store a ton of nutrients. 85% of the material, the sediment that's stored behind those dams is fines. So that can be clay and silt, but it also is a lot of organic material. And that's like old dead algae, detritus, garbagey stuff. I think Theo's quote, one of my favorite Theo quotes is when he was doing some microscopy work for us. He's like, junk green detritus was how he labeled some of the <laughs> stuff that he found in our samples. Um, so this is a lot of material, 13,000 cubic yards, or 13 million. It's about half of what came out of the Elwha. So if anybody follows dam removals, there was a big holes of sediment that came out. They were really worried about it. They lowered the Excuse rest. Me, we cannot see the screen in so. <sighs> thanks, thanks, thanks for letting us know. <laughs> All right, last. Your screen. Give me a talk and do an AV simultaneously. Can y'all see it now? Yes, thank you. Thanks, Yvonne. All right, um, so there's a lot of sediment, but it's a lot of fine sediment. So their strategy with removal, rather than lowering it down, like metering it a little bit at a time, like they did at Elwha, they're gonna draw it down in winter, high flows, and try to flush that sediment out as fast as possible. They won't want that, that organic material and that oxygen demand parked in the river for very long. They wanna really get it out as fast as they can. Um, currently in these reservoirs, you've got a, Dominance of diatoms most of the year, but in the summer we can get a lot of cyanobacteria. This um, picture is from uh, Kino Reservoir, which is not being removed, it's being reconfigured but not removed. But it's like that kind of like egg drop soup consistency of the famous Amazon, really nasty stuff. Um, Iron Gate produces microcystis and a phantom phantasomenon, uh, tends to be nitrogen depleted. But um, the, the point is that we've got different reservoirs that are producing different organisms or different um, cyanobacterial blooms. Um, based on the high nutrient loads that come from the upper basin. And that's important for those of us who care about rivers as you go downstream. This is some work from Laurel Genzoli, but and it, it, it's gross primary productivity, but just to demonstrate that the, the climate is one among the most productive rivers in the world in terms of product productivity, and that's not illustrated here, but what this is showing is you is how as you go downstream, so Syed Valley is a um, that sort of upper section, and then you go down towards the estuary, productivity drops dramatically. And what also happens over space and over time is that you get uh, the productivity dominated by macrophytes and by filamentous algae. And so in the early part of the, of the summer, we get dominance of macrophytes, those aquatic rooted plants. And then as you go later in the season, it becomes filamentous algae. So this is starting to help us build a story of what to expect when the dams come out. Who is going to, what is the assemblage of primary producer, producers in the system? How does it vary both over space as we go downstream where it's down here it becomes nitrogen limited, and then over time, it within a season. So this big study that we got funded, the first one's asking the question about nutrients. There's gonna be a big change in the nutrient loads to the lower river. How is that gonna affect primary producers and rates of production? And then the second um, part is like, why do we care? Why do we care about productivity? Yeah, the colors are not showing up at all today. Um, so these reservoirs store a lot of nitrogen and phosphorus. A lot of us refer to them as the compost heaps. They trap a lot of, uh, and a lot of phosphorus is 12%, but it's most particulate phosphorus during the, what's coming out in the winter and the spring with runoff and sediment. But the, to me, the more interesting part of this is what's happening with the nitrogen. Um, it, in the summer, the bloom season, it, tr it retains around 30%. And some of that is actually trapping it like um, particulate, but a lot of it is just um, converting it to denitrification, to convert it to N2 gas. So it's actually lost out of the system rather than just being stored. And there's um, a lot of transformations happening in the nitrogen cycle in those reservoirs, uh, both over uh, time, short, short and long time scales. 
And the questions that people are asking are what's nutrients typically with the removals, what happens to those nutrients, it's in the trap there. But when you look in the literature, there's actually very little study on nutrients at dam removals. Vast majority of research is done on sediments. And so what you find is a handful of studies focused on small dams and rivers with low productivity. And essentially, because of that, they're like, well, there's not much effect of nitrogen, carbon, or phosphorus because there wasn't much in the reservoir in the first place. Um, and but we can, from sort of the, the principles, we know that fit, um, phosphorus is going to be governed by erosion it's attached to you know, particulate um, phosphorus and it's attached to the sediment. So that all the phosphorus poles will mostly come out with the sediment as it's eroded during drawdown. But the nitrogen piece, again, is kind of more interesting. Um, you'll get some flush of nitrogen out of the system when you draw the reservoir down and drain it. But there's also these patterns as you dewater and re-wet the sediment, as it wets and dries, that we start to see some pulses like of, of nitrogen continuing to leak out of the reservoirs. So what's, what are we expecting to happen with the Klamath? We expect this short-term pulse with the drawdown. It's going to be a lot of phosphorus, a lot of nitrogen coming out, because that's what's been stored in the reservoirs. Um, and then because of that nitrogen cycle dependence on wetting and drying, we expect there to be some additional sort of leakage of nitrogen coming out of that system over, um, over the time. From the environmental impact statement they made um, based on some modeling that was done by uh, Eli, well, by a number of folks in the basin. The expectation, because we've, the compost heaps will be gone, no longer trapping those nutrients, we actually expect an increase in nutrients to the downstream reach. So on the order of like 37 to 40, around 40 percent might um, increase the long-term delivery of nitrogen to the lower basins. So they're no longer going to be trapped under gene in the reservoirs. So we have some hypotheses about how that's going to affect the, the plants. We expect those macrophytes are going to be decreased. That's not a nutrient issue, that's a scour issue. Cyanobacteria diatoms decreasing because they don't have the reservoir habitats anymore. Um, and this uh, gets to what I'll get into the, the last part of the talk, which is around why we care about that. Um, and then the expectation is that those macrophytes and cyanobacteria will be replaced by paraphyte. I feel like I should mention there is a benthic cyanobacteria in the system that produces toxins. That's kind of a big question mark about, we don't even know why it's there, like, or what its habitat conditions are. So um, also a place for people to better understand things. So we care about this productivity. Um, I, this is a conversation I often have to have with people who are not lakes people, but why do we care about productivity in rivers? And in the um, climate in particular, we're concerned about fish food and about disease risk. So I'm going to spend the last couple slides talking about this disease risk problem. How will changes in phytoplankton and sediment improve or degrade conditions for disease risk? So in the Klamath, there is a um, pathogen called Ceratonova shasta. It infects up to 90% of juvenile salmon, um, can lead to massive death, a loss of fish. And it is hosted by this worm that is, this is like a big worm mat. They're called annelids. Um, this is what it looks like. It looks like in the, under the microscope. <coughs> and the dam removal could impact this worm in two ways. One is by essentially increasing the scour of its habitat that needs stable habitat. And the other is the question that we've been investigating is like, are the reservoirs feeding these worms? And what happens when we remove their food source? Um, so this uh, analid, this worm is a suspension feeder, essentially it eats whatever comes to it, whatever it, you know, is suspended in the flow. And so what we did um, was to do simultaneous sampling of both the reservoirs in the climate and the reaches downstream. And I'm just really going to focus on this section because that's where we found some really interesting stuff and there's all kinds of other, this is a hydroelectric reach, so there's all sorts of other factors impacting what we found. Um, so just to show you a couple of things. Um, first, this is what was in the gut contents. This was not an easy analysis. These are tiny and then to get, figure out what was in their guts was its own set of challenges. But as we, we're going to go from three down to five, as we, so just really to focus on these, what you see is that about half of their um, diet is made up of mineral sediments, the rest of it, just this is downstream of Iron Gate Dam, the big one, and the other half is made up of diatoms, algae, and detritus, which are green detritus. As you go farther downstream, this is um, much farther down the river, they're mostly eating mineral sediments. And what's interesting about this too is that these uh, that were right below the reservoirs are the what we purchased like the plump and long. They're the big fatties, you know, the, the big fat worms. 
that also produce a lot more offspring. As you get down here, these worms down to the lower part of the basin, they were skinny, small, and much smaller. And so there's a condition issue that the, if you live right below, if you're an animal right below the reservoir, you're doing better and you're producing more offspring. And what's interesting is that when we looked at the data from back in 2014, that trend was even much more severe. So they're eating very little mineral sediments um, and a lot more junk green detritus just downstream of Iron Gate versus in the lower river. And this is important, this date in particular, we picked 2014 because in 2015, they constructed this curtain to try to prevent some of the uh, toxic algae from getting downstream. So essentially it isolates the surface water and it pulls flow from deeper in the Mediterranean. So that suggests that, you know, but even this data that we found in 2021, um, the reservoirs were feeding the reservoir or feeding the down the hills downstream even more um, before that curtain was installed. So uh, that gives us leads us to some hypotheses about how these reservoirs and the, even just this one part of the river downstream are linked. And the goal is uh, this is a big busy diagram, and I'm not going to spend any time talking about it, except to point to this green box, which is really where we're trying to focus in this this one part of the study, which is just to get some food web models, just to understand the linkages between the reservoir and its water quality and who's showing up downstream when. So building some um, you know, mathematical models of based on field data of all of those interactions. The other part of this project, in particular collaboration with the tribes, is trying to understand how people understand the river. How much time are they spending cleaning these macrophytes out of their fishing nets, for example? Where are these, how, how has that changed over time? Like, what can we understand from the tribes about their knowledge about the system? And how do they make decisions about um, the water quality and the algae in the system? So that's this whole big side over here. And then we're gonna put them together in the middle with some structured decision models, and then simulate a future with different wildfires or different water quality management strategies to then be able to say, how do thing changes in water quality affect the food web? And then how does that change impact things that people care about, like ability to hold um, tribal ceremonies or ability to recreate? Because there's a lot of white water floating in this river that can't occur but sometimes because the river's full of toxic algae. So this is a tiny, tiny part of a much bigger project um, that we're just getting started on the climate. And so I encourage you to, there's a tons of tons of places to find information on the climate, but it is um, a very interesting place to work and it's going to be increasingly interesting over time. So I wanted to finish fast. I think I might have talked a little too fast, but I wanted to make sure to have the time both to acknowledge everybody on the team, but also to just answer questions, whether it's about the, this stuff in particular or the data removal more broadly. Thank you. Uh, and all, I think in 2016 published a paper on the terrifying of the uh, Lone Island and found that the dominant group was the diatoms. Now, with you increasing the forecast of increase in nitrogen, do you expect the terrifying community to change to something like maybe the dollar? Yeah, great question. So, for folks online, Joe is asking about how the primary producers might change in the lower river. Um, with the increase, particularly in nitrogen, because what um, I think it was that report, or maybe it was one of Jake Kahn's reports, but showed that the terrified community in the lower river appears to be down, um, nitrogen limited. And so the expectation is not necessarily that there will be more biomass of algae after, the, but that there'll be different um, primary producers. And so the question, though, about macrophytes, I think macrophytes, at least my understanding, and this is learning from what I've learned from Laurel and the work that she's done is that they tend to be more limited by scour like the sand and the flows that, that drag you know draw them out of the um, out of the substrates and so it may be more dominated by paraphyte but a difference rather than being sort of rooted macrophytes that it might be more of a paraphyte than are living on the rocks but I honestly don't know the answer to that. And I think that might be one of the places where we get some interesting surprises like there's that benthic algae that's showing up I, I'm hopeful that's not what replaces uh, the producers that are down there. But um, yeah, I think that's the place where we have the most to learn this project. I'd love to hear ideas if you have thoughts too about who might be the, the winner in that <laughs> competition. Also, like climate change, we know big factors as well. I mean, lower flows, less scouring, which is like a pretty big impact. 
it also can be as well for similar issues. So this is so complicated as it is, but have we looked at what happens to all the sediment once it hits the beach, the ocean, the alluvial? Yeah, there has been the question is about what's going to happen with the sediment once it hits the estuary. And um, there has been a ton of study on that. We've also done a bunch of modeling. Um, the advantage that we have in the system is that it's fine sediment. And so it's mostly going to stay in suspension. It's going to get, uh, there'll be some deposition along the margins and a little bit of depo deposition just downstream of Iron Gate Dam. But the majority of it is going to get um, flushed out to the ocean. And what happens there? I mean, turbidity in the ocean and fish coming out there. Yes. Um, this is that, that, yeah, that is definitely outside of my wheelhouse. Um, what I can tell you, what's reported in the EIS is that it's not anticipated to have a major biostimulatory effect for cyanobacteria blooms and the like, or bacteria blooms out in the ocean. There will be increased turbidity and the turbidity will be high. <clears throat> the state, the project has a essentially a moratorium on meeting turbidity exceedances for two years. Um, but the model suggests that it's going to be a lot less than that, <clears throat> excuse me, in terms of a much shorter period in which turbidity is going to be elevated. But the project owners are very motivated to get that sediment out and flushed out of the system. In fact, one of the strategies they're going to use is have barges out there with like essentially hydraulically mine the sediment off of the floodplain so that there's not just a bunch of sediment parked in the reservoirs. The idea, again, high winter flows is to get it out of the system. It will increase turbidity. There will probably be a DO sag for some period of time. Um, but the, again, the EIS is based on models, is expects that those would be small effects. It's so complicated, but you know, the fish uh, behavior in the winter, whenever the movement uh, might happen. Could be important in sort of timing because are the fish moving out in the ocean and waiting to come up? Yeah, I think that is that's certainly an issue, um, um, probably more so in the spring. <clears throat> and so that's why they're trying to get this all done over a short period of time, get the reservoirs drawn down as quickly as they can, because they, they want as little legacy of the effects of the deer removal for the fish in the spring, waiting to try to get into the river, especially from a DO perspective. It's all options. Are they pretty confident in the predicting high water flows during the time? <laughs> it depends on what water year they get, right? Yeah. It is, they can get very different outcomes if it's a significant drought year versus a very wet year. Yeah. So that's why they're hedging their bets. They've got a lot of like risk management happening, but the like essentially hydraulically mining the sediment off of the, um, the banks so that they don't have just these legacy sediments they're going to leak out over time. They are, it is very much on the radar um, because of all the nutrients, yeah. So you, you're looking at, it's Copco 1, Copco 2, and Iron Gate there. And Boyle. And Copco 2 is actually coming out this coming summer. It's tiny. It's a small dam. Right. Not but you, so Keno and, and I think this is all upstream, right? Yes. Um, Keno and then Lindbergh Dam, didn't mention. Yeah. What's the effect on flows um, of Keeping those fans in place, are they going to do more releases from up on the lake? Do you have any idea? I have asked that question multiple times and was told that these dam removals shouldn't really affect what happens in the lower river. Whether that that's realistic, I don't. I, I, yeah, I'm not speak on behalf of Reclamation, but um, they are reconfiguring Kino. Um, Reclamation is currently designing it to provide fish passage, which in itself is problematic because the reservoir and river above Keno is a cesspool of low dissolved. I mean, it's like the worst place you want to put threatened endangered fish. So they're going to have to reckon with water quality in that section as well. Um, so this is like the, I think the beginning of one, the first step of many that are going to be needed to get fish upstream, but also get them into habitats where they can be productive. Does that include a performance lake eventually for some months? I don't know the answer for that. Thanks, that's right. Um, yeah. We're going to do our break right now. Uh, so we have about 10 minutes until the next session starts. So should we, we pause out? For should we just start? We haven't asked the Zoomers for any questions. We've sort of forgotten about that. Maybe could we just. Hey, Zoomers out there, do you have any questions, maybe, of any of the talks this morning?
No. Okay. They, they all understood it. Great. so thanks for coming to participating and I'm gonna, I'm gonna walk out with you then. Okay. Okay. Oh, no. we'll get <laughs> yeah. There must have been a lot of snacks in all those meetings Yeah, yeah. And then as far as like 
Because I know it's yeah, yeah, upper base. It seems like has a lot of unique things in our water transfer. It depends on the base and some Yeah, so we got Yeah, so he was way yeah. down in the down by there's actually a uh, poster out there uh, by the Men's Bridge Drive. He was like on lightning horse and he jokingly called it a lot horse cow and chicken. But the, there wasn't a chicken one. <laughs> Doing uh, that, uh, the juveniles coming down. Yeah, that was our old romantic days. We were 10 days on, six days off. We haven't seen it. Something like that. I don't remember. We had to stay down the trap the entire time. We had trailers down there. You're basically on the entire time. They got a cow in the trap one time. Huh? Carcass or alive? Well, it was dead by then. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> that trailer. Bridge was up in the trailer, and he heard it. So it was a desperate drive member. And he was like, oh. Power in the trap. <laughs> so they had this, they were trying to sink the trap so that they could get it out because the people were crossing it. Yeah. Actually, those two of them, they're tied to come in the river and get it. Uh, <laughs> so they were just like, but they, uh, they got it flushed out. So, I got a spree trap. Uh huh. Or a small trap. It's Sam. Yeah. All kinds of Salmon Creek down by the coast or Salmon Creek? Salmon right? Creek and Vegas. Oh, okay. Right. Right. There you go. And we had the old fish oh. and perch yeah. and stuff, and it's like people were flushing out and so you farm like around us and oh, just dumping them into the creek. Well, it's like, and then and then when we get our surveys, my survey to one of the and all these people are all the good steward of the land and it's like yeah. all the grass yeah. and, yeah. and, yeah. and everything else and you're finding out it's like a and and yet they're all going, oh, I don't touch my string. I know, it's like, like, you know, oh, it's just grass. It just goes down. It's like, man, it just sort of completely sucks all the ice out of the system. They don't get it. And they fertilize. At first, they fertilize a lot. Then they put it. Yeah. <laughs> so oh. yeah. 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 Or they build a house and then they want a few of them. So they go down and they and they plant grass right down. Yeah. And it's like, oh my yeah. god. Same on desk Yeah. 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 No, it's an issue. I don't know if they've done it since then, but it's like yeah. they need to have. You know, yeah, so put a little bit of trifle that way. It's not a responsible landowner when you have a free well, you know, uh, so uh, 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 the Oregon plant. That's what their whole mission was, is that it's not just the agents yeah, that, okay. that oh, are yes, everywhere. Uh, what they, uh, they, they had yeah, a ton yeah. of pamphlets out there about yeah. all these yeah. things yeah. that you can do to be a better. That was kids up I know we talk and we can say Start 
Oh, oh. <laughs> 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 but this, it could be worse. It's not this thing the issue. So. <laughs> Okay, yeah, we, we definitely talk. Um, let me get. Are you first, Wayne? Yeah. Okay, great. This is not want. So, so my main one is. Yeah, o o -L -A, Joseph. That's the main one. But this one called Tweedle is a two minute. And I don't know if that one can be made to work. Or okay, let me try. Yeah. Well, actually, Oh, I think it's going to work. Uh, Internet Explorer. Yeah. So uh, 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 so yeah, I no, I know Google. Yeah. I know Firefox. Um, is it, it looks like this is this on Vimeo. Can I just play it from Vimeo? Yeah. So Tweedle transitions version two. Are Vimeo, What's that? Let me know when you're ready. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I just need a second to try to get a little bit. What? I don't know what this is. It's I don't even have an internet explorer installed on this machine, so that's why I don't know why it's trying to run. <laughs> And there's no way to X out of it. Yeah. Oh, wait, let's see this will do. <laughs> let's just go to the main presentation. I'm sorry. Well, um, if we have more time, I should have done this last night. We can try to figure out what. Let's just go back to the main. Yeah, I just this one here. Yeah. Okay, I will try to see it too. Just a second. Maybe over a Thank you, and uh, thanks to OLA for inviting me to sort of kind of off topic topic. <laughs> oh, jeez, I don't think that's what we want. Oh, thanks. Uh, this all began uh, literally about 30 years ago. Um, my wife and I, Lori, who's somewhere over there, is, yeah, we're both Oregon natives, but we just you know, went away for 35 years. And then we were trying to come back. We thought we would like to find a bit of property. And so in 1993, I came out looking and uh, quite luckily fell into this 140 acre piece of 
property on the Halem River. There, uh, a coastal salmon uh, habitat river, no dams, and um, went away and came back 10 or 15 years later, 2006. And when we settled onto the, the property, uh, we were sort of immediately approached by uh, restoration groups, in this case, the Upper Nahalem uh, Watershed Council. And they initially wanted us to cooperate in placing a culvert down at this end of the property. This is looking east, and the, of course, the river is going in this direction down to Nahalem Bay. We uh, replaced a culvert near the bridge up in this area, and um, we most immediately had coho coming up this creek, but they weren't spawning. In fact, they didn't survive. This area right here is a, a dugout um, stream, replaced what normally would have spread out all the way across this area. The house we had is right up here. So we immediately began discussing about riparian restorations and um, went through a number of iterations, uh, which I'll kind of timeline here in a little bit. But the project that we actually uh, got funded in 2018 um, was to literally plug this and replace it with a gradient that came right across here. So most of what I'm going to show you is just a picture. This project was just completed, uh, literally, the drone photos I'm going to show, aside from this one, were literally just done a week ago. So we completed this the 19th of September. So the idea is to direct a stream across here, and let it fill this, which then comes on down here to the river, replacing about 1,200 feet of salmon potential with about 5,000 feet of salmon potential. This is not spawning because this is not a gravel, <coughs> area, it's a floodplain. So it's strictly off winter habitat for fry. We know they're here because they're throughout this area that they're looking for coho, but they never, at least the survival is very low because they have a lot of canary grass and other things to hear that simply don't allow them to bring it back out to the main stand in the spring. I cannot see the screen again. Thanks, Ivan. Okay. Um, so that's, that's where we're at. This is actually done back in March. Um, all of this went through committing process, which has literally taken five or six years. And, um, we're now, of course, uh, this was a, a pre sort of project uh, overview and one of the better shots that I decided to stick in for the shot. This is an old oxbow. The Halen River used to come right across here and on down like this. So we have a pond here, which is uh, a good wildlife habitat. Uh, it is being retained, but there's a stream that comes down and feeds this. And then the new creek will come across here, Tweedle Creek, um, is going to feed this whole thing. So we'll actually have two sources of water here and here. So we are generating a lot more habitat. So that was the argument that we put. So the, uh, the whole point of this was aquatic habitat degradation, disconnect, and hindered access contributed to the decline in the media salmon way. And we also are doing the plan for restoration in here as well. So that was the whole idea. Historic channel realignment of Treaty Creek and implementing the proposed restoration work will significantly increase the availability of both low velocity off-channel winter and cool summer refuge for these species. So the argument that we presented over and over again in the years to by was really this a project was formed when the main stem of the hail meandered away from the controlling hill slope, leaving the topographic variability 
in the channel of bandwidth stone. There exists a depositional layer of gravel and cobble that underlays the entire site that has a highly functional nitrate zone, likely that the current Tweedy Creek that transverses and now bisects this lens was manipulated to facilitate rapid drainage for historical agriculture. So that was the argument of the Midwest. So that makes the Tweedle Creek currently delinked in the wetlands in its historic flow patterns. And the project seeks to restore that linkage for both provision of high quality summer thermal refuge and off channel habitat. Um, I think maybe. Yeah, there we go. Um, so the idea was to restore Tweedle Creek to its historic channel in Oxbow Wetland area and increase the overall stream length by about to up to about 4,800 feet. Abandoned 1,300 feet at the lower Tweedle Creek in its present location, relocated, and uh, creating fourfold habitat, reconnecting to small fish bearing tributaries, and enhancing the existing wetland complex by about 15 acres. The overall site, as I think I mentioned, is about 142 acres. And increasing this or improving this high rate connectivity, we have a lot of underground water feeding this system. Restoring the diverse floodplain habitat conditions, creating habitat conditions conducive to long term beaver colonization, which we have a lot of as well, <laughs> providing additional backwater habitat for outflow events, addressing habitat needs to stop the events of lamprey, and uh, in this neighborhood of watershed. <clears throat> In addition, the abandoned portion of the existing Tweedle Creek continues to function, that 1,280 feet continues to function as an off channel winter habitat, peak flow, and creating permanent water thermal fields. So that was part of it. And then, as well, improving the riparian conditions by planting native species for about 15 acres. That part obviously is not bad. That's where we're going from here. So uh, this is the watershed. Um, the Nahalem watershed is a river on the Pacific coast, approximately 119 miles long, watershed of about 855 square miles, including obviously important timber producing region. And our particular spot, which is located right here, here's Clatsop County right here. So we're right, right in that area right there. Uh, we didn't experience any of the Tillman burn, but just to the south in the Tillman Forest, obviously. The forest. So it enters the Nahalem Bay on the Pacific Peninsula in the city of Nahalem. It's about 70 miles northwest of Portland. So there's your site location. So the workflow, which started in this case August 29th, after at least five years of effort, we were to mobilize to the site. Erosion control, staging, spoil development, meander construction, large wood placement, stream crossing installations, BDAs or beaver dam analog installation, port installation, because we had one existing uh, culvert on the pond that we were using. We had to improve that. Fish salvage, dewatering, decommissioning. Uh, seeding, mulching, riparian fencing. So we're back to this. One of the sort of controversial things is essentially what I call this is cow ecology because that's what it was since the turn of the century when this was settled. And so um, I was quite happy with revegetating the entire complex, but uh, you can't. Um, you know, it must have had another half a million dollars. So Basically, we're putting fences back in, but just expanding the area significantly for the right area of habitat and then uh, planting. So that's what's currently taking place. Oh, this is funny. Got this color coding thing, but this is just to show you here's the new stream relocation coming across here. Here's that pond that was there. These are the areas that we're going to revegetate various plants, whereas the center portion of this is going to be seen <clears throat> as, as pasture. Um, something popped up here. It's probably getting in the way. 
Try again. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, there we go. Okay, I threw this in knowing it would be complicated because this was the complicated process that got us to last week. This is roughly the sequence of things that happened to get us to about 2018 at the various time scales, starting literally in 2008, replacement of that um, you know, culvert. But we went through a lot of things. We had some plant surveys. Uh, we had various failures at um, grant team, uh, but this was all of the groups that became involved. Finally, the funders started us out where NOAA for design, construction, monitoring through a salmon restoration project, wild salmon. And then we also had some NIFWIP funds, some Oregon Wildlife funds, some OWIP funds. And if you add this all up, it's about $330,000 to get us to the point we're at. The permitting process, and I'm sure that, you know, the people here are familiar with this. I was not. This was uh, a shock. After living an academic life, you're not having to go through this process. But here we had NOAA PSA uh, permitting, we had NOAA National Historic Tribal Review, um, which was fascinating but delayed. We had a State Historical Preservation Office review, Oregon Department of Wildlife Fish Passage Reviews, Army Corps of Engineers, removal, fill removal, design and approval. DEQ water quality management, DEQ stormwater management, uh, our landowner commission, Placid County floodplain, and for salvage. Wow. <laughs> so, I'm sure a lot of you are all familiar with that, but I was not. So, hence, hence the age lines. <laughs> okay, final day, September 16, 2022. Here's uh, that fence line that used to exist, here's the house up here for winter reference, now and here's the pond. So we have blocked this off, put a plug in here, redirected everything this way, and that's roughly where we're at. So we're having to place fencing in here, so this will remain as pasture. You can see some of the historical drainage that came through here went back through here. So we're going to put a lot of water back into this area right here. And uh, we'll be planting this entire area as well. So what I've done, uh, we have some composite um, views just to give you the perspective before and after. So each one of these represents March, in this case of Westview, and a Westview October in roughly the same location, just going what we've done, this is the area that was worked. We moved about, I didn't, it was <laughs> about 15,000 cubic yards of dirt pushed around most of various locations. And then here's an east view, March, which is slightly different view. We're now looking down this old fence line right here, showing you how direct it was in this strange pattern that came out of here. And now what it looks like here. This is going to be a major uh, pool area. And then just below this, it's going to turn and go down that field and pick up the water on the backside and on down to the, to the river. So these are some nice drone posts. These, again, these were just done. Well, these were done just a week ago. These were done back in March. So uh, just to uh, show you a little bit about what I'm calling vernal pools. Thank you. And what Steve doesn't think are vernal pools, which I think are like. So, uh, here's before, here's after, here's the plug in here. We have a culvert. We now have a road access here to get into these fields. And what we've got is a little spillway on the plug to take high water overflows and go through this culvert and fill this uh, during the winter. And we'll also have backwater into here, plus the natural drainage of the, of the property. And so I think that they qualify. I think I asked Siri this morning. <laughs> <laughs> she agrees with me. 
sort of, if with the exception that these are going to have fish in fry. But we have an awful lot of frogs, an awful lot of newts, an awful lot of insects. Anyway, um, here's what it will look like now. This is during the dry season through here. Here's one of these hyperate pools that exist all summer long. See all the insects on the top of them? <laughs> I have no doubt. <laughs> we'll, we'll talk. But we do we'll talk to It you. is true that we do, we had to clean this out. We did look at a lot of fry that were hanging out in there, COVID 5, just waiting to get back to the green skin. So if, if we think it will work in that capacity, in addition to what happens in the redirected stream. Uh, another aspect of this is that we have quite a few beaver. And in the pond that you saw in the first picture, uh, in the summer when it dries down, they literally have channelized this entire pond area. And so we put in these beaver dam analogs, which I've never seen before. If you just drive the posts in, intersperse them with spruce branches in this case, and the water flow is coming this way. And the idea is that they will recognize this and rebuild on this. We already have half a dozen nice beaver dams in the system all the way down the river. And we see a beaver quite a bit. In fact, almost too much because they eat too many of our willows. Um, that's another thing. So anyway, that's kind of gives you the flavor of where we're at. Uh, acknowledging Steve Trask, Trask himself, I can Steve. I'm trying. <laughs> okay, Steve, I know you wanted to harass me. But you didn't. <laughs> anyway, uh, project manager Steve Trask was amazing. This is all he does for a living, is this type of uh, reconstruction. The, his son, who actually does all of the construction work, Graham. Project engineer was Adam Zucker, and the restoration by the current biologist is Derek Willie, and the project minister, uh, Maggie Payton, the director of the upper field marshes, was actually got the money. And all this drone work was foresight drilling services. So the funding we ended up with um, NOAA, Wild Salmon Center, and there's their, they actually work in Washington and Oregon. Um, and I've seen some of their efforts over here, I think, it's basically the top of it. Uh, NIFWIF, we had funding from uh, Holy Air and Wildlife, we had funding from, of course, we ended up just in kind support. We actually had to buy an acre uh, from the neighbor to be able to transect directly where we needed the elevation across the property. And finally, uh, Troy Laws, who uh, is now retired, actually suggested this relocation. We were after just riparian restoration, but he's the one that actually suggested and argued strongly for this actual stream relocation, which is kind of unusual, certainly unusual in the pond in the Haven. So it's a little unique in that respect, especially the length. And I just wanted to leave you with this statement. Uh, David Montgomery's book, uh, in King of Fish, Thousand Year Run of Salmon, that salmon need just a few basic things. And the main one is restoring rivers and streams, guided by an understanding of historical conditions and salmon producing capacity. Potential. So, um, if you invite me back to talk about room, we'll <laughs> I'll show you our planting the next time, which is the next major effort. Plus, we're now waiting for some rain to fill the system and see if it's going to work. Anyway, thank you. Did you know what I was going to say after the break? If it's not worth the break, the next talk. Thank you. So, uh, the next talk is from Dan Brown at Reagan BQ. This talk is the 2017 National Product Resource Survey of Oregon Lakes. Um, I'm going to note also that after um, this talk, we're going to have a discussion about statewide uh, studies of lakes in Oregon, and hopefully, Dan can stick around for the same discussions. Hey, Dan, you're there. Dan is here. I'm here. All right. Let me 
get my slides up for you. Sorry, coming up now. Let's see. All right, let's back to this and try that again. There we go. And we'll get to presentation mode. Are you guys uh, able to see that? We see the slides, but it's not presentation mode. Is it looking better now? Yep, that looks good. Okay, great. Well, let me say first and foremost, uh, hi, everyone. I'm really happy to have an opportunity to present the results of our survey of Oregon Lakes uh, for you today. I'm sorry that I can't be with you in person, um, but it is my anniversary weekend, so I couldn't miss out on that. Uh, so. Uh, I know some of you will be familiar with the uh, with the work that we did already. So what I'm going to do today is I'll give a little bit of background before talking about our key findings. And then because uh, Oregon Lakes Association helped us out with identifying some of the target lakes, I'm going to focus a little bit on our results that we found there too. Um, before I jump into any of that, though, I do want to acknowledge my co-authors on this report. Uh, the report we put out in August, um, I had some help from Shannon Hubler and Mike Mulvey. Uh, Shannon is the biomonitoring project manager um, that oversees all of the National Aquatic Resource Survey work that DEQ takes on, um, as well as multiple other projects. And Mike was the toxics monitoring coordinator um, for uh, the lab, the DEQ's lab, uh, but he's now uh, successfully uh, retired. So uh, he had a long career with DEQ and one of the last reports that he helped put out was this one. So with that, we'll go ahead and get in to the results here or the survey or, man, I'm all over the place right now. <clears throat> so uh, our focus today is on the 2017 survey of uh, Oregon Lakes, which was part of EPA's National Aquatic Resource Surveys. These surveys occur on a five-year cycle with the previous efforts occurring in 2007 and 2012. Our sample sizes during those efforts uh, were too small to summarize lakes, uh, lake conditions in a statistically valid manner. So in 2017, we combined resources uh, and sampling efforts for our biomonitoring and toxics monitoring programs to boost our sample size from what would have been 29 randomly sampled lakes to 49. Um, and with that larger sample size, we were able to make comparisons to other Pacific Northwest states and gain some insight into what was happening uh, over time. The Oregon and North, uh, Pacific Northwest populations of lakes that were used are shown in the figure to the right. Um, and I do wanna point out that this work uh, represents the first statewide assessment of toxic compounds in Oregon's lakes and reservoirs uh, done by DEQ. Um, we use the same site selection methods, sampling techniques, lake classifications, and perform the same analysis as the National Lakes Assessment to ensure consistency with that national report. This, that means that to be included in this survey, a lake was identified as being at least one hectare or having at least one hectare of surface area, at least one meter deep, at least a, one, uh, a tenth of a hectare of open water, and a minimum residence time of one week. Lakes that weren't included um, in the selection process were commercial treatment or disposal ponds, tidally influenced lakes, and ephemeral lakes. Uh, using those criteria and based on the lakes identified in the National Hydrography data set, um, excuse me, the population of Oregon lakes was 4,819. Uh, lakes were selected using a stratified random sampling design to ensure adequate representation across uh, the five size categories that's shown in the uh, table on the right there. And the table shows how those 48,000 or 4,800 lakes were represented in our sample size of 49. Uh, 49 was considered the minimal sample size to be adequately representative of, the, of Oregon's lakes. Um, and we would have liked to sample more lakes uh, so that we could parse the population into different categories and answer uh, more specific questions, but we, sim we simply didn't have the funding to expand the sample size anymore. Uh, the NLA or National Lakes Assessment includes five indicator categories to which we added a toxics assessment component. Um, and we separated out E. coli and microcystins um, into a recreation indicator 
because Oregon has benchmarks for both of those, uh, which not all states have. And we felt that this would allow us to um, or provide us an opportunity to provide a more meaningful analysis of both. So you can find that in the report, um, a little bit more discussion on that. Uh, for each lake, um, sampling occurred over a single day and in three zones. We had the mid lake, which is identified as the deepest point of the lake, uh, littoral and the riparian zones. The inclusion of the toxics assessment required uh, collecting additional water and sediment samples for analysis at the DEQ lab in Hillsboro, uh, and those samples were collected at the Mid Lake location. Um, assessment of toxics included compounds from nine chemical groups uh, in the water samples and three chemical groups in sediment, and here's a quick look at those. Um, in water samples, this amounted to uh, around 525 compounds, while in sediment, uh, the analyte list included over 200 compounds. Um, the list, is, they differ um, because, my, sorry, um, the list differ because not all uh, the compounds that we can find in water um, readily bind to the sediment. So we had a smaller uh, list of uh, compounds there. To assess uh, EPA indicators, sampling results were compared to ecoregion specific reference sites, which represented lakes uh, with the lowest amounts of human disturbance. In Oregon, uh, reference sites from the Western Mountains and Zarek ecoregions were used to assess indicators, and those are shown. Western Mountains is brown on the map in the right, and uh, Zarek ecoregion is shown in purple. Uh, sampling results from the toxics assessment were compared to fixed benchmarks for compounds with published ecological or human health risk values. And these risk values indicate the concentration at or below which the compound is not expected to have a health impact on humans, aquatic life, or to accumulate in fish or shellfish tissue. Um, parameter results were then analyzed or assigned to one of three categories, uh, good, fair, or poor for the EPA indicators above benchmark, at or below benchmark, or not detected uh, for the toxics assessment. We then extrapolated those assignments to get an estimate of the population of Oregon lakes in each category. Um, and we know that um, single sampling point uh, for parameters that fluctuate seasonally or um, daily makes typical interpretations of lake conditions um, pretty, pretty difficult you know, at best. Uh, but this is a, it was a population study, so we needed to visit as many lakes as possible and couldn't uh, go back to the same ones over and over. So we'll move into some key findings now, and this will go fairly quick. Um, the figures on the next three slides will show the percentage of lakes in good condition for the population of lakes in Oregon, shown in red, the Pacific Northwest, shown in blue, and nationwide, and that's going to be shown in yellow. Um, biological indicator or conditions of Oregon's lakes were generally good. Zooplankton and benthic macroinvertebrate communities were in good condition in 70 to 80 percent of Oregon's lakes. Um, we say generally good here because that leaves about 20 to 25 percent or close to 1,200 lakes where these conditions are at risk if conditions were to uh, deteriorate. Um, Measures of eutrophication, namely chlorophyll A, shown at the top there, um, but also phosphorus and nitrogen were the most widespread indicators of poor conditions in Oregon's lakes. Uh, these measures were also identified as the most extensive stressor at the national scale as well. Lakeshore disturbance had the lowest percentage of lakes in good condition across all stressors assessed. Uh, at 44%, it was nearly half of all of the other uh, physical habitat indicators. And only chlorophyll A at 46% of lakes in good condition was even close. Uh, all detected E. coli and microcystin concentrations occurred below recreational contact designations. So E. coli was estimated to occur in 34% of lakes, while microcystin was estimated to occur in just 2% of lakes. Um, it's also worth pointing out that the sampling protocol for microcystin and E. coli did not target specific locations with high recreational use like boat docks or beaches uh, for those two parameters. Um, so risk to human health may be underrepresented. Um, toxic, com toxic compounds were rarely found above criteria in water samples. Um, out of the 525 compounds we assessed, 77 of those were detected and 15 exceeded their criteria. 
Uh, those compounds in, uh, included two combustion byproducts, which is shown in the uh, figure on the left there uh, in red, and one current use pesticide, pesticide, sorry, one dioxin, six legacy pesticides, and five metals. The compound estimated to occur in the most lakes was chrysine, uh, a, com a combustion byproduct that was estimated to occur um, in above its criterion in 8% or about 385 of Oregon's lakes. Lake sediment samples contain mercury, DDT, and PCBs that persist in sediment and bioaccumulate in fish and other aquatic life. Uh, mercury and DDT were estimated to be at present at concentrations above their background or screening levels in 55% and 44% of Oregon's lakes respectively, which were some of the highest percentages seen across all parameters. Um, the presence of PCBs, but not in water, was a bit surprising as we'd expected to find some number of PCBs in water, if only at low, con uh, low concentrations. Um, in total, 13 compounds were found at concentrations above their sediment bioaccumulation screening levels. Um, mercury was, uh, I think I already pointed out, was found in 55% of, uh, or estimated to occur above its benchmark uh, in 55% of Oregon's lakes. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we had some, we also did some target lake sampling. Those target lakes were not included in the EPA indicator analysis or the toxics assessment uh, because we solicited input from interested parties, which didn't adhere to the EPA sampling uh, protocols. Um, so we sampled four target lakes, which uh, included Lake Abert, Barney Reservoir, Hag Lake, and Wohink Lake. I'm only gonna talk about Lake Abert and Wohink in this section uh, to make sure we have plenty of time for questions afterwards. Um, so if you aren't familiar with Lake Abert, uh, it's a hypersaline and alkaline lake in South Central Oregon. Uh, for comparison, salinity has been measured in Lake Abert at 70 to 200 parts per thousand, while the average seawater is 35 parts per thousand. Um, the average alkalinity of lakes included in this study was 21 milligrams per liter compared to nearly 21,000 milligrams per liter that we found. Uh, Lake Abert was suggested for inclusion in the study by uh, the Oregon Lakes Association because it's one of only a few hypersaline lakes in the US. Um, the lake is situated in a closed basin, which means it doesn't flush or cycle water in and out like open basin lakes would. Uh, and this can lead to concentrations of contaminants. Our ability um, to compare uh, results from Lake Abert to EPA indicators was limited uh, because the lake, uh, the nature of the lake, um, and we compared our to the results of our toxics assessment uh, to the available saltwater criteria. Um, lake Abert has developed unique biological communities due to its unique chemical and physical characteristics. Um, only three benthic macroinvertebrate taxa were collected uh, with brine flies representing 97% of the sample. Five zooplankton taxa were uh, found and were dominated by water fleas and rotifers. The total phosphorus concentration found in Lake Abert um, was much higher than found in any other other lakes uh, included in the study as shown in the figure to the top or at the top left. Um, while this concentration isn't uh, as high as some historical concentrations, it is higher than any other phosphorus uh, concentration on record at DEQ. Um, e. coli, uh, the E. coli recorded in Lake Abert uh, was the only one that was above the contact recreation criterion um, indicated by the red dashed line. Um, this may be due in part to the importance of the lake as a stopover for migratory birds, but that was kind of outside the scope uh, of our study. Um, and this recreation isn't a supported use on Lake Abert, so our comparison here is just made for informational purposes. The concentration of 4,4-DDE, arsenic, and copper represented the highest concentration found across all lakes in the study and were above their chronic saltwater aquatic life criteria. As shown in the top bar chart, the arsenic concentration was well above the saltwater criteria indicated by the blue solid line. Uh, the concentration of 4,4-DDE um, is of potential concern because it's a breakdown product of uh, DDT, uh, which is known to affect the reproductive ability of birds. With four other compounds, aluminum, ammonia, iron, and phenanthrene, 
uh, that also had high concentrations. However, um, some of those don't have saltwater criteria. Um, in sediment samples, only arsenic was found at a concentration above DEQ's sediment background levels. Um, no legacy pesticides or PCBs were found in the sediment sample from the lake. We'll move on to Wohink Lake. Uh, it serves as a drinking water supply for nearby communities on the central coast. Uh, the lake was, this lake was also suggested for inclusion by this organization um, because coastal lakes or tidal lakes were not included in the main study. Uh, Wohink Lake is also an important recreational lake uh, to shoreline homeowners as well as lots of visitors. The benthic macroinvertebrate and uh, zooplankton communities were in good condition, as were total phosphorus and total nitrogen. Chlorophyll A, however, was in fair condition, um, which is worth noting. Um, habitat conditions in Wohink Lake were mixed. Drawdown was not large. Littoral cover was in good condition. However, riparian vegetation and riparian disturbances were just in fair condition. We only found three compounds in water samples from Wohink Lake. Uh, two of the detected compounds, barium and manganese, are naturally occurring. Um, and the third was 2,6-dichlorobenzamide, uh, which is a breakdown product from the current use pesticide diclobenyl. Um, the detected concentration was just above the detection limit, so no human health or aquatic life. Uh, uh, there was no threat um, to human health or aquatic life. Um, the sediment samples contained four compounds, arsenic, lead, mercury, and total DDT. Um, they occurred at concentrations above their background levels. Uh, or screening levels. Um, and these concentrations do not pose an immediate risk to human health or aquatic life. However, the concentration of total DDT could accumulate in tissues of fish or other aquatic life and pose a potential risk to um, humans or wildlife that regularly uh, consume um, the fish from there. Uh, what's next? Uh, the National Lakes Assessment occurred again this year. We completed our sampling in September but we did not include uh, an assessment of toxics this time around. Um, this means that the sample size was just 22 lakes. Um, information collected will be included in the National Lakes Assessment, uh, but the sample size was too small uh, for us to complete another statewide assessment. Uh, for this reason, uh, a major lesson learned from the 2017 uh, survey is how closely the population of Oregon lakes agreed with the population of Pacific Northwest lakes. And this may allow us to um, make some inferences about potential changes between 2017 and, and what we found in 2022. Um, one notable, notable change uh, to the sampling protocol uh, is that microcystin sampling is now focused on HABs and will be collected at the highest risk areas in the lake. Um, for example, areas with high alkyl densities or um, recreational use areas. Uh, I know that was kind of a lot in a fairly short amount of time, um, but it's I think we've got some time for questions. So, um, and it sounds like we have a period of time afterwards. So I'm happy to take any questions that you may have. I need to repeat the question too. People can. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. I'm having a hard time hearing um, questions. If there are some, so if somebody could type them into the chat or just repeat them, that'd be great. Hey, Dan, this is Andy Schadell. And uh, when I reviewed the report, I noticed that DEEP was commonly found in a lot of the lakes. Mm -hmm. Do you care comment, comment on that? Or it's kind of a curious finding, I thought. Um, yeah, you know, we didn't, uh, we didn't cover it a lot um, just because there's not a, a human health criteria for it. Um, so we didn't mention it a whole lot, but we did find it in quite a few lakes. Um, at, at just a high percentage of lakes it was estimated to occur in. Um, we don't believe we, our sampling crews are told not to, even though there were lots of uh, you know, mosquitoes and things at different lakes, our samplers are told not to use any bug spray that has DEET in it. So that we know that we weren't contaminating those, but we do think that that's a, a possible route for contamination uh, in some of the lakes or how DEET would make its way in there. Um, but yeah, we were a bit surprised at, at how much, uh, how many lakes DEET was estimated to occur in. 
Uh, Dan, thanks. Two questions. Uh, just a clarification for the 2022. Did you include mm -hmm. the extra lakes, like the 49 instead of the 27? Uh, no, we were able to boost our sample size in 2017 because we combined the toxics monitoring program with our uh, bio monitoring program and the funds that we got from EPA. Uh, we weren't able to do that in 2022. So um, our sampling size was just the 22 lakes. Um, and we understand that that's a, it's a pretty small sample size, um, but it is consistent with um, how many lakes we typically sample during the national lakes assessment. Yep, understood. Um, there's a lot of mercury. So what's the source of, of the mercury? Yeah, uh, to a certain extent, um, based on um, just the geological makeup of, uh, of Oregon, there's a lot of mercury that does uh, occur naturally. And so we think that some of that uh, is caused um, is, is just, just that it's naturally occurring. Um, other potential routes uh, of contamination, um, it's a little bit uncertain for us. The, the scope of our report is not necessarily to identify potential sources. Um, so it is a little difficult to say. I mean, I know that it can make it, mercury can make its way in from uh, air deposition and things like that, but uh, it's really hard for us to say exactly uh, where it's coming from. Questions? Also, if you're online, uh, please, questions in the chat are raised hands. Wasn't there a prior uh, national survey of pesticides? And and there may have been a, a the same or a different one that uh, examined uh, pesticides in fish tissue that could have provided some background data for your Oregon lakes. Does anyone recall those two prior studies? No. I have proof. <laughs> <laughs> we believe you. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm certain that there have, uh, there has been uh, some prior work done, um, but those, uh, those references weren't uh, a part of what we included here, um, and uh, yeah, I can't, I can't really comment necessarily on on what that is uh, or what the, how that would have helped inform us necessarily given that I, I haven't seen the reports um, but uh, I mean moving forward I think yes it would be good for us to to look for other um, other reports and from national scale and that might give us some insight uh, and help kind of explain some of uh, what we're finding um, I do see a, a, a question in the chat um, the lakes are randomly selected so there may be some overlap. The question is, were the lakes sampled in 2022 the same as those uh, sampled in 2017? And the answer is no. Uh, there may be some overlap, um, but it's pretty uncommon. Uh, the lakes are, like I said, it's a randomly stratified design. Uh, so the likelihood of the same lake getting selected two years in a, uh, two cycles in a row is, is pretty low. I have one more question. You mentioned that microcystin testing and you said that it was now based, focused on um, um, recreational exposure, which would be at beach sites or where the, where you said where the bloom was, was um, more, con more um, <clears throat> was more dense. But um, mm -hmm. so that means, so you didn't change the sampling date. It's still a randomly chosen or some, somehow chosen sampling date that is not responsive to whether there's a bloom present, correct? That is correct, yes. Uh, when our crews are out there and we can get people in the sample, that's when we sample. Um, but yeah, it's not, it's not responsive to uh, whether or not there might be a bloom happening uh, at the time. Um, so we, we can get tea for a while. We can also open this up to a more broad discussion, statewide uh, monitoring of the lakes. Um, we can also continue to ask questions at the end. You were sat there at the end. To ask you questions about the report. So, um, I do have a few that I was going to ask really quickly. Um, so you mentioned the stratified design. Um, is that 
Was that based purely on lake size, or was there a geographic distribution as well in terms of how the stratified rain sampling occurred within Oregon? Yeah, no, there was a there was a, a geographic component included as well. I didn't mention it here, um, and and Shannon would be able to answer it much more um, succinctly than I'll be able to. Uh, but there was a there was a geographic component to that as well. Um, we do know that there are more if you know if we were to go back to the slide that showed where we did our sampling, uh, there were more lakes selected in the Willamette area. Um, and that's just because of the um, the percentage that were there. Uh, lakes occur, there's more lakes that occur kind of in that general area, but um, there, the geographic component of the selection um, protocol uh, did, did ensure that we, not all of our lakes were in the same sort of area. What was it based on the two eco regions, the Western Mountains and the Zero? Oh, oh, okay, yeah, I hear um, They're high level eco region stratification, I guess. But. Yeah, you know, it wasn't um, for the national scale. It might have, they might have kind of worked out that they would get certain numbers of lakes in the different geo region or eco regions. Um, but for Oregon, uh, it wasn't, it wasn't necessarily stratified that way to try and keep it equal for the, the eco regions that I know of. Right. Dan, I'm curious how y'all expect people to use the results of this report. Um, I know that there's, you know, value in just monitoring for the sake of monitoring, but um, have you, yeah, have you had any experience of people using it or how do you expect people to use the, the report? And yeah. The yeah, that's a good question. Um, we have responded to a couple of requests um, uh, for, for the data, um, but you know that we haven't really heard how people people haven't really said how they were going to be to use the data or the results, um, and yeah, it it's I think having the initial statewide study of lakes and and being able to give the information that says yeah we ex we saw contamination and we think. Uh, we can estimate the contamination of DDT across all of Oregon's lakes to be about uh, a certain, you know, maybe 44% or I forget exactly what the number was. Uh, I think that's a useful piece of information to then go back and maybe look um, and see how important it will be to continue to sample that on into the future. Um, I think the most important result for us uh, from this is being able to um, to compare results with the Pacific Northwest. I mean, we're gonna to continue to do these, um, participate in the National Lakes Assessments. And so moving forward, uh, I think it's gonna be helpful for us to be able to compare across those uh, sampling efforts a little bit. Um, and so I think that is the, the major part is just seeing the trending. Um, if we can say from 2007, you know, DDT was estimated to be in this number of lakes versus the you know, um, what it was in 2022 and be able to look at it that way. Um, so I think that sort of trending component uh, is gonna be the most useful <clears throat> just because we don't, uh, we don't have um, the specific results from every single lake. So looking at kind of like a high level, I think is gonna be the most useful way. Um, I will say that when we put the report out, uh, we did provide um, kind of the raw data that goes with along with each lake um, so that folks that are interested in specific sampling results from a, a particular lake can find that information and see what a particular concentration of DDT, for example, was in a, in a lake that they may be uh, interested in. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Randy, you have a question? Question from Randy. <laughs> Steps in. Yeah. Hey, Dan, Randy Jones. Um, <clears throat> Oregon Lakes Association is really interested in citizen science. And so as you think about future lake survey uh, efforts, um, what, what are your suggestions how, um, say, a reasonably scaled citizen science program sponsored by Oregon Lakes uh, Association could fit with DEQ's efforts? Yeah, well, that, that is a good question. Um, and I think that the sampling that can be done by 
uh, as you said, reasonably skilled uh, folks, uh, I think it could be really useful, um, you know, because of the, the say lack of resources that we have to continue to boost our sample size. Uh, if we could partner uh, with Oregon Lakes Association in some way to uh, you know, share sampling protocols and maybe boost our sampling size that way, I think it would allow us to continue to um, you know, collect more samples. And that's, I mean, more information uh, on our lakes is gonna, I think it's helpful for everyone. So uh, I know that the, the sampling protocols are very uniform and that uh, that information is available early. Uh, so it could, it could be really useful to, uh, to partner um, with Oregon Lakes Association if that's something that we were able to do um, and share data in that way. Um, you know, our, our analytical sections do run some of the samples and it would be something that we would have to discuss with EPA. Um, because the, a lot of the samples are uh, analyzed um, nationally uh, as well, which is a big reason why we were just we're just now releasing the um, 2017 report. You know, five year cycle. Um, it took a long time to get that data out, but that's because a lot of the um, analysis had to be done on those samples and then data be worked up on a national scale uh, before we could release our report as well. To follow up from that, would you uh, think that <clears throat> additional sampling would be more useful in different lakes to increase the number of lakes or stretch out the time? The, 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 the timing is now in September, is that right? Sort of, of rough when, of when the, we the, collect our samples? Yeah. Uh, well, we this year we ended our sampling in September, uh, but it we were out sampling those 22 lakes uh, over the course of a couple of months. Um, so the sampling. Uh, what did the guidelines from EPA say? Uh, when the sampling can occur? Yeah. Um, I believe for us, uh, ours was outside of the, outside the growing season. So we collected our samples between, or um, that's not the right term. Uh, we collected our samples between June and September. And I think okay. those are the guidelines. guidelines. Yeah. So would you, think, would you think more likes or more time points? would be better. Right. Um, I think based on our, the, the need for us uh, as far as DEQ to uh, adhere to the sampling protocols of EPA, um, I think more lakes would be beneficial. Um, I do understand that uh, more time points um, from a specific lake uh, standpoint, it would be better to have more time points. Um, but I think as far as you uh, are working with are within the boundaries of the National uh, Lakes Assessment kind of protocols, it, more lakes uh, on that single time point would, would be more useful. So then sorry to follow up on that, but so for the EPA design, there is a requirement, but that's not necessarily something that Oregon needs to follow to meet the criteria. So there, so in, in other words, additional sampling could be done over time if that was of interest that would I mean, still satisfy the EPA requirements for sampling. But mm -hmm. from a statewide perspective, if we're interested in looking at seasonal trends, which I think is a big question, mm -hmm. that could be an opportunity while still meeting EPA requirements for funding. And I guess, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and just as a follow-up too, so you, you mentioned that you know, you, you're able to combine resources in 2017 for the toxics monitoring program. Mm -hmm. so have some sort of documentation about how much additional money or resources would be needed to sufficiently run a statewide assessment? And has there been any talks about maybe coming together like a policy option package or seeking out additional EPA funds to help uh, supplement that in the future that may you know, be outside and even combining other programs? Because then you know, the talk of having resource limitation, if you can document that, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, there have been some conversations, uh, and I know that in the lead up to our sampling this year, um, there were some discussions about could we do the same thing? Could we combine those resources with the toxics monitoring program uh, to boost the sample size again? Um, and I, I mean, I, I know that those conversations happened. Uh, I was not a part of them. Um, and 
as far as creating a policy option package um, to do that, I think that's a good idea. Um, but again, that I am more on the data analysis side and less on the uh, on the planning side. Um, so that the what would be uh, the approval for something like that is kind of it's outside of it's, well, we it's above my pay grade. Sorry, what? <laughs> no, we can make recommendations. Just the managers have to, to take it up. To, Right. Yeah, and and I'll and I'll say that uh, Shannon, um, who leads the who leads the biomonitoring program, um, is very vocal um, in his support and um, desire to for us to do more lake sampling. Um, so I, I know that he would be very supportive, if not um, having already brought up, uh, you know, at the idea of additional sampling. Um, and, our, and just the need for uh, continued sampling in lakes. Um, he would love there to be a, a, a specific or kind of standalone lake sampling uh, project that continually goes on. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I believe he would, he would definitely be supportive of that. I feel like there was another part to your question that I haven't answered. Um, um, that's not seasonal. I mean, that's something you can have all the time. Speaking of internal discussions as well, the EQ. Okay. Um, uh, Richard, you got a question. Hi, Dan. Rich Wetz. Um, uh, it kind of is an adjunct to the same conversation. Um, uh, the EQ considered working with the Watershed Councils of Oregon. Um, I've worked with the Ten Mile Lake Basin Partnership for many years on water sampling, and mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of watershed councils out there, and they're sort of in the perfect position. They're kind of on site. Uh, probably already have a lot of the equipment needed and the skills uh, mm -hmm. might be a little bit higher than us, you know, the citizen, um, mm -hmm. citizen. So they're considered kind of, kind of create some kind of program that works directly with the councils to get OWEB funding for that. Yeah, uh, well, we do have um, we do have a volunteer monitoring program um, that already exists and they uh, the groups that are a part of that do generally get OWEB funding. Um, but is that something that we have proposed uh, that the, the, the groups that are a part of a volunteer monitoring? Uh, I don't know if our coordinator has spoken to them about doing lake sampling um, and whether or not they could get a web funding for that. I'm sure that they could, um, but I don't know if that's a conversation that has happened. Um, I think that it would be a, a good suggestion. And I think that uh, I can take that back to uh, Shannon and to our volunteer monitoring program coordinator um, for them to discuss uh, before we would be doing any other sampling um, in lakes. But I think that uh, could be a way to get more samples collected um, and on a more consistent basis. Yeah. Uh, Mark's got a question here. And also, again, folks online, if you have questions, please raise your hand or enter in the chat. Mark, go ahead. Yeah, this is not a question for Dan. I think we've kind of opened this time period up for other other folks too. Um, uh, thanks a lot, Dan. Um, yeah, this is Mark Rosencrantz, and uh, uh, this is a question for Wayne. Uh, really excited to see the progress on your project uh, next year when uh, when we uh, see the conference, see you at the conference. Now, uh, you mentioned the fencing in the pasture land in your property, and that it sounds like you weren't really able to eliminate the fencing and you had to replace it. I just, if you have uh, some clarification on that, why you couldn't just leave the fencing out uh, entirely from that uh, from that property. Well, we could leave the fencing out. Connect to the job Well, I was trying to hold it up so we could hear, but. Uh... Okay. All right, so go ahead. Well, we could, we could have There's like a, something okay. happening right now that's supposed to go, it's, it's done. Of, uh, old field that was yeah. going to go back to what's happened before, which was Blackberry and Thistle. And so we would have to manage them. I see. As I pointed out over the 10 years on the project, if they would like, you can have the whole thing. I see. And so eventually uh, you would like to go back to that. Salmon people with fish and wildlife, there's sympathy for it. It's just not funding. So I fully expect that in stages, 
we will carve back that entire piece to to wetland and, and drainage and uh, habitat. So, okay. But you know, I probably won't do that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. I had a question on that same thing. Uh, with uh, you said you have a lot of beavers or several beavers on the property already, and that you're adding more of the beavers. Is there a thanks, Dan? Where you have too many beavers, or I mean, how is that? Um, oh, I'm sure that there are at that point, and the neighbors already think that that's already there. Um, but I the, the sense is that we provide them more habitat, we can accommodate more beavers. More beavers are clearly beneficial to that salmon habitat as well. So that that's the argument. But where's the where's the line? Uh, I don't know what the population is. We have at least probably four or five clusters, groups, colonies, whatever you call them. Uh, so they're already there. We see them quite a bit, and the neighbors do too. Because are they limited by the food supply? Like the yeah. Food yeah. 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 yeah, that's pretty much it. So we have a lot, but the idea would be to plant a lot more. A lot of what we would be planting a little, little whips and. Um, Thanks, Paul. I think that ends the session for this morning. Thanks, everyone, for being here and online. Thanks for the letters. I believe we have a lunch break until 1 30. We start back with Yvonne. And lunch will be on at uh, But we have, um, there's the, on one of you, the groups on one of the boats, Michael Newley's boat. Oh, yes. Had a monitor, uh, maybe one of yours, Dylan, um, and has some profile. Who was, who was on Michael Newley's boat? Okay. So he sent some data that we can just look at. Uh, oh, is it not on there? I don't know. It's an Excel file. Oh, blast. I have it for my email. I can pull it up. Can you? Yeah, I can. Yeah. I don't have yeah these problem I know with the old dial things they not properly pushed in there. But that was um, yeah. Did you send that last night or this morning? Oh, there it is. My email is really behind. So these are Mike's data. Here's a temperature profile. I'm just going to share screen. Yeah. What's this speed? So down to meters, meters, meters. Yeah, right. And uh, and stratification here at Tinnish. Yeah. And the this one. So what's the explanation of this? Thinking diatoms. Yes. Photosynthetic activity. Yeah. Yeah. Why do they hang out at that? <laughs> why do they hang out at that position? Probably uh, it's because the optimizer was nice and phosphorus. And temperature? And, and they have enough light. Temperature is probably not at this. Uh, phosphorus is increasing because it's released from the depths, which are probably more less. I don't know which are what the nutrient profile would look like. When you see a middle and then Maximum, that's the first thing I think it is uh, yeah, associated in, in, uh, in the mid zone to optimize for the end. I don't still see know. that a lot. How do they that? Of course, they're not buoyant. So, is are they are they hang out at the stratification level so sitting on top of the pole? You can still see a lot of diatoms in there, even the, 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 the cabinet act 
voice just because of uh, uh, currents. So what you can't see here are labs and flows. Yeah. You'll see that in a Dell is you still have a uh, metal magnetic maximum diatom. And uh, and there's sufficient turbulence internal to maintain a diatom Cyano numbers often, uh, Brandon, Brandon uh, sort of have a similar profile, don't they? Whereas you, you know, the the, the classic books, book, textbook thing is that the 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 the, the cyanobacteria load up on photosynthate during the day, get heavy, sink down, and then come up at night, and they're ready at the top during the in the morning. Is that that's the textbook? Right, but if what actually happens to you? Do you think that that really does happen? I don't know how much uh, vertical migration you see. You have any idea? I, I mean, we can tell you, like, Odell was seeing the focus on a deep space, you know, so the morning, so yeah, they but it's in the deep, yeah. I mean, what are they doing now? It's supposed to be points, yeah. They, they, if they have a vertical migration to access the dust. How far are the small souls? Yeah. Is this less oxic enough to mobilize phosphorus from, from the 60%? Yeah, that's still pretty low. Where's, where's the like one percent light level? Are you know, how this relative to light penetration? You know, it's really clear, but no, you know, we, 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 we didn't have a second. Yeah, so you should second spread that with 10 to 12 meter for 20 hours. Well, so it was. The highest saturation was at 12 meters. Was that, we played around with the Was that lowest measurement right at the center of the surface, or is it on the surface there? Uh, both. Okay. Both. Yeah. We hit, pulled it up a little bit. I was like, wow, oh, it's really low. Yeah. Um, we pulled it up a little bit and felt it not hard. Yeah. I mean, what's the typical turnover though? Well, they put it in the way now, and there's some others. <laughs> My understanding it happens usually in, in October, but this is unusual weather for us. Theo and I were talking about the uh, potential for snow during this conference. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have to worry about that, Theo. <laughs> As a as a comparison, Baldo Lake, um, the typical yeast ratification in fall, it kind of it's kind of similar to this around this time of year. It just keeps on moving down, and then it doesn't fully mix until um, second week of November or something like that. So it's kind of a slow progression. Yeah, so the deep is well back. Uh, I use their cleaners. Like walk. Third base, and this. Okay, thanks everybody for this. For this to, to, thank you to the speakers this morning. Is the, the lunch is out? No, no, yeah, no, 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 okay, no. all right. Well, we can uh, wait for the uh, catering staff to catch up and talk terminology. Thanks, everybody. I'm glad Mike did that. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> 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 One in particular, it's different to the summer and the summer.
whatever it is pops up. Sorry. It pops up to service the public. All right, let me just yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. And
He posts online here. So, okay, I, I said the speaker slightly differently. Okay, um, Ray, you were talking to something for a second. Yeah, one, two, three, four. Okay. No, no, All right. I, I mean, nobody responded. I was just okay. Thank you. you awesome. Or yet? No, I've got my phone. Thank you. Next speaker is Lori Campbell. She's going to. <laughs> <laughs> no, Yvonne, can you try it again? Yeah, can you hear me? I'm going to have to put it back to see if it can work better. Can you hear me? Um. Oh, somebody turned the volume down. That's why it didn't work. Can you try again? Uh -oh. Can you yeah. hear me now? Oh, we can hear oh. you now. Um, although I guess we don't need Bluetooth at the moment, but whatever. Okay, let me share my screen. Yes, I'll do this. Oh, that is helpful. Be helpful, yeah. And I can keep the time. Can you, can you see the slide? Yes. You want to go? You want to go presentation full screen? Yeah. Yeah. So now you know your camera works and before, or you did that before. No, that was the first time I got this last week. So <laughs> this whole no, it's got slow. Right. Yvonne, it's going to be a few minutes. We just got people still trickling in. All right. It's this too nice over here. Hard. Everybody yeah. got outside. I can imagine that. <laughs> Yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> Thank you. 
Okay, we ready? Yeah, I, I don't see anybody else in earshot, so I think we'll go ahead and get started then. This is the afternoon session, and we're going to go to 2.50. So uh, beginning uh, here, we're, um, we're going to enjoy a presentation from Yvonne Erzmandi uh, from OSU. And Yvonne, I think you can hear us better now. Um, yes. I hope we'll do a kind of a sound check for you. I'll, um, uh, Desiree will give you a five minute warning and then um, uh, and then a two minute and we'll hopefully end up with time for a couple questions. All right. Very good. Take it away. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I hope you're having a good time down there. I'm actually now in southern Chile. Uh, close to a really nice lake I will share with you uh, at the end of my presentation. But this, this is our team. Uh, this is kind of a new project. We're starting working on these projects since a month ago, so I don't have any results yet. But I would like to present the, the idea about this new um, technology kind of uh, in development uh, in, in the U.S. actually. So my co-authors, uh, Sarah Henkel is uh, from... Um, COAS, Oregon State University. I am an associate professor in fisheries and wildlife and conservation sciences. And Christina Murphy is in University of Maine and USGS co-op unit. Uh, so this is a collaborative um, uh, project. And uh, we are going to uh, hire a postdoc that will start in November that will take care of uh, uh, and lead this, this uh, project. So what are these? Um, idea of, of, of um, uh, flo floating uh, solar photovoltaic systems. And it's basically what you see in the cartoon here, have inverters, floaters, and basically solar panels in, in, in a water body. And uh, these type of technologies have, uh, have had a rapid growth um, from uh, 2014. The first, the first in project was in Japan. In, 2007, so it's really a relatively really new thing that is happening now. Um, so you can imagine everything is is basically based on um, demand of energy and clean energy, especially if we can have this kind of a hybridized system in already places where, where there are already dams for hydropower. Um, people are thinking about doing this hybrid system that they can can add these solar panels in water. This um, couple of review papers out, uh, out in 2020, 2019, and 2021. There's a lot of uh, uh, um, research, but most of the research is related to technical issues. And, and, uh, and, and the advantage of this system is that you can reduce evaporation. So, you know, the, all these solar panel systems, one of the problems with the land base is the basically um, the heat, they have a heat problem. Uh, so in the water uh, is an ideal system because they can, you know, um, um, have a, a better efficiency related to, to the cooling system in the, and they are more efficient. Um, however, there is no much more about the environmental impact of these, um, the, uh, these new installations or these systems. So this is basically the, the core of, of our research. Uh, so um, these are just a uh, couple of examples. This technology again is is moving up, and um, 
is going to be in 2019, as I showed before, um, the total power that uh, in these floating systems were about 5% of what is in all the Columbia River production. So it's, it's kind of a, it's, it's small, but still substantial. substantial. Most of the projects are in, in China. You can see 73% Japan, um, Taiwan, uh, Korea, Korea, and the U.S. is really small. Uh, but I, I, I think it's, it's going to grow. Uh, here are a couple of photos of this system. This is kind of a really rudimentary system, early systems in in, in a lagoon. Uh, you can see the the solar are directly floating on the water. And in other cases, we have a and areas that you can have a floating device. And then on top of that are those, those panels and they have anchored system and stuff like that. Uh, here's another one, a view. People are starting using uh, this in series of different configurations. Here's another one, um, uh, typical uh, panel reviews. And the largest plan is in, in China and produces 40 megawatts. Uh, and the production is about uh, Cougar and um, uh, Dexter, I think, together is about the, the system. So it's the biggest is in China. So you can see there's a lot of, 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 of um, type of, of systems. There are no much more uh, uh, regulations. Here is another one. Uh, and people are starting to, to, to create more, be more, even more artistic about this. This is in, in South Korea, and you can see a uh, shape of flower and uh, <coughs> be somehow uh, a little bit more uh, uh, pleased to, to, to see also in places that are already intervening, like this reservoir, for example, in, in South Korea. In the US, uh, again, there is no much more going on and here is one example that is in California in a water treatment plan and that's that's all that we can um, we have actually so so this it was um, um, an idea of uh, the Department of Energy and had a call for project to in order to create this tool to evaluate and uh, Taking economic and environmental consideration to these projects here in the U.S. and uh, this and there is no such a tool. So um, what we do is that like we um, associate with um, uh, we have this uh, small innovative project in solar energy. The Department of Energy funded us, and uh, this work that we are proposing is lead is led by Idaho National Lab. It's OSU. Eagle Creek uh, Renewable Energy and General Electric and Cat Creek Energy. So it's, it's, it's a lot of institutions and and, and try to have um, all the, uh, a, a framework that we can use for, for the development of this type of energy in the, in the US. And you can see here our, and the red box is basically our small piece of this uh, big project. So the main idea is like to create this idea of, of some examples with transferable uh, that could be transferable to other systems and, and situations. And we are creating this um, tool that can evaluate the impact on, on, on aquatic ecosystems. Um, the project is basically uh, provide guidance to the industry to create these tools that can address environmental uh, considerations for developing these uh, systems in the US. And it's basically trying to reduce barrier to uh, uh, finance and operation and risk for developers. Um, and this is the main idea of the project. So again, we are a small piece uh, on this is huge, uh, huge project. Our, our, our part in our team is basically create this environmental module that uh, basically will be a, a, a simulation tool that can be applied to any proposed project and, and be fed with uh, actual data. And we can create kind of a, a modeling scenarios of different covering um, areas in water bodies with certain characteristics and we can provide potential uh, impact. We're not looking for a really precise tool and more or less uh, how we can see uh, an effect uh, or when we can see an effect, how big is the project? So we have basically three 
three parts of the project. The first is a little review on whatever model exists around down uh, that can we can use in order to link all these models together. Uh, we're going to select uh, the best model from the lead review and implement uh, some models, a physical model and and the biological modeling. And we cali we will calibrate the model and test in selected case studies that one of the other partners, the energy partner, will uh, provide uh, a couple of places that they will try these and, and simulate and use the model in, in those cases. And of course, they 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 can this can 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 grow in the in the future. The the main idea is trying to have a, a mechanistic model base that uh, we can link these submodels and make them uh, to feed each other in order to have later on an economic impact assessment of, of this pro uh, potential project. And again, because there is no project uh, yet in the U.S., this has to be uh, a simulation model. Um, will be physical models, will be primary productivity models, and there will be a secondary productivity and high traffic level models. And most of the models are already exist. So basically our work will be linked those models, trying to find the best ones and use this uh, and create this framework. We are not going to reinvent the wheel here. And this is one example of models. This uh, again, because the technology is so recent, uh, most of the papers are really in the last two or three years. So we're um, really, really um, on, on top of the wave, I think, in, in many things. Uh, um, there is two models that we are gonna try first, will be the, the general leg model and uh, uh, C qual dolly 2 uh, And th those models are really respected in, 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 in outside. So we're gonna try with using this, th those first. And we're gonna try to, to create um, 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 a tool that can, you can basically use different cover uh, percentages of areas uh, and then try to see what will be the impact on the thermal profiles and, and water stability on, on those based on cover basically, right? So here's one example. This was an experiment and they, they cover a full lagoon here with solar panels and, and trying to find, uh, they, they did a temperature model. It's basically um, uh, this kind of a mechanistic model where you can see at the left and uncover irrigation reservoir normally. And uh, you can see the loss by, for evaporation. It was, it was huge in that and heat exchange will be um, two. And versus uh, on the right, uh, in the middle, basically the uh, photovoltaic uh, panel in, in cover, there will be uh, no almost no evaporation and, and a little bit of heat exchange. Um, because of the of the cooling system, but no, probably it's not as significant as uh, with solar radiation for sure. Um, so these these are example of, 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 of uh, physical models that we we will use. This model will be linked together, and then with the temperature profiles and the light profiles, we can simulate uh, phytoplankton production with uh, with other uh, more existing model. This is one example just was published in 2020 in in a reservoir actually here here in Chile. Uh, and they basically use one of the, the hydrodynamic model. They, they also recommended the C, C, CQ model too. Um, and, um, and the output of this uh, model is basically our total uh, chlorophyll. Uh, and here's one example of what we can do with our, the model is basically we have a map of the, uh, the particular areas that we can predict based on percentage of cover of the water body, how much chlorophyll of production uh, we'll have. Am I here? Um, so you can see the, the color scale here, um, the chlorophyll um, values and how change, how you change the cover will change chlorophyll and, and prime producer. And then this, this model also will feed it. The next model will be a soap, uh, soap, soap plankton model. Um, and that and link these two models to see how much actually then will be an, an, on, on food model for fish. I'm gonna use um, a foraging model based on bioenergetics. Um, we created one for Chinook salmon in 2019. And uh, we are gonna try to use that one, um, but there is also others that we can, we can use for different species in different areas. And this is our model. Basically we fed the model with the physical model that we created at, at the beginning 
and the physical model and the primary and secondary production model will also have these uh, inputs and then we can um, predict growth of, of fish based on those conditions. So again, this will be a link of different type of models in order to find an output that would be growth, growth of fish in this case. Uh, there's other simulation models. Again, this is an, another paper, it's just published in 2019. Uh, they, they did it in a pond and they create this model basically based on cover. Again, um, we wanna use a, a similar, similar um, type of model. Um, so um, we think uh, the, there's potential benefit for having these systems. Uh, of course, not everywhere uh, and uh, we are not going to decide when, where are gonna be good places to install these uh, systems. But uh, I think um, with the, the basic idea of cover and, and shade uh, and, and global warming, maybe we can have a positive effect in some, in some cases. We can reduce algae growth. There is a couple of experiments and simulation models that show that the actual, depending on the, how much in cover, and this, this simulation model conducted in Chile, show that less than 40% of cover did not have any effect on algal, algal, algal growth. Of course, that will be uh, based on regions, obviously will be different. Uh, and between 40 and 60% cover has no algal blooms uh, or major economic hydropower losses, but if you have everything covered also, you may have also issues, but this is related to uh, drawdown and desiccation, and that would be um, hard for, for that places. Um, and um, here is um, one last um, photograph. Uh, this is the lake. It's really close where I, I am now. It's in my sabbatical leave, and it's Lake Yankiwe. And uh, uh, I'm happy to answer any question. Thank you, Yvonne. Looking for hands and questions. Do you, do you have trouble keeping the things clean so they can work at greatest efficiency? Could you hear that, Yvonne? The, how was the question uh, again? Uh, the question you have trouble keeping equipment clean uh, so it's operating yes. efficiently. Yes, of course. I think I think this, this technical aspect about uh, uh, falling, for example, that, that may be an issue. Also wildlife uh, visits and birds, stuff like that, also may be an issue too. And this thing that we are gonna try to consider, but probably that will be really difficult to model, but uh, um, may, may be a, a, a way to, to also include this in the operational cost. Um, Very good. Thank you. Yes, one more question. Katie. Uh, how are they managing, how do you Manage wind and a wind storm. So how do you manage wind and uh, wind storms effects? <laughs> yeah, that, that's a, a really good question. And it, it, again, this is one of the um, looking, we can use the experience from, for example, these are, uh, you can see the photo is a salmon farming uh, place in Chile. And, and basically they, 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 this, this uh, structure can, can uh, support a lot of wind and is basically the engineering that the anchor on the bottom is is the key the key aspect and the, the places to, uh, that are more protected and stuff like that. So those are more like uh, again uh, actual places where they are going to install need to be also a consideration about the, the engineering part that will be basically uh, and most uh, mostly uh, affected. One more question, yes, Theo. Um, what you said that with a high implementation, there'd be serious hydropower losses. Is that what the physical constraint of different um, of bringing the, the level of the water down, or what's the cause? What's the reason for that? Oh yes, yes, because the, this reservoir with the, in the, during the dry season they they basically uh, reduce the area. So basically, the, 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 in the case of the this simulation model, most of the panel were in land, it was really difficult structurally uh, having a, a flat place and then need to sh the shape of the reservoir. So that will, the cost will be uh, 
uh, substantial for, for the hydropower, basically. Very good. Thank you, Ivan. Thank you very much. So joining us now is uh, Ed Redberg um, with CD3 Inc. Um, CD3 is one of uh, the, the sponsors uh, this year for OLA. So I'd, I'd like to please uh, give Ed a, a, a warm welcome in that regard. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and thanks so much for having me. I hopefully uh, my voice can clear the room pretty easily. I always kind of hate standing behind podiums, but I'll, I'll do it nonetheless. Let's see. You pointed at the screen. Ah, uh, screen. It's a smart you, screen. You should be able to. You should be able to hear you if you say anything. Okay. Let's see. What am I doing? Uh, <laughs> right. This is good. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, it's Hopefully, you know, thank goodness when it's just pressing the button, it's not easier here. Okay. Well, uh, go through, you know, just a quick overview. I'll go through aquatic invasive species, the problem that we had with COVID. Uh, my background is actually in behavioral science, so I'll talk a little bit about that. I'll talk about site designs uh, that we can make changes for to improve the odds of boaters cleaning, draining, and drying. And then talk about a pilot that we did to add a digital layer to our physical infrastructure. So the big problem with invasive species, um, obviously they have huge environmental impacts, but they have profound and deep economic impacts to the tune of over $100 billion per year uh, to the U.S. economy. So that's a really huge impact. And when we look at the current solutions when it comes to high pressure, high heat contamination stations, it's great to have them, particularly in the west at the borders, to protect against quagga and zebra mussels. But then there's an issue within state uh, where we just don't have the, the dollars to scale that solution to every bowling, right? So we had an additional layer of problem in, in 21, 22. We had an increased number of boaters, um, yet the type of interactions that we usually have with boaters with is that face-to-face -face education, um, you know, that, that just wasn't happening. Right, so we had to look at alternative ways that we could get in front of voters and, and try to be creative. So uh, this is my entire dissertation distilled down to one slide, and it, it essentially is, um, you know, people are told stuff to do, and, and yet we sometimes just don't do it. Right, my doctor tells me to exercise seven days a week. I got a small business, I travel, it doesn't always happen. Um, what I like to ask crowds often because we're all here because we have a passion for the environment and conservation. Um, so we probably bought CFLs back in the day, um, right? Because they are left more energy efficient, uh, but they had a problem with them, right? They're full of mercury. So the question I have is, how many people actually ever recycled a CFL? All right, this room's not bad. We, we got about 50%, which I'll, I'll tell you, that's way higher than any other room that I've ever had. Because what I do is I put them in a gallon, you know, plastic bag, and filled that plastic bag up when it was done and cried a little tear for the earth when I put it in the garbage because the home hazardous waste site is open one day a month from 2 to 3 30, right? And so getting there is a major barrier to action. And what we found was that when we asked voters to clean, drain, and dry their boats, the number one reason well, that people don't do it is the lack of an equipment or a station. Um, this is data from the Canadian Council of Invasive Species, um, but the Western Regional Panel uh, for Aquatic Nuisance Species just came out with a uh, report that they did with Texas A&M, um, which identified that same barrier to behavior, um, the lack of tools. So we tried to overcome that barrier. So we looked at the State Organization for Boating Access, um, which is a group that sets standards for how you design boat access, right? And they have a suggestion for how you do this thing, right? So you have plenty of parking, uh, but then you have signs that you tell people, hey, clean on your way in. All right, there's invasive species here. All right, clean on your way out. But what you really need here is this spot, this pull-off spot. Uh, people in Minnesota are very passive aggressive. And so, you know, if we uh, park our boat and, and uh, our car with our, with our boat on the trailer and we're in the way, people will really look at you sideways and tap their feet a little bit. And that's a big, you know, Minnesota thing for, you know, 
Yeah, have at it, right? Um, now, in other cultures, you know, it, it, that may not be, uh, it may be more aggressive, right? So giving people the space is absolutely critical. Um, so this is a really nice site here that shows these hash marks. It says clean in, clean out here. It has garbage and recycle bins so that you have many reasons to stop because you don't want the garbage flying out, right? You want to put weeds in there. And so we then created a what we call a CD3 system. It's a, it's a smart infrastructure that goes at a boat ramp and it's internet connected. Uh, largely, uh, we sell solar power ones because it's really hard to ditch uh, electricity into many of these sites. And I'm a big data nerd. So I want to show that when we do education and outreach, we can correlate that to upticks in behavior. So each time a user presses a button, pulls a tool out, we're monitoring its, its use so that we can then correlate education with actual behaviors. Uh, we have air blower, uh, tether tools. Your average voter is 55 years and older. So having something like a, a uh, reach tool, um, you'll see me standing in the back because I got a, you know, a bum back and can't, it's hard for me to sit down. So I like having a reach tool um, as well. Vacuum uh, that can have a hundred gallon tank in there. So really all the tools to clean, drain and dry a boat. Um, and we have, Different models, you know, something smaller, uh, akin to uh, we put boats on the side, so something at a, a walk-in site for maybe trout or, or otherwise, um, an even smaller site, uh, and then uh, larger ones. These are actually grid connected, so unlimited use, and then a trailer, which we can use then for education and outreach, and that's a lot of what uh, the trailers end up being used for, or at sites that have changing um, and fluctuations in, in water level. Reason being, we found that. People will not use these if they're greater than 200 feet from the boat ramp. You know, there was a site in Michigan that had washing stations across the street. In a two-year pilot, they had four uses, of which they equated three of those uses to people washing their cars. <laughs> so you talk about you know, inconveniencing people, right? You have to go across the street. So the idea is, you know. People like us often will do all this cleaning at our home, uh, but yeah, it is illegal to move water in many states or any vegetation, certainly, from point A to point B. So we found that if we add signage uh, lines, people really like to follow lines, and people always ask them, well, why did they not the way mind to use the machine? They're 50% more likely to use the machine because we love standing in lines as people, right? You wouldn't go to spend thousands of dollars in Orlando at Disneyland if you didn't like standing in line. And as a parent, I mean, it blows my mind, right? But, but we look at it and we see what is the normative pressure? The normative pressure is what other people are doing. And we like to do what other people are doing. And so if the norm at a site is that you stop it at the station, you clean, drain, and dry your boat, the other people will just stack up in line right behind you, especially if you have arrows and a line running to and a stop bar right there. It's these, you know, I call it my Jedi line tricks, right? Um, so that's kind of what I got my PhD in. And what we find is, is it's absolutely true. Um, so this is uh, after one year of installing uh, station and assignment and lines. Um, this is the second year, and these are violation rates. So having not full your plug, vegetation on the boat itself. Or, or something else, uh, mod, things like that. These are our control sites. So we have about a 20% violation rate without these upgrades to boat ramps. By year two, we're getting a 6% violation rate. Drop in year one, we cut it in half. It's an, about a 10% violation rate. So we're having a huge impact on people's behavior and we're doing so in a way that doesn't feel like big brother, but rather like fun uncle, right? You're supplying people the tools to do what they would like to do, Anyway, uh, because I don't care if you clean, train, and dry your boat because you have a hundred dollar, hundred thousand dollar bass boat that you like to keep nice and sparkly and for the vanity of it all, or if you're doing it for conservation. Because I tell you what, there's about a third of the population in Minnesota, and it's probably less in other places, um, that will, will do it just for conservation. So uh, we started in Minnesota, and uh, we've now gotten into Canada, and this isn't fully updated too, but largely in the beginning, uh, Michigan, New York, Canada, and we're starting to get out uh, to the west and, and south. And, and to be honest with you, in states that I never thought we'd have stations in, no offense if anyone's from Arkansas, but I just never expected there to have that level of interest in, in Arkansas. And that's my, you know, uh, well, 
biases, I guess, right? But so we wanted to increase uh, that or decrease, and increase adoption, decrease violation even more. So there's something called community based social marketing. And the idea of the community based social marketing is if I decide I want to lose weight, right? I'm more likely to actually stick to a, a exercise regime, other things like that, if I tell other people, particularly people that are close to me, because what are they going to do? They're going to hold my feet to the fire. Hey, how's the exercise going? You know, how, you know, things like that. So if we draw a lot from, or at least I do, from uh, health uh, psychology, because that, you know, those people get real money in health and conservation zones, um, as you well know. So first thing, though, is, is we need to overcome those behavioral barriers, um, which we identified as giving people the tools. The second thing we can say is, OK, we can use a social contract. If you take out your phone and sign your name on your phone and say, I will clean, drain, and dry now and in the future when going through something, you're more likely to do it again. And then you're even more likely if that, the fact that you sign a social contract gets pushed out to your friends. So our ultimate goal really is to decrease the spread of aquatic invasive species. So what does it look like? So if you went on your phone to ramseyais.com, you'll see uh, we have created a, a phone first uh, platform that you can choose the type of vessel you have, and it'll walk you through how to clean, drain, and dry your boat with those specific constructions for your specific type of, of boat, right? And then you can sign at the end. Um, we're partnering with a online retailer to give incentives. Um, they'll get free membership uh, to that online retailer. So we're really trying to provide the stick, or excuse me, the carrot, um, knowing darn well that in the future, we could provide this. Uh, so really looking to have um, Specific instructions, you know, whether you have just a, a post here, one of our systems, or, or nothing at all. We can design the education platform to be very site specific to the tools that are available. And again, um, have a lot of uh, pushing uh, folks, even if you don't use one of our systems. These are super important. The stop bars are super important, you know, just trying to keep people up with those key behaviors. Um, so yeah, you can clean in, uh, as well as then you clean out, and like I said, within, I said 200 feet, but it probably should be 150 feet because, you know, we're, we're thinking about other things. Five minutes? All right. Um, so what we found out, with a case study, um, we had 177 web app, uh, app uses with 88 commitments. <laughs> what we found, though, is on a big sign here, we had this tiny little QR code here. Um, and, and there wasn't any education from actual users. So it was entirely based on people having to see the QR code, having to do it. And that's really not ideal. We learned, hey, we need to have a, a more obvious signage. We need to have uh, you know, better uh, language around the check-in, check-out, um, as well as, as that incentive. So um, in the future, we can include unique identifiers uh, so that we can know where people are coming and going. It gets a little bit big brothery, uh, but but in the West, that's more likely to happen than, than in Minnesota. Uh, it's possible that it can be used for violation rates. Uh, this is where I want to start. Again, want to be positive and continue to be positive. Um, and the end results really were, were that people were, were taking action. And one thing I should uh, quickly say before I run out of time, because I forgot to say it, was you might notice, right? Here, we have an American flag on the front. So why do we have that outside of our innate patriotism, right? Uh, well, we have it because people like to shoot. Um, and if you put an American flag on the front of it, on our weekends with BLF, they say this stuff doesn't get shot. We have not had a unit get shot. I mean, you've done all these little behavioral cues, right? So um, the last thing I want to add is there's lots of funding. There's an unprecedented amount of funding right now. Um, particularly in the West, in the uh, in this region, the Army Corps of Engineers will pay for half the system. Um, if you're in the Columbia River Basin, uh, you don't, I mean, you just contact them and they'll cut a check for half of it. You know. uh, there's also a project right now going on uh, with the uh, Department of Interior with the Bureau of Land Management um, and Wildlife Forever. Wildlife Forever is finding sites of interest um, for local communities that would like this. Um, that has some sort of connection to BLM lands or waters. Um, and then in that, it's through the bipartisan infrastructure bill, they'll pay for all. 
So the money is going out there. It's just going to communities who will, will raise the fees in, in this kind of infrastructure. But between the ABC, the bipartisan infrastructure bill, there's just a lot out there right now. So with that, I think I'm probably out of time. So that's my contact information. Um, feel free to reach out, uh, but hopefully I'll have some time for questions. Yeah. Great. So thank you. Here's a question. Man. Yes. Do you have any um, way of people flushing out their motors? Yeah, we really, you know, we're not using any water. And the reason we're not using water is that it creates a liability in many sites. Uh, it's tough to get water. Um, and why we're not using high pressure, high PE contamination is you have to have trained staff. So in an ideal situation, yes, um, we, in our check in, check out, we really walk through draining out motors and making sure you, you know, tip them so that all the water gets out. And really, if someone is going to, you know, the next spot right away, um, they really should get decon, especially if they're on a clog of zebra muscle water, which I know you all don't have much here. So, you know, the bigger concern here is those Asian clams, uh, New Zealand mud snail, and milk water and vegetation, some of the vegetation. Other questions? So when you're gathering the statistics on, you know, how compliant people are in using the system, and we have like a possession violation monitoring, is part of that also any kind of monitoring with like QAQC on whether people are using it in a way that is effective? Yes. So we have um, essentially secret shoppers. Um, so people sitting on a, a park bench looking like they're reading, um, literally, this is what we did. Um, and they launched it and for exactly that for the effectiveness. Um, you know, the, the major things, visible weeds, um, whether or not they pulled uh, plugs, um, whether it be on the back, bilge, you know, drain all the water, vacuum it. So, yeah, absolutely. Other questions? Or we run out of time? I have a question. Yes. Uh, this is an Oregon Lakes Association conference. So, obvious application, not just the lakes, but to Riverine, yes, uh, boat ramps. And, yep. and Absolutely. And, and so, and that was our goal in, in having a, a range of sizes, um, you know, whether it's a, a smaller one where, where people are going in with waders or a larger unit where people are putting boats in. Um, the, the goal really is to, for clean water. Did you connect with Anthony in your search? I did. What's like the average time in time out? So the average user spends three minutes. Um, so what we've done then is knowing that the average user uh, spent three minutes, we created an algorithm uh, to say that, okay, we had, because every time there's a user timestamp, and then when there's a break, we can then identify and estimate the number of distinct users um, that go through for grant writing and reports. It's really interesting to hear all the psychology behind it too. Yeah. Stuff that can be used just for people that are visiting areas too, like just like cleaning up trash or stuff like waterways and stuff like that. So it's just using air to yep. blow things off. Yeah, air to blow things off, vacuum to suck things out. Everything is is all about cleaning, draining, and drying. And if they're blowing stuff off, you know, let's say your zebra mussel or something, if you <laughs> blow it off, does it? Go somewhere, what happens? Yeah, so the, in, in the ideal um, site, it'll be sloped into, uh, you know, catchment. Uh, so, you know, any water or anything else, you'd, you'd want to go into a catchment rather than going right back into the right. water pipe. Thank you, Ed. Thank you. Next speaker is Brian Ben Cothen. And he's uh, representing Eutrophics, also one of the bullet sponsors. So we'd like to acknowledge that before you get started. Thank you. Laser pointer, and then still advance your slides. All right. Thank you, everyone. Well, I'm here to talk about um, mitigation of phosphorus to improve water quality um, with lanthanum and a modified bentonite, a phosphorus mitigation tool. So the uh, impacts of phosphorus, um, many of our waterways across the US, um, phosphorus is that key nutrient that can limit uh, production or is co-limiting. And as this increases in waterways, that helps increase the trophic state productivity 
And toxin producing cyanobacteria that close down lakes can, can dominate when that phosphorus is more available. And mitigating phosphorus in water bodies has been done for decades and can be used to improve water quality. So lanthanum modified bentonite is a phosphorus binding tool. Um, it's a manufactured clay that's embedded with lanthanum. And this has a high specificity for binding that free form of phosphorus, that orthophosphate, and it creates a highly stable and strong bond uh, that produces a stable mineral. It binds initially as rhabdophane and then through time tightens down even stronger uh, to make monazite, and essentially a, a rock-like mineral. And uh, its application, it doesn't impact water chemistry like some other uh, phosphorus binding uh, compounds out there. And the binding it has is really reliable across a wide range of water chemistries. And we can get into some higher pHs uh, where things like aluminum uh, won't work. And it won't release that bound phosphorus under natural conditions that we see in our lakes. You know, pH is a pH range of 4 to 11, um, oxic and anoxic conditions. So a product like this is applied as a slurry um, into a water body. It settles and integrates into the water body sediments um, to bind, and binds that phosphorus. It has a favorable um, ecotox profile. It's very well studied and there's good um, environmental reviews on this technology and uh, safer than alum in, in some applications and highly researched and used worldwide. And it's great for targeting that internal loading of phosphorus um, in a lake and there's uh, two commercial formulations available, uh, one Utrasorb G and the other Phoslock. And because this is kind of a really reliable tool, um, especially with dosing uh, for 5% lanthanum, it's 100 pounds of material for one pound of phosphorus or for Utrasorb G, it's 50 pounds of material for one pound of phosphorus. Um, so we can utilize this in an adaptive approach where um, we get initial assessment and plan for, for a project, um, generate a prescription based on how much phosphorus is there, do some initial implementation, and then see the results um, with, with monitoring, see the results of what that initial implementation is, and then finalize and kind of optimize your strategies and dosing from there to um, improve your water quality in a faster manner. And so I'll, I'll discuss uh, two projects where we use that tool and also some adaptive management approaches to improve water quality. The first one is uh, Lady Bird Lake in Texas. This is a 415 acre reservoir. Um, it's part of the Highland Lakes complex on the Colorado River that runs through Texas. It's a very large river system there. Um, and this reservoir um, flows a lot in the off in you know, kind of the winter and spring, but uh, slows down in the summer. And it runs right through the heart of Austin and has lots of parks and greenbelt around this lake, thousands of daily users walking around the park um, and also going out in the lake and paddle boarding. In July of 2019, they had a, a huge um, benthic cyanobacteria event. Um, all these blooms were forming in, in around some of these parks. They had five dogs die within like a week and it shut down a couple of these parks and had a huge um, outcry, outcry from the community and response required from the city for monitoring and communication. They found that dihydroanotoxins uh, from benthic cyanobacteria were the cause of those dog deaths. And um, in looking at this system, the watershed is very large. Um, they do have a watershed protection program and they're actively working on improving the watershed, but they needed to do something more immediate to deal with these blooms that were starting to, to pop up. And so in like some of these nutrient rich uh, substrates that resulted from some previous flooding, um, were likely an environmental factor to those benthic growths. Uh, gross. And so they um, started with an in-lake kind of adaptive management program to address that sediment phosphorus is <clears throat> one of the key ways to deal with this because they didn't want to utilize um, algicides in this community. And so we started out a program around one of the, the worst hit parks with the benthic cyanobacteria, Redbud Isle Park. It's about 20 acres of um, water body around this park that we targeted and we put down 120,000 pounds of the lanthan modified bentonite um, over three apps in, in 2021. We also did more this year um, and we used a large uh, barge from one of the local local barge companies to get that out in around uh, the shoreline and areas around the park. 
And so what we did was um, before we actually did the applications, we captured uh, sediment samples to do fractionation to see what phosphorus was actually bound to beforehand and um, what we needed to do for dosing and captured then at the end of the season to show what uh, the phosphorus actually changed. So we had a 77% reduction in the reductant soluble and labile phosphorus, which is the most mobile. And we would expect that to shift from a mobile to a non-mobile form tied to that um, length and modified bentonite. So about 100 milligram of P per kilogram shift to that appetite and residual form, which is really tightly bound and not going to release. But most importantly, what that means visually and for the water quality of the system is we had these shifts from these giant globs and spires of cyanobacteria growing in the substrates, mm -hmm. shifting to some nice, good, you know, just um, LG coated substrates, uh, much lower levels, and also a great establishment of Kara and macrophytes in these areas. Um, the benthic mats that were there before really reduced in occurrence. They had to really search for any that were there. And um, the toxins that they were finding in these mats um, were reduced in their concentration. So instead of 100 milligrams per kilogram of toxins, they're going down to kind of the single digits. And we've seen two years of that. And no dogs died. So part of this, but then also the communication and monitoring they were doing. So kind of adaptively, what we've done is we've had great support from the stakeholders um, with this program and the results we've had. We were finishing some of the sediment dosing up at that Redbud Isle site, and we've expanded the program to a new stretch of shoreline uh, lower in the reservoir to um, increase the impact we're having out there. And we're continuing to monitor getting sediment cores, um, going and monitoring the toxins, and actually they're doing a collaboration where they're actually getting genetics and trying to figure out why they're getting the toxicity uh, from these cyanobacteria as well. And looking at other improvement uh, projects in the watershed and in the water body to improve water quality. The second project is one we're working a little bit closer here in Kitsap. It's uh, Kitsap Lake in Washington. This is a 246 acre lake, average depth of 18 feet, has a mixed uh, forest and developed watershed. Most of the forest is on that southwest side and a little bit of development on that northeast side. Um, the city does have some storm drains that come into the lake and that's most of what the watershed Im um, impacts of nutrients would be from. Uh, but um, from previous studies on this lake, the internal uh, loading of phosphorus was really the primary source to their harmful algae blooms that they've been having for the past uh, decade or so. So they've been dealing with this problem for a while. So the city was gonna upgrade the storm drains. And also we had a phosphorus mitigation plan put in place, um, focusing on the phosphorus in the lake. And then we also got a monitoring program at the city and the funding aligned with an adaptive management approach. And so the initial samples of sediment out here helped us quantify the amount of phosphorus that, if that was in that anoxic zone of the lake. And looking at the difference, uh, looking at the sediment depths, um, you know, it could be around 1,600 to 4,000 pounds of phosphorus that could be mobile in this, in this lake and, and cycling. And here's just some DO and temp profiles that we got from uh, 2021, just to highlight, you know, the anoxia that they get. And um, as the lake warms uh, down uh, to the sediment and cycling some of that phosphorus, they get a, a late summer turnover in uh, middle of August or early September, where the lake becomes more isothermal as well. So with our applications, we were targeting that zone that can get anoxic, uh, 20 foot and greater. and um, targeted ap uh, applications in June, kind of over that larger area. And then as some phosphorus would build up in that hypolimnetic zone, um, hit that deep area, that 23 foot and greater and with our August applications over. And so over the two years, we've applied a similar, similar amount, about 120,000 pounds of that length of modified bentonite and mitigated uh, quite a bit of the phosphorus that's needed to work in this lake. And what the results have been is um, 2020, the first year of the program is in green, and then 2021, the second year is in blue. Uh, so that first year, uh, we didn't get started mm -hmm. until, until June. So we started to knock the phosphorus down and, and get working on that. But we really saw the impact in that second year of the program once we had more 
more dose um, into that sediment. And so the bottom water, that hypolimnetic uh, phosphorus concentrations uh, were much lower. And then also the surface water uh, phosphorus was much lower, you know, going from 50 um, micrograms per liter of phosphorus down to 17. And what that means visually for the community and the water quality of that lake is that the Secchi disc um, went up three to four X. So instead of being three, three to four feet, it was getting to about you know, 11 to 15 feet for water clarity. And the blooms, the, you know, the really bad blooms that they were having in the past um, have gone to the wayside. Um, these, these were two photos uh, just two years apart before the program and, and during. And kind of going forward, for, going forward from there, we did, you know, did do more applications uh, this year on the lighter side. We're getting uh, great support from the community. We're continuing to, to monitor finishing that sediment dosing. And because we improved the water clarity, um, there is more macrophytes growing, which is great ecologically. Um, so they're just doing some harvesting to clear, uh, clear out some um, key areas and shifting that funding from the city uh, to a lake management district as the lake gets, gets more manageable for them. So in summary, uh, lanthan modified bentonite is a safe and effective phosphorus mitigation tool you can improve water quality with. Um, these projects will continue um, to meet the stakeholders' goals utilizing an adaptive management program, which you can implement. And yeah, my contact information is down below and glad to take any questions. Yes, um, the difference between this and the and the cross lock is it the binding to the bentonite? You just or G, that second product? No, the, the cross lock. Um, so Utrepix is our company right. name, yeah. But it's oh okay, so it is cross lock material. We were using in those uh, projects, we were using Foslock, which is a 5% lanthanum. Um, they will be shifting to a 10% lanthanum formulation called Utrasorb G moving forward, which helps with the cost and application efficiency. Is that your modification from Foslock? No, from us. Yeah. Yep. Is there any? Is it? Okay, thanks. Um, I'm curious, so the, is the expectation for these two systems that you'll be continuing to apply this? Annually, is there a point in which is, are, are both of these closed systems where they continue to have phosphorus coming in? Sorry, I just, I they do. Um, Kitsap Lake, not so much. It's a smaller watershed. So, what we're doing now, we're going to get to a point where we've got it taken care of, and it may be you know, every five or 10 years that they might need to come back and do a dose. Um, the Ladybird Lake system, that's much more open. Um, and that's where a more maintenance dose might be needed, but the amount of, you know, the value of that system is very high. So the maintenance cost is pretty low in that scenario. Okay. And, uh, Theo, I think was next, and then uh, <coughs> I have a lot of questions. Okay, Tammy. Uh, I was just wondering, what's the biggest system? Oh, I have two questions. Mm -hmm. What's the biggest system? The biggest system, um, well, you can see those lakes are pretty similar, um, probably just, you know, a couple hundred acres, but um, it's pretty scalable. You know, you can do lakes that are thousands of acres. You just spend a little bit more time or use bigger boats and equipment. Okay. But that probably leads to my second question. How did you ever mention the further area of the cost? So, Yes, per area cost, it all depends on how big your issue is. So I guess a better way to address that is what's your cost, you know, what's your cost per pound of phosphorus you need to mitigate in the system. And usually that's somewhere around that $200 uh, per pound of phosphorus range for managing phosphorus with these technologies. You mentioned what the, for example, the um, what that weight, like what was Yeah, at that at that point they were, you know, about 250, 300 grand into that that program at that point with the dosing. So do you have uh, just like you know heat of 
sediment that's built up over time mm -hmm. and just lays on top. Does that absorb just what's on the top few inches or how does that? Well, normally with your lake sediments, only the top, you know, four to 10 centimeters mm -hmm. is active and, and cycling with the lake. So you're targeting a certain sediment depth. You may have, you know, feet and feet of muck or, or mud, but um, usually those top layers are the ones that are interacting with the lake. Do you, do you, uh, I just had a question about the cost that Penny asked, and um, uh, so I was wondering if Safe and Kitsap, or, or you, you mentioned that uh, the Austin application is very high value that the Kitsap used. Mm -hmm. So um, you'd want to know uh, what the cost is, and you'd want to know what the, the um, you know, loss cost of usage of tourism or or yeah, yeah. When those those parks were closed, yeah, I mean, people stopped going. They, you know, people weren't taking their dogs anywhere around this lake. Um, so it's really helped get people back to the lake, knowing that their risk of exposure is lessened to you know a very good degree, and also they're more well educated on what to look for. But um, yeah, any sort of you know park system that has daily entry fees, you know, you can get parks that have thousand, you know, if you get hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars in revenue, you know, doing projects like this definitely has a economic benefit. Very good. Thank you so much. Finally, I've come away with a tip today as I introduce my colleague from VEQ. Uh, I I work across all of Eastern Oregon, so I think I'm going to start wearing a a, a t-shirt with an American flag. <laughs> <laughs> Dan Sabota from our uh, laboratory and, and uh, headquarters. Yeah. Headquarters. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, I have the penultimate talk for the conference currently, so thanks for for having me. Um, so today, uh, what I'm going to talk about is I'm going to describe this new web-based application that will be developed to visualize satellite imagery for cyanobacteria across Oregon. Give a little bit of background information, a lot of which you probably already know, I'll speak through that, but then I want to give a demonstration of the app. We can kind of go through that and, and play with some of the interactive tools that are on, on the, uh, the application. So uh, thanks. And I also want to definitely acknowledge my co-authors here. Uh, I think Yuan's on the call. She's been the, uh, the heavyweight in developing the, the background for this app. And she can answer a lot of the technical questions about the coding and whatnot. But also Aaron and, uh, and Ratna have been instrumental in developing this, uh, this tool as well. So that one, right? Yes. There we go. Okay. So I um, I always include background slides. I know a lot of a lot of this has already been covered, um, but I do want to talk just a little bit about terminology. And one of the things that I've come into as I worked on cyanobacteria over the past several years is the number, the number of terms, the number of acronyms that get thrown around with related to cyanobacteria. And so it seems to be always changing. Um, I've started to adopt the, the language uh, that the ITRC, the Interstate Technology, Technology and Regulatory Council, um, has been uh, using for their, their um, materials. Uh, so I'm using HCBs, harmful cyanobacteria blooms. But for the purpose of this talk and purpose of comparisons, it's the same thing as have or sign or have. Uh, in the context of, of talking about um, cyanobacteria blooms. Um, we know it's capable of producing toxins, degrading ecosystem conditions. We've heard a lot about that already. And we know that uh, there's been some, several high profile cases within Oregon over the past several years, most famous of which is the Salem drinking water crisis that happened in 2018, but also uh, deaths associated with cattle in Eastern Oregon. There's been a series of dog related uh, deaths over the years and, and uh, other uh, things with, with Ross Island Lagoon and, and whatnot. Um, in Oregon, we, we definitely do have guidelines for recreational use uh, exposure to toxins, as well as drinking level, uh, level um, levels that have uh, drinking uh, stand, water standards that have been developed over the years that we implement and use for issuing advisories uh, for recreational contact or uh, do not drink orders. Um, and I, I use the 2018, uh, the Salem drinking water crisis is kind of like a watershed moment for how Oregon has been doing the sign habs. Uh, or, or HCVs. Um, so prior to 2018, and, and to some extent still, we, it's largely been reactive. We, we rely on local reporting and we react, we go out and sample, issue advisories. 
Uh, we did have some TMDLs, uh, total maximum daily loads that had been developed for harmful algal blooms across the state. Um, maybe Ten Mile Lake, for example, there was one developed there. Uh, since 2018, however, um, there have been some new rules that put in place for drinking water sampling uh, in, in systems that are deemed susceptible to cyanohams or, or HCVs. See, I'm switching back and forth between them now. <laughs> um, as well as uh, implementation, of, uh, implementation of some other technologies. Uh, we're doing some genetic sampling to use uh, qPCR as a way to detect genes that are capable of producing cyanotoxins, as well as what I'm going to focus on today is looking at satellite imagery as, as a way to uh, give an indication of uh, blooms that are potentially occurring. Um, here, I just wanted to highlight, you know, we have since 20, uh, 2004 uh, through 2021, we've, we had 60 water bodies and about over 200 advisories that had uh, recreationally that have been issued across the state. Uh, there have actually um, several of the past, uh, some of that are not included in this figure, but you can see it is a, it does, it is a statewide problem um, in terms of um, cyanobacteria blooms and, and cyanotoxins. Um, you might ask, well, why use satellite imagery? Well, part of it, it large part of it is due to the cost. A lot of the, the field sampling, uh, either um, the staff time, the uh, analyses can be can, can, uh, can rack up pretty quickly in terms of costs. And so satellite imagery allows for a fast way to uh, help screen for potential uh, blooms. Um, and that could help improve both the efficiency of and efficacy of field sampling. And uh, ultimately, what I'm most interested in is understanding some of the factors that may be contributing to blooms um, across the state. Um, so with, uh, within uh, DEQ, we've had a project going on for the past several years, um, mainly focused on trying to figure out if we can use satellite imagery to identify and monitor blooms. Um, we're in the process of developing an early warning system using maybe some time series analyses to help us uh, um, detect when blooms are, are um, imminent within water bodies. Um, and then also ultimately, again, uh, hoping to identify some factors, whether it's landscape factors or more detailed studies some lake level factors that could be contributing to blooms. Um, we're making use of, of, a, of a project that was um, instituted by the US EPA, Cyan, uh, provided the link here. And I believe this presentation will be available online afterwards. So the link should be able to, you should be able to acquire the link. But essentially um, we're using the Sentinel-3 satellites, um, pretty high frequency in terms of a one to two day return interval. Uh, but pretty coarse in scale, so that that restricts our ability to detect those to larger lakes across the state. So, 49 water bodies we can detect using this uh, this imagery and these algorithms. Um, we do know that from studies that it's a pretty good correlation with advisories, but we we had some questions about how well it could actually be used to detect blooms um, compared to, to field measurements, which I'll get to in just a bit. So here, so for example. Um, here's some imagery from Odell Lake um, in the Central Cascades. Uh, most years, except for the past two years, uh, there have been some pretty prominent uh, cyanobacteria blooms that occur usually in July. And so this is imagery that was captured in 2020 of a bloom that developed uh, from you know, the 18th and then essentially disappeared by the, uh, the 2nd of August, which is pretty typical how the blooms occur in Odell. Um, but if you compare that with some field data, we have uh, SON instrumented in Odell for the past three years uh, during the, the growing season. You can see the satellite data um, and the field measurements seem to correspond pretty well with in terms of a measure of uh, cyanobacteria abundance. Satellite data, we have an algorithm that generates cells per milliliter. Uh, and here, this is phycocyanin um, values. And it even, it, it also replicates in year 20, uh, 2021 where there was not a bloom within uh, Odell. So we're starting to gain confidence that we can use the satellite data pretty reliably. Uh, to detect blooms, at least in the larger water bodies. Um, and so now I wanted to switch to the web to kind of work through the app that we've developed using uh, Cyan and then show the, uh, the tool. This is live now, so anyone can just look at it. Okay. Yeah, so great. Right. So just give it a second. I'm gonna the only the only hiccup that we run into is sometimes it can be a little bit slow in the bar shining. So give it a second to refresh. There it goes. 
second panel to get a view of it. So again, um, this is live now. We um, we pull from NASA and uh, update this um, every week. And we do have a listserv that we have operate, uh, operating that um, you're welcome to contact us. We have a contact list on the, uh, the website um, that you can send out. We basically just send an email saying it's been updated for the week. So, so you're able to go look at it. So is it on a certain day that you do it? We usually do it Mondays. It's going to be easy there. It's an easy first, uh, first of the week thing to do. We could do it more frequently. We just put it on um, so this is an overview of the app. Uh, we have three main parts. So the first part is just an introduction where we provide some information about where we acquire the data, as well as you know the caveats associated with it. So provisional data, this is regular for regulatory purposes. Uh, and we have other links, especially the Oregon Health Authority, and we also link to Sentinel Hub, which is described actually earlier today by Frank Law. Uh, you can also use that to visually explore uh, Google links as well. Um, so moving down, we have a period here where for the previous seven days, um, we calculate a seven-day average daily maximum value for cell estimates per water body to, to get a sense of uh, there's a bloom potentially occurring in the previous week. And we provide a list here. And so for the past week, it was like there's been 14 here in Upper Plains Lake, which has been blooming for a while. And showing up as having the maximum values. And, and we have an overview map here, which will highlight the water bodies that have above 100,000 cells, which is a guideline for use in the World Health Organization, indicative of total bloom in a particular of a, of a higher magnitude. And so you can scroll through the list here. Um, and then, which is coming from more of interest. So this gives a nice overview here. I watched the, the map scroll. But, but below, you can zoom in to individual water bodies. So let's go back up for a second to the book. Um, let's go to Dr. Zyman. It's actually been kind of uh, it's been really late. We actually just grabbed a sample for a sign of there. I haven't seen what the result is yet. But uh, so we can zoom into the diamond lake with just a second to go here. And so what we provide is the uh, images from the previous seven days to give an estimate of where the you know, sun of bacteria bottom is. So it's coded this according to low moderate and high. Again, these are guidelines from uh, uh, the uh, World Health Organization. Uh, the 630, that's the lower reaction, but essentially zero, I guess you can say. But we can also look at, um, so we can pull the images, and then we can also look at time series plots. And we, by default, will plot the, the current year, and we plot both the maximum and mean. You're also able to uh, plot the minimum if you, if you want to choose to do so. Um, but what's also cool is we have data back going to 2016 uh, for based on the Sentinel data. So if we click there, you can get a sense of uh, uh, interannual patterns. Of blooms as well, get a, get a sense um, how the blooms are occurring. Um, and we also provide all these uh, the summary statistics. These are these data are available to to download uh, from the website as well. So again, this is updated. We uh, there's some other tools too, so we can go to a lot of scale. The y-axis to make a little bit more visible to 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 the view. So um, yeah, so it's uh, that's the overview of the app and. Um, Feel free to look at it and talk to it. We're, we're actually, there's a lot of add there's obviously a lot of add ons and add on functionality that we want to add to this. Um, one idea that we had is maybe trying to merge this into the uh, Atlas of Oregon Lakes, or the Atlas of Oregon Lakes to some extent to help add, pull that information in, as well as some more recent data on the side of bacteria. Um, but uh, currently, this is live and hopefully it's going to be useful. Most of them. I guess should, the last thing I'll mention is within GEQ itself, we're going to start using some of the satellite data next year to help maybe coordinate sampling by our laboratory and basin coordinators throughout the state for areas that seem to be an influence in the water basin. Well, I'd be happy to answer questions or we can take a look more into the, the app that folks want to look at. <laughs> Yeah, so, um, so if you're pulling this from, I assume that it's calibrated.
operated based on a large set of like mass yeah. right? So I have two questions. So the first one is have you made any attempts to sort of ground truth it to the like actually kind of randomly selected more local like that was one question. Yeah. And then the second question is if you're getting this highly quantitative data in cells per milliliter, do you have a sense for what portion of the water column Okay, so I'll answer that last one first. It's, it's the upper portion, it's like the upper meter of the water column. So you're not, you're not, you're not getting depth with these the symmetry. So it's the, it's the surface blooms. So that 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 can be an issue with deeper blooms for sure, and where blooms originate. Um, for the first part of your question, in terms of correlating that with on the ground measures, I showed a little bit of that with Odell, uh, but we do have we have had studies in the upper Deschutes, and I showed we do have additional data on the uh, watershed to do some of the correlations. And what we found is um, one of the issues that we have is we have high frequency data, but it's at one point. And so lining the cell up that, we're, that we draw from the satellite to that point has been a little problematic because the cells kind of jump around a little bit. In general, it's pretty good. Uh, it varies a little bit by year, which I haven't quite figured out the, the, why the correlation has changed by year. But, but uh, within Odell, it's, it's pretty good. There's other water bodies and I think it's mainly this connect between the sampling location and the summary statistics for the lake, why it's not correlating as well. Because um, we, I, again, ideally you'd want to take a set, an individual cell and correlate that to the location of where you're in water. And provide a little more problematic to expect. But with in Odell, it's actually pretty good. We're getting R square of like 0. 0.6, 0. 0.7 in terms of correlation. Yeah, yeah. In terms of phycocyanin versus cells from the Tammy's past uh, colleagues from Upper Tennis Lake have been pumping out some weekly, yeah, weekly reports from about eight sites on Upper Tennis. So um, you want to do that for Upper Tennis, then that would be fantastic. You could go back a long way. Oh, yeah. and, and actually, there are, there's MDT, there's, it goes up and down all around the lake. Yeah, well, we have um, actually. I should mention, there's also, we haven't done this yet, mainly because it's in its time constraints. We have a list, a long list of things to do, but we can actually use MODIS data from 2000 to 2012 to yes. also make these yes. estimates. We have a gap in between the Sentinel 3 yes. and MODIS, but we can get a longer time series. Eventually. I was going to ask how uh, have you talked with the guys from K1 and oh, the Sandra. Oh, oh, no, from San Francisco. Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, we talked to them. Yeah. Okay, because yeah. they, they have got that. And you can, yeah. they, they also cover up time. Yeah, no, yeah, we, we've been and, talking to them about, yeah, right. they're, they're on the list for our distribution. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so they, yeah. they, they we're interested in suiting them too. But that's, yeah, this is very nice about. being able to get the graphs from the, you know, pilot, and they were able to do that. So, yeah, yeah, they can get you the might, type you might series as well. There, which is, if they've got extra features, because they've been doing it for a few Oh, sure, yeah, no, they have a really slick app as well, which is kind of nice. So, yeah. Yeah. We're trying to make things. The time series is actually a little bit different than what other ones I've seen, which is pretty much also interesting with the cyclic nature of these lakes. Because then there's also the ability to classify well, how regular are these lakes blooming? Is there a nomadic one, or is it more so, you know, is it time like Odell, at least what's historically, like third week of July, and we need to blow Except this year, which is blooming in late September, which is weird. Um, I'm sorry, just, but are we able to download this data? Um, you can download the summary statistic data, and if you contact us, we can probably provide you the raw data. This is all public data, so oh, it's, yeah. it's, it's satellite-derived information. It's cost us to NASA. It deals with a lot of the issues with atmospheric scattering, uh, winds, things like that. There are still some issues. Like, I wouldn't be as well. I'm not as confident in the shoulder season or winter because of the sun angle and potential interferences with ice. And clouds are always an issue, and smoke to some extent as well. But, uh, yeah, so, but the data are, are there. Right. That's a really good question. So, so these are cyanobacteria abundance plots. We're actually working with the USGS right now, we're working with uh, Kirk and uh, back in uh, Reston, where they're actually looking for hyperspectral imagery um, using the, the DSIS satellite, the DSIS uh, normal National Space Station, um, and trying to correlate that with hyperspectral signals between specific species. Um, well, 
in terms of what the well yeah. like when I asked about whether it correlates with the state thing. Oh yeah. Then I would have thought, well like in that speech down the end that you're here as well. Like yeah. you were saying that this is you know better one year or the other. Well it, some of these lakes are pretty consistent. Like Odell is the oldest part of the species in general. That's so but but like upper time like yeah. So the the, the, spe the spectral shape tree. You know, we have self a milliliter, but I would put more at the low, moderate, high. I wouldn't use the specific cell values and specifically it'd be more like kind of a class even. So right. it's a little higher. Yeah, oh yeah. And, and that, <laughs> that's that's what we've arrived at as it's well. The cell for mill thing is exactly well, yeah, and then that that is I mean if you look at the if you look at the actual uh peer review publications and look at the calibration plots, it's great when it's low, great when it's high, and it's like big and then certain in the middle. And so I'm confident, I'm extremely confident in low and high. The moderate one gets a little bit trickier, but we care about whether there's a lot of bacteria, so it's, it's also part of it. One more question. So, what, uh, what's your cell size and what's the small one line that you can? Okay, that, yeah, it's not, so I mentioned this earlier. So, the cell size for the uh, Sentinel 3 is 300, uh, approximately 300 by 300 meter pixels. You have to have three. Continuous 300 by 300 meter pixels that isn't touching the shoreline in order for it to be uh, have the, the algorithm be applied. So we're talking about a kilometer squared surface area in terms of water bodies. So in Oregon, that equates to we think about 49 water bodies. Um, there are obviously surface area can be larger, but digital patterns and reservoirs and whatnot can be a little bit. We have actually looked at water bodies that don't qualify, and there are some. There is some degree of, of a correspondence. Like I think last year, for example, like Joe left, but in the Green Lakes Basin, for example, there was a point that occurred. And that was picked up on some of the satellite imagery that occurred later. So we, we have been using that for exploratory purposes, just with the, the caveat saying this isn't meeting the exact um, uh, uh, conditions for the algorithm to be applied. But we're also looking, we've been working a little bit with EPA, and they've been developing some new algorithms using the Sentinel 2 data, which is you know, it's like 30 by 30 meter pixels, but the time frequency is much less. It's more of a little bit of 10 days. Yeah. 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 I think I think we better get started, huh? Yeah. Okay. So business meeting. So um, I don't think we need to um, describe the activities because everybody's perfectly aware of them, maybe. Um, let's see. Oh, you aren't, Ivan. So, yeah, we will I have to advance here now. Okay. Oh, first we want to thank our sponsors, Jim and the Nespers we have. We've, we've, we've had CD3 here in Zion and Eutropics, and these are other sponsors, including Portland General Electric, that, that uh, Laurie organized for us. Thanks, Laurie. Um, yeah, so it's been been really good. Um, next slide. So what have we done this year? We've um, you've heard about activities to establish a scholarship fund, and Katie, gosh, I thought she was here just a minute ago. Yeah. So she's the recipient. I think everybody's perhaps got to know with know her because she's a a um, Social butterfly, <laughs> it was easy to talk with. So that's nice. And um, so we had a nice, we've had donations, various donations through the, the year. And um, thanks to those who donated the the um, raffle items, I think yours was the highest value. Yeah, thank you. It was, it was a, you weren't here for last night. Yeah. Yeah, it's just like <laughs> <laughs> pretty, pretty soon. Do it. Do we get a tip? And then he was about to say, Oh, the Ether has got this one little house in Corvallis, and gee, what do people want to do? Asian's been in the summer of 2023. So then we've, we've been, I mean, look at how small a group we are. But, have really had quite an impact over the last few years. Um, the state people, the some legislators know us now. It's kind of interesting. So it all got started with the um, uh, cyano uh, stakeholder meetings. 
with, there was one time. Um, actually, Ivan, your um, the postdoc who was working with you at the time, remind me of her name. Who who was? Um, Gwen. Gwen Beery. Gwen. 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 Uh, Gwen, and, and you're working with Chrissy, she was involved, and then Richard Litz, who, who was, was here. Uh, there was a really nice discussion about, you know, we were just talking about, about cyanobis, and they've got things to do. We've got to get some changes. This, the state's not able to do enough. And it sort of got things kicked off. We remember we had Ken Helm, the representative, come to the joint Walton meeting, which must have been 2018, I think, perhaps. And uh, yeah, so so we've since then we've seen quite a bit of money go, particularly to DEQ, and DEQ now has has quite a bit of expertise in cyanos. You heard about that from Dan. Um, so that's been good. We haven't continued to do very much on that, um, except that for the for the stakeholder meeting this year, which we're continuing to to host. I can do that through OSU. Um, uh, Dan and Lara helped. Hi, Lara, are you there? She's not. Oh, too bad. So, so our departing uh, um, <coughs> board member helped to um, expand the program so that we had more of a research report. We had that very ad hoc in previous years, but we had an afternoon now that expanded that. And that, that went well then, didn't it? So we'll, we should do that again. Yeah. So we'll continue your presence there. But um, uh, where we've done a lot of work, really is with Lake Avon. And of course, Ron, uh, you know how passionate he is about it, very knowledgeable. His book should be coming out this year. I think we, we ought to have a discussion of how we can uh, support um, getting that sort of publicized and spread around. Um, and so he's a real expert. <clears throat> and uh, Joe, uh, who talked about the, the gas uh, bubble bubbles, you know, they were the two who brought that issue to OLA. And again, quite a few years ago, and now we're really doing a lot. Trish um, has been uh, the chair of that Lake Avon committee and uh, since she went off the board. And she's been, been very active. I've done a lot. Um, uh, Amy Simpson is, is a person who was working for DEQ some time ago. She was featured in that Oregonian article in January as having been an employee of DEQ who was working on um, a water model, a hydrology model for the Chi Volcan for the, the Lake Ape. Oh, and, and of course, Tammy. Um, so we've had a bunch of people working on this. And, uh, but, but Amy is, um, uh, uh, was working on that and, and was told to stop working. And this was some years ago. And the whole issue was that, you know, Ron's had a drone go up south of Lake Ape. Here's a picture. There's this green irrigated circle. Here's this river's end reservoir full of water. And here's this vast Lake Avon, all salt, uh, alkaline, dry, terrible, um, you know, circumstance. And should be very bad. You know, anybody who's, who knows anything about publicity reckons that's, that should be the worst sort of um, um, thing for an agriculturalist to, to have publicised. Um, so... There's a real crisis there, and we've, you, you've heard the board has heard about um, the meetings that Trish and I and Connie had initially with a couple, two couples from the Chi uh, um, um Watershed Collaborative, they're, they're residents of the Chi Volcan who reached out to conservation groups. And really, it was OLA, it was that meeting in Bend in May that got things going. And now we've got government support. The uh, ODFW came up with support for Oregon Collaborative, which is a group of mediators from the PSU, to support what's called a um, position, um, cause, what's it called? Uh, I've forgotten the name. It's, it's, it's uh, hey, what's it called? Declaration? No. Declaration? No. <laughs> anyway, it's it's a series of there, there are going to be about thirty interviews with key people to establish whether this issue and these people who would be involved in the discussion <clears throat> with the, for us the ultimate goal is to get water into into Lake Avon whether this issue and this group of people are ready to um, to engage 
in a positive way with the expectation you could get some positive outcome. Situation assessment, situation assessment. So the government's put money into that. Ken Helm's still involved because he's the chair of a, the, the Agriculture and Water um, Subcommittee, House Committee. Um, so we, we, we'll continue to have a participation in that. And, you know, Tammy knows that it's, this is all taking a fair bit of time, but, but I think it's for a good cause. Um, we produced the Lakewise newsletter and uh, Lara and Dan, Dan wrote an article the last time. Lara was the guest editor last time. I'd like somebody to think of for the next December to be the guest editor for December. That would be very helpful. Uh, and Mark, thank you very much for your push to get that dang <laughs> website going and, and financial and help. And Linda has been really, really key. <laughs> Uh, it's been quite complicated. They, we got a very nice price here, but we were asked to do all of the registration and arrange all the rooms. And it meant that the, the um, website registration was pretty complex for us to put together and, and we couldn't have done it without them. And then Tony, uh, Dan and Tony have been helping with the website. Dan was on oh, his Alaska trip. So Tony was the one who did most, most of it recently. So very grateful for that. Yeah, I think before we get too far away from Lake Kinder, there's two other things that are dynamics that may have been a result of all this engagement. One was um, you mentioned you met with uh, Representative Helm in 2018, and it's right about then that the legislature created the Water Subcommittee, so both Senate and House. And Ken Helm now is on that committee, but a specific committee focused on water. That's real progress. Yeah. And then um, just recently, uh, I heard, and you see if it happens, that um, Mark Owen, state representative from Burns, who's very engaged with Lake Haber, um, may be introducing a, a bill this next session that will say um, no more water right issuance unless we can prove water is available. That would be a sea change in Oregon. Mark is doing that? And it could happen this, okay. this next year. Yeah. So they did say there was going to be a water committee. There's not a water subcommittee. It's, it's, it's environment and agriculture and water. But still, yeah, point is important that it really elevated the, the importance of water. Yeah. And um, so these activities, we, we talked about this discussion with the Chewalkanites. Uh, that has been sort of supported by a person in Mark Owens's office who's acted so far as the um, mediator and Harmony Burrell. And she's done a very nice job of that. And so, so it speaks to the, it's kind of important to the legislature to see some positive moves in, a, um, it, it's bipartisan and maybe for, maybe it's to, for a democratic administration to see some good things happening in a, in a, Republican sort of area, maybe I'm, I'm not really sure of the motivation, but they were they were all very happy to see that it looked like we can have a productive discussion. So, and then finally, we had the subtle lake lake appreciation outing that that uh, Randy organised with with a bit of help from from Desiree for the for the open swim, and that was really really nice. So, thanks for that, Randy. Yeah, so we've done a fair bit of things, fair number of things. Um, so this just shows with Lake Ava, it should be like this, very fecund, uh, strong support for, for mobs of birds. And uh, when it's wet, like in this, this year at the left, 2018, it can do that, but it cannot when it's all just an alkali player, which unfortunately it is now. Uh, so we'll hear from Andy uh, about the budget. Well, for the next hour or two, I'm going to talk about first. <laughs> <laughs> first of all, about the scholarship uh, raising last night. So, you know, we raised over $1,700, which is great. I mean, that covers our scholarship for next year, basically, which is a nice thing to cover. And so, um, thank you all who brought things in or bid, or, you know, and I'll, I'll be sending out um, responses to everyone on that when we connected. But that was really a nice fundraiser. Um, these numbers are always in motion. So what looks good, don't believe it. What looks bad, you know, probably believe that. But uh, 
you know, just give you a quick overview. Uh, our operations count, what I came here is about 20,000, but you know, I haven't paid any of the bills here at that time. So that's going to go down a lot. Um, you know, we started the year about 12,000. I, I think, you know, my prediction will be about 13, 13, 14,000, maybe that range, you know, because we're making some money here. Um, and uh, probably, the, probably the bigger one this year, which was good. I had some help, uh, especially Lori and, and Randy trying to get corporate sponsors. And we appreciate got a corporate sponsor back there. It helped with the, their database there, kind of a dedicated field. But, you know, we got, I think we paid a little bit more attention to our corporate sponsors, which I think is a good thing to do. I, I appreciate people spending time talking to the sponsors that come as well. So that's a, a big one there. Uh, hi. Do you follow the stock markets much? You <laughs> <laughs> managed to actually grow that account in your life. You know, the past years have been very choice on how we've been doing on our sustainable scholarship fund. But right now, uh, you know, around 23,000, but we started about 28,000, you know, this year before things kind of went south. We also took the board out there too. Uh, with 17,000, that will go up. But Probably lost that in the stock market, public speaking or something. Um, give you an idea where um, our our funds come from. And I think these are you know, pretty much about right. Is I mean, right now this this number will go up to about twenty five hundred. You know, comes from our membership dues, and you should look at targets, and it roughly covers what I call the infrastructure. You know, things like uh, if we didn't do the outreach events, we didn't do the conference, and we just had to. You know, do the bread and butter things like follow our reports, you know, have our peel box and you know the basic stuff, the newsletter. Our membership fees pretty closely come in there. Maybe they, you know, you might want to look at raising those at some point in time, but you know, what typically happens though is we make money from our special events and from our conference. So any shortfalls there, you know, we're we're doing well. And for example, like with tabs, we had a nominal fee, I think it was like twenty dollars. And uh you know, we, we have no costs there, but it's good to charge that because we use our website. Our website is, you'll see later, is a, a bigger bigger cost to the, uh, the group there. Um, sponsorships, you know, again, we've done a better year. I separated those out, you know, so we're bringing in good money with sponsorships. I think we should promote that and see if we can expand that a bit. And uh, making double this figure now, that's what we've had so far from donations before the raffle. So, uh, you know, done fairly good with it. Um, just getting donations. Let's list it. People donating. We have kind of four members that I do send letters out to them every year. It's all what we're doing. So been doing a little bit more of that behind the scenes, and uh, and then with the uh, the raffles. And again, for next year, you think raffles? Think of things kind of like what uh, Desiree had. You know, a place to stay that usually brings in more money. Or else dog beds. Dog beds when you see from this one. That's a big surprise. In terms of our expenses, it's probably more detail you ever want to know, but um, these are some of the categories where we do spend our money right now. But you know, obviously we have 1500 going out for the scholarship. And that one is remember we took uh we'll bump that out of our scholarship fund, but uh, because we raised the scholarship um more than what's really kind of sustainable what we have there it seems like a four percent number you know say we're going to take four percent out of the year um we've kind of in a way i won't go into detail there it took some out of our operation fund as well so we did a little split of that um so not all of that 1500 came out of the scholarship fund or else that would really whack that amount given what the market's doing um website's kind of our bigger um uh, fee here, and actually of that number, you just got the lump number there, but just to have the website, renew it every year is about $2,000. Um, we do, in what I well, put in the website, you know, we get money coming through the website and there's transaction fees. And, you know, right now those would be going up because of the, the meeting here, but like $500 is what comes through gets taken out for transaction fees, you know, just to handle it. It's like about 2% figure. And then we've done the website maintenance, and up to now it's been about about six hundred dollars that was spent on that. And the bulk of that coming around uh, putting together this conference, you know, we had to use a little bit of quite a bit to <laughs> do a break and figure out how we handled the rooms and everything like that. So that's where we're spending money, and then you know, so far about three hundred dollars per 
or issue the newsletter. A lot of that's been donated back, so that goes into our um, our scholarship fee. That's what Connie used to do, and Fields maintained that. But you know, we have spent some of that out, and as we get away from the field, Connie uh, benevolence there, you know, are probably going to be paying that out. You know, but it's probably going to pay there. And then I didn't show a lot of the other expenses for things like the filings, things like that, quite more detail than you want. So anyway, they kind of balance it off. You know, we're, we're doing fairly well on our operations. If you remember, try to keep a, at least a, a balance of 4,000, you know, so you can file whatever's above that so that we can have money to plan activities. So like next year, if we do a, couldn't remember, this next year we're going to try to do a WAPA conference. Um, this conference, we paid a lot of expenses at the end, so we had money coming in, which gives us a you know big amount to pay out. We had to pay the bill, and our bill here for this one is about nine thousand. Um, but like for the joint wall conference, we have to front end a lot of money just to hold the room, you know, the hotels. There are some places we do that, so we do need to carry over a fair amount here. So anyway, probably much more detail than you know, on Saturday afternoon. Uh, I'll, I'll put together an end of year report and you know update graphics and maybe try to go over that if, if people want. It's kind of interesting to crawl through the bowels of, or maybe it is an interesting. <laughs> I don't know, but the, the bowels of you know, Ola and how we operate and what happens to the money. Because, but at least it gives you some idea. If we get better ideas of, well, let's you know fund something down in Lake Hebert. You know, we just we kind of take a look here and see what we have coming in, how that money comes in. I guess maybe taking messages. I do think we got some money that we can put towards, um, you know, projects. Theo's always want to get more of an outreach program going, and uh, you know, maybe we could use some money out of here, you know, and do periodic outreaches like if uh, like a bear. There's some monitoring needed, like a you know flow station or something. Maybe we could be a contributor there, you know, something that would do some benefit out of them in the field. There, we don't have a lot of sustainable money for that, but. You know, periodically we might want to do something like that. So, anyway, yeah. Is file paper cuts to your big expense website or what is the big expense? Yeah, like I said, uh, about on that one, about two thirds of that would be uh, wild deck cut. And, you know, for this one right now, and about, you know, so about $2,000 that one was wild deck cut. That's a handy fee. But then, you know, how much money do you bring in? There's a certain transaction fee that I put into the website, kind of comes out of there. So five hundred dollars of that was roughly what they take out for handling payments through the website. And then okay. we've been doing the website maintenance, you know, and updating. Um, that uh, Linda was Keith and Associates, uh, you know, updating our website, and we paid out about six hundred dollars so far this year. Well, yeah, I mean, there should be more of that, but I think a big bulk of that, our first quarterly was about 100 something dollars, but the last one's about, excuse me, about 500. And most of that I would attribute really to be conference expense. So if we committed a certain amount to this over the first while, so she had to sort of continue. Yeah, that. and we probably want to look at that too, because I think. You know, legitimately, like the last payment, the last five hundred dollars, we can call that a conference expense if you want. That's really that's what she was doing. You know, if you look at her charges that we just got, most of that was related to either the conference or the subway. I'll set that up. Yeah, it is. It is. Yeah. Right. And I think I think that's legitimate. I mean, you've seen kind of there's an operational expense on that. So. So my understanding, you correctly, after we pay the expense associated with this meeting, we'll be back down to about eleven or twelve thousand dollars in the operations. Yeah, it'll be up there a little bit because Ms. Pierce pay pay us afterwards. They they sponsored part of this and they also have some expenses that don't okay. have. So it's a movement. So yes, yeah, so it cracked out maybe um, you know, seven thousand out of that. So about thirteen thousand. And then the other question I had, you said five hundred dollars for transaction fees. It just seems like a lot. Like, what percentage does that come out to be? It's, it's like around 2%. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. PayPal? But it's kind of like PayPal. They use something different uh, through Affinity Pay. 
it's a uh, sub you know they would charge us more if we use paypal so we we're in their vendor so and i i can tell you exactly what it is here yeah now, is she operating on any level system to help you out for the past few months she she learned from four months oh okay. so she she has okay. marketing skills for Oh, geez, I turned it off. Right. No, no, no. How do you cancel that? Yeah, cancel. So she was oh. WordPress for me. And then, How do you cancel the turn off? Uh, Sorry, you guys on Zoom. I just accidentally, the uh, projector went to sleep and I accidentally turned it off. Now, okay, let me just let me do the statistic here. It's up for a while. They've got like 2.9 percent plus 30 cents per transaction. That's what they they charge. And if you think about it, um, essentially, you have about 13,000 and more than that now. Again, things are in motion here, but at this point, about 13,000. Pretty much came in through all that stuff. That's all the conference fees, you know, and the membership fees all come through there, and the sponsors, all that money is coming through there. So you, you lose some of that. That's they could be your visa. That's what student funders are paying on that. And unfortunately, if we're using Wild Africa as our vehicle, that's where you're going to be paying. And, you know, you kind of look around it for it. It's a pretty good one, you know, for what we do. Um, and that's going to be typical. I think so. Yeah. I guess if we just go to check to pull and send it to the email box, and we're going to do that. Yeah. Obviously, we never be able to that. Right. That, we, we get a few checks in, but not many. But yeah. it would be awfully hard to keep track of them. It would just be yeah. a headache to, yeah. you know, the, yeah. way, the way we were registering people and so on. It would be yeah. really yeah. hard. Yeah. You know, next year, like we do a wall, but we've used our website. And I think it's pretty high. I take that out of the six months. But these are sometimes don't turn off on again if they're hot. I actually it went to sleep and then I accidentally turned it off. It seems pretty warm. Oh, now it's coming on. Okay, there you go. Okay. Again, some of this information is in the monthly reports. If there's you know ways I can get the information out better, let me know. Or you know, I, I do send it out. I'll try to put slightly breaks down at the end of the year get all of us settled, you know. Unfortunately, here it's usually better to do this face to face, but it's kind of the wrong time. We just, you know, got in the most money, but we haven't spent it, so I can't give you the year end picture. So, you know, if we get together some other time, we can go through this in more detail. But, but you know, the take home message is, you know, we're still trying to grow our scholarship fund to a sustainable level, so we want to keep those efforts up, you know, and, uh, um, we, you know, I think for operations, we're doing fairly well. We don't have funded money to do stuff, or, you know, we, we can take some ideas and I'll squawk if I think we're trying to spend too much. But so far, I think it's usually our operations account has been growing every year because I don't think we're getting very exotic in our spending. You know, I think the first doing the maintenance on the website, which I think is a good thing, is by your first expenditure. So we're doing that way. And again, we've had some assistance from Mark and others to do that. Yeah. Any questions? Thanks. Thank you. That wasn't an hour. Yeah. <laughs> really. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Andy. Um, so Andy mentioned here expenditures for ABIT, which I have yeah talked about. I, I have the sense now that there's with the Salmon Lakes Act money, there's probably enough money there. And I heard uh, Randy and Tammy talking, and ran, Randy further with others about the citizen science thing. So, you know, that's another possibility for, for using part of that um, operations. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. There it is. Uh, Laura's not here, I think, unfortunately, but she's the, been the student director for maybe three years now, two, two years at least. Um, she's about to finish her PhD at PSU. She's electing not to continue. She's been the secretary the last year. She was a scholarship recipient a few years ago, uh, 2019. Uh, I, my opinion, she's done an incredible job. She's sort of stepped up when the stuff was needed. You know, who would think the student prep would 
volunteered to be the secretary. Uh, it's really, really good. And uh, so very much thanks, Lara, although you're not hearing this. I think she, she knows that we appreciate her. And that then leads to uh, an introduction of, of Ivan, who we heard from. And Ivan, here's a picture of you and what you wrote. Why don't you tell us about you? And very much a welcome onto the board from, from us here. Thank you. Um, well, uh, I was raised and born in Southern Chile. I'm now visiting my family and in my sabbatical leave. And uh, I was um, working with the rivers and lakes here for many years, uh, working in the invasion of salmonids uh, and beaver, uh, beavers. And um, I am a quantitative aquatic ecologist. I do a lot of things with um, statistical approaches to resolve uh, problems related to uh, freshwater and conservation. I teach uh, um, uh, the former lim limnology class at OSU, and um, I also teach uh, endangered species and society uh, a back core class. And I'm really happy to be part of the Oregon Lake Association now because I have some work in reservoirs uh, mostly, but I would like to keep expanding my, my work in also in, in lakes. So I'm happy to be part of this, the, the, the association. Super, Ivan. So we, we have, I think I must have told you, we have uh, monthly board meetings uh, by Zoom. On uh, We've been doing them, what, Thursdays at um, 3, 2.30, I think, or 3.30 3 to 5. So, um, yeah. So I send out an agenda um, of, of, in, in the preceding week, at least a few days before, and um, then we have a discussion. Yeah, great. Awesome. So the last slide then is, is this one here. This is the slate of directors. So we have these two year terms. You're, you're on the hook for two years, Ivan. And thank you. Um, and so, as I keep saying, I am very happy for somebody else to be the president. It's, I'm, I'm happy to be doing it, but I'll renew now. But if somebody is wanting to train up to do that, uh, to Get, get, get your mind in the frame to be the president in 2024, please do so. Because I think it's good to there to be turnover. Uh, Andy Shadell is again continuing to be the treasurer. Thanks, Andy. I'm sure Andy would, wouldn't mind if somebody else were to do it, but you're doing a super job. So, yeah, <laughs> so we're sort of back with the name. It's like in the last few years. <laughs> we're pretty happy for you to be doing it. Uh, as I said, Lara was the secretary, so we do need somebody from the board to step up to be secretary. So if you could please be thinking about that. And, and hopefully at the November meeting, somebody will, will volunteer, please. Um, so also renewing is Tony. Are you there, Tony? No. I am. I'm muted, oh, but I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. Yeah, yes. good. Good. So you're, you're up for another two years, as is Desiree. Thank you. Y yes, you're welcome. Yeah. And, um, and then the, the intermediate terms, uh, Ron and Dan and uh, Tammy, uh, Randy and uh, Laurie are, um, are up, uh, up in the middle of their terms. So that's our board with Ivan joining. We uh, had a student director for the first time, maybe four years ago now, and Lara has been the second person. So um, we should be looking for a student. Uh, Ivan, if you have any students at OSU, um, maybe mention that to them, see if there's interest. Uh, if we, at PSU, the, those who have connection at PSU, uh, if we don't have a student member for a year, that's fine. There's, there's not an obligation, but we would like to have that. Um, so, is there anybody else who wants here who wants to be on the board who's not whose name is not up there? Nobody. Okay. So that's our slate. Uh, can we have a general uh, vote, yay or and or nay, uh, in relation to this? So first, a vote. Those in favour, uh, uh, sing out a yay or raise your vote, your hand. Aye. Aye. What did you say, Tony? 
Um, I'm, I'm a yes. That meant to be a yes. I'm a yes. <laughs> right. it's for me. I'm so, really excited about voting. <laughs> well, well you, you put our feet to the fire about being procedurally correct. So. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. 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 And is there any other business, new business? Anything want to, anybody want to discuss? Anything? We've got a schedule for the coming year to get it all together again. Yeah. Meetings, the like appreciation budget committee meetings, having a pandemic in next year. Lots of uh, have a meeting and then maybe talk about the presentation next year. Yep. Yep. So the, so, okay. So the Cyano Haps we've always done in February or March. I think I'll be traveling. Uh, maybe to mid February. So, if we plan for late February, that's probably good. It's it's a good time. It's a, it's way after the bloom season's finished. It's um it's before the Forest Service, for instance, starts to send out their um, field people to start preparing the the camp campgrounds. In uh, and they're relevant because because you know some of those are on um, uh, lakes. So yeah. So we'll do. You'll be involved again. Good. Yeah, we can. Yep. Yep. Exactly. Um, a lake appreciation uh, event would be really good. So be thinking about a lake at which we could do that. We had mentioned Lost Lake, perhaps from the Mount Hood, right? The potential. Where, where, where is it? So, is it high up near Government Camp? North, north of Bulga. So you go up from the Sandy Valley or something. Yeah. Now you kept calling it a retreat. Uh, I didn't think it sort of developed. That was a surprise to me because I didn't think it was sort of developed as a retreat. I thought it was more an outreach sort of thing. But um, what do we? More, uh, what I initially heard was a board retreat. But no. Well, because we used to do that. We'd, yeah. we'd had a board retreat. We'd also had uh, just a lake outing where we, we got Andy organized one. I think, did you organize? I think you did, didn't you? Up at um, um, somewhere near Swan Island or up, up, up there. Yeah, we did out on the lakes. Yeah, yeah. So we've done those sort of things. So what would be the objective? To have a retreat to get us together if, you know, face to face, rather than just have the Zoom meetings, which are always a little bit time pressed. So, you know, you know, you could have a, a retreat where you focus on, say, strategy or bigger sort of issues can be nice. Or, or is it more something like to interact with the public about lines, which which we did a little bit of at Sutherland. <laughs> Oh, that's hard for the way from problems they're having. It'd be interesting to find out what's happening there. It's 
you know, again, the five more issues there than answers. So, are there so, any lake areas that are reopened to the public in this year to the wildfire? So, I don't see the difference in the tenants and the space between the wildfire and the place to play in the long term lakes. Because Waldo became an uh, outstanding water. Mm -hmm. You know, the way too, if, if we think a little bit ahead on our, maybe we don't have to answer this for now, but think about, about our conference a little bit, where, what, you know, some ideas. You know, one, one thing that used to happen, or maybe not should happen, you know, we talked about Sakai, so they like did spring right into this and mm -hmm. brought that back. So we did kind of a theme here that. I think some people are passionate about that too, you know, of course. And uh, it would be kind of nice to build something like that too. You know, for example, the town that we're talking, maybe you want to jump ahead of where the next conference would be, but and then maybe think of a like appreciation that would have something to do with that. Yeah, so we don't need a solution now, but yes, yeah. as Andy says, be thinking about it and let's let's sort of make a mental commitment. Because in the past, we have tried to have, I think two years went by, we were trying to find a common date and it just wasn't possible. Meaning that, you know, we all sort of, all, enough of us had um, something that was a bit of a higher priority. So if we mentally sort of say now, all right, we're going to do it, it. You know, it's a little bit different in terms of, of planning. The only other thing I'd also mention is, um, you also just need to look at putting sponsorship for a meeting again. Like this year, for like the Society of Martial Arts Science, so Cinema of Arts Science, they have a meeting on this. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there might be a piece of work for the like course and just have a meeting. Yeah, similar, uh, you know, focus on different aspects of our technology, but it might be a little bit of a project in some of the cases. Well, we're all over there. Yeah, I would just say, as long as there's a similar size and don't sort of don't, don't totally dwarf us. Yeah, it's. it's I'd say in general, it's at least prior to the pandemic, it was similar in size. A lot of the Well, would uh, would people be agreeable if Dan and Ivan sort of uh, just sort of um, thought about that and made it made an approach and see see where, where <laughs> if they have plans for a location, see if that might suit us and we could. What was it? Uh, the Society of Sweatwater Science. <laughs> yeah, Matt's in the Society of Sweatwater Science. And this is one of those chapters that will have meetings and stuff at the time of the year. I think they're meeting in the next week. I can't remember. What, what was the old name? Uh, North American Ventilogical Society. Yeah. Waterlogical? Ventilogical Society. It's a Society of Sweatwater Science for a while. Speaking of the meeting, though, I think we should check in if you like and remember. Next year was a co co meeting with Walter uh, or not. We had that out there. We're thinking 23 or 24, somewhere out there. Yeah, we had, we, we did reply to them in the affirmative. Yeah. But yeah, as Andy said, we're not remembering which year that was. Well, this is serious. <laughs> yeah, all right. And uh, and for, for venues for next year, I mean, I have thought. In the Chiwa can since we're doing so much there. But they say that there's not, the locals down there say there's not really the, the accommodation. Yeah. 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 They might have somebody there you know, for, for a long period. Uh, you know, the two things that number one, we're probably more confined to Portland, yeah. Vancouver area, yeah. you know, number one. But we are, you know, we did talk about, you know, this one kind of suffered from lack of student participation. <clears throat> one time we did talk about Corbell's, you know, perhaps there that would be high students, but probably low on nearby lakes and things like that. Um, we never had the Corvallis meeting, did we? We were planning yeah. for 2019 yeah. and the, um, oh, 20, 
I think we even planned it earlier. I think I think it got bumped by the um, pandemic. I mean, I'm kind of, my third suggestion is to have ideas. I love this being coming to a lodge, being out late. You know, I better do that. But I'm old. I can travel and stay here. But Diamond Lake has been one that's also been that sticky. And it's kind of came away from Portland, going towards South Southern Lake or yeah. Lake Haber. But, you know, being one that we may want to keep on in the back of our minds sometimes. We've had a number of meetings there. It's always a good spot. We try to think really if we can reserve, like, a, you know, cabins or something. That's a, a great venue. Is this a slow period there for the, the visitation? Um, it's been there a couple of times, I think, around this time period, and it seemed to work out. Mm -hmm. Things changed. So mm -hmm. I'm not sure. Yes. Yeah. Well, but we better find out if we had that Walpo commitment. And um, so we'll, we'll know for the <coughs> November meeting. Any other new business or, or discussion? You know, it's kind of one other observation, just all expression of mind here. I really like this meeting. I thought we set up, you know, especially yesterday was great. Starting, you know, we have the initiative of tribes and trying to get more action. Did this, you know, that's perfect. It's beautiful. I thought that was a great way to do it. And even like that, I like being out of the lake. So like the, the two where you know we focus around the lake for one day, you know, you haven't done that. And I thought that'd be really refreshing. I just think you might want to think about that. And, in some of these conferences there, and then, then you know, going into general other issues is, is good. But you know, I really enjoyed yesterday, and uh, to my mind, that was a really better place to do this. You know. I, I actually I learned a lot yesterday. Yeah. I yeah. would say that. Yeah. Like, I don't know anything about fishing, and so I had a low bar, but I learned a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to that. Yeah. yeah. I know it wouldn't be the wall of one. I do kind of like that niche, and maybe if you go to areas, I think you should explore bringing tribes in. Here's some of the first people that are in that area. So they use those big little efforts to seek that out. I think that's pretty valuable, and that's part of our, our values. So let's try to retain that in future meetings. Now, Mark has talked to us, to us, to us about NARS, and and I saw a note somewhere amongst my stuff recently that we sort of said we'd consider 2025. Is that the one? I think that's the yeah. yeah, yeah. With you know, we checked with Walter, we'd do it together. Um, we went supporting NARMS conference from the national. Oh, yeah. yeah. But Mark, the, the thing was that I got really spooked when I looked into that the first time you asked because the <clears throat> the expectation is that the local people design the entire program, and that's a huge amount of work. And I, I frankly, the lot of me don't understand the logic of that. I, I'm, I'm sort of used to what American Society of Virology does, and there, there's a there's a committee that does the program because the program is the wishes of the entire uh, uh, society, you know, or, or or association, not not the local chapter. Yeah, and so we, but, but give the local chapter the 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 okay to do one say one session or design some um, workshops or something some animal. But that, on all this, there's there's a local a host community put together that's comprised of uh, some of the knowledge board members and, and the group of folks in the um, in the host city with the idea that. Um, so when the events and things like that are going to take place, the host, the folks at the host committee are the ones that know about it, right? They're familiar with the area of the region. They're familiar with the type of science that's going on in the region and those kind of things. A lot of the talks are, I think 25 or 30% of the talks are more than are the same folks that are talking over here. Um, not necessarily local, but kind of national. There's just still in the pipeline. Others put out a call for paper and all the papers and then it's usually filled up completely by the same, you know, not, not filled, but a good portion of it is, is, is filled by the usual suspects. Uh, and then you, all, you always have the usual uh, sponsors and things like that. So 
and 2025, I, I figure I will be um, chairing the first committee for the event. This is like the new dog and wing issue of friends' homes and all this. And um, I chose 2025 because we're going to have to be done later. Um, right now, it's in the middle of construction. This is the most fabulous, fabulous day to get this thing done. So um, that's kind of, that's, that's, so, well, that's a big for you to say that you would be the chair of it. That's a big um, help because <clears throat> it's certainly going to take some work from from both of us. Yeah, yeah. Sort of and I will be on the house board as well. Hey, Mark. Uh, yeah. Is that Mark Rosencrantz that was talking? Yes. Okay. Hey, um, I was just wondering. I thought that Shannon Bradabo told me that some of those uh, conditions that Theo mentioned kind of spooked him were going to be somewhat revamped to kind of shift some of those responsibilities away from NOMS chapter boards. Um, is, maybe I'm misremembering, but, and I, I apologize, I couldn't hear you very well, so maybe, maybe you address that, but have, have those been changed or is it the same? Well, it's not, it's kind of interesting because it, a lot of it depends on the capabilities of the host committee. And um, you know, the, the, the issue is there's only two staff people on, on NOMS and they don't have time to do this kind of stuff because they have the day-to-day -day obligations. There's a lot of the backend stuff that the staff folks do, but, um, and there's a lot of help that they provide to the host committee, but um, a lot of the host committee stuff um, has to, you know, it has to be done by them. Now, yeah, I, when I looked at that first, um, that first application, yeah, it was, there was a lot of stuff to do, you know, coming up with commitments for uh, sponsors, commitments for talks and, and these kind of things, but NOMS provides a lot of help with that stuff. So it's not entirely up to me. Um, and that's kind of what the chair of the, the host committee does is kind of wrangles all that stuff and figures out um, how to navigate it. Actually, Shannon's going to be the, um, she's the incoming, or she's um, put herself up for the position of treasurer. Yeah, treasurer coming into mall. So she'll be evolving the next uh, three years. So I'll be able to look her into uh, helping out with that too. So. I don't think it's. I don't think it's going to be as daunting as what um, uh, what everybody thinks. Tony, he described that uh, the, on that committee there would be some other um, members from the, the the from the NAMS membership um, who 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 were not just locals, and that's. I don't think that was the case previously. But still, I would I would sort of suggest that NAMS set up a program committee. Just not, not, not the staff members. You want the scientists doing it. You don't want the staff members deciding what the talks are, but, but just set up a, a say, a six person um, program committee. Well, that's kind of what the host committee does. There's a program, there's a committee. Yeah, but the, committee, ho but the, pro but the host committee, committee is also doing all the nuts and bolts of finding the damn, you know, hotel and uh, millions of other little things. It's, it's just far too much. Just why, why don't you have a committee do the, do the bulk of the, of yeah, the program? Yeah, the program committee. There's a there's a host committee and then there's a programming committee, um, and you know they kind of work together for uh, for lining up the speakers. Okay, move a bit, <laughs> a bit more of that work to the to the to the uh, program committee, but but yeah, I think Tony, I think the way I heard Mark describe it is that it was a bit different than we heard three years ago. So what I can do, I, that's three years down the road, so um, I can help kind of. You know, the nice thing about it is if we, I don't even know if we're going to be able to do it. Uh, I don't know what the NOM schedule is for, for the, the rotation, but if there's, a, because we'll have to put in a proposal and then they'll look at the other proposals that are available at that time to see if it's even, it's even viable. Actually. But we can, in the meantime, just kind of figure out what the, what the task load is going to be and, um, Start putting feelers out there to see what um, you know, what what their what the interest is going to be for the folks to participate in this region. There was another issue a few years ago. It was that the 
the amount of money that we would end up with was really ra rather puny. I think it was less than we would get, we, we have been getting from the joint conference. And yet the amount of work was just truly kind of staggering. So uh, that did not look like a deal a person would want to enter. Yeah, into. That's, that's always been a, yeah. And, it, and the, with, from the non standpoint, the incentive is you put on a good program, you bring in a lot of sponsors, you make more money kind of a thing. So um, it's all a matter of how much work the, the host committee puts in. And yeah, it can, it can be kind of daunting in that order. But, um, so you get, there, there's rewards at the end of it, I suppose. So, yeah, so, but, but so we can talk about that more later. I mean, yeah, there are a few changes down. and just for you to decide to, to announce that you would be the key person is kind of important too, because otherwise that was going to be a question, big question mark. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's not like you, you know, you pose and you compete. It's like, you know, the Olympics or something. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I mean, it's not like there's, like this. We might be the only one. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's exactly right. Yeah, we might be the only ones. And, um, but by the same token, if there's one in, there's one on the West Coast. They typically don't like to have the next one on the West Coast. So they're they're talking about to see the next one, see it's Minnesota, then I think um, San Diego or California. They're talking about it, and then uh, Pennsylvania, and maybe somewhere in the you know somewhere in the Northeast too. They're going to put a, put uh, together a proposal. So. I don't know if we're going to be competing with anybody. We may be competing. When would that happen? Oh, well, probably in the next year or so. We don't have three years to worry about it. Well, it'd be nice to be able to get a commitment in the pipeline so that, you know, as the scheduling goes through, it's like, well, okay, we've got one for 2025. Uh, and uh, you know, it doesn't have to be fully fleshed out this, this first year. It's just, a, it's a, is it a commitment that the local chapter is, is it, is the local chapter commit, committed to putting in the work to do this event? And then the, then the next, you know, and then we could just, I'm sure there's some folks around here that can um, commit to some, some sponsorship money. Um, and then kind of go from there. And then, it wouldn't be hard to put together a list of speakers and sponsorship money um, for the event, just based on what 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 the speakers are involved in and the speakers are are here. So should we... Can I make a suggestion? Sure. Um, uh, at least Theo and I will be at WAPA next week, and I know Shannon's going to be there because she's chairing my session. Um, so I think that it would be valuable to um, maybe provide Shannon with a list of questions before, and maybe we can carve out a few minutes to just get some answers, and then Ola Board can talk about it at our next meeting. I mean, it's, it seems to me that if Walpa is interested in doing a joint meeting, then it then let's go to the next level and make it a joint uh, regional meeting with NOMS, if it makes sense. Um, I mean, sure we, always, we always did talk with doing it together with Walpa, and, okay. and 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 that two thousand that that note I, I said I found was in response to talking with Jen about that. Okay, Just great. In. Yeah, the last joint one wasn't that successful um, once Spokane um, for a variety of reasons. So there's we kind of left with that. Tasting folks now, but I think if we have an Portland, you'll have better attendance and, and look at better outcome. But I don't, you know, the, the other the other factor that we always look into is what are the roommates. And that's a, that's a huge <coughs> issue when they're trying to find venues. Is they like to keep the room rates around 120 a night or so, less than 150 a night, and if they can't negotiate a hotel price for you know less than 160 170 a night that you know there's not going to be 
for I guess they because what they're what they're targeting for is the maximum amount that the government will pay for to stipend somebody to come. And if the rooms are too expensive, then they're not you're, you're not going to get the major attendance by the USGS and, and EPA and all those all those folks. So you know it, 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 there's a lot of that becoming distracted. So Mark, do you suggest we should know that? No, or that's something that we commit. No, that's something that the, that's something that the office executive director, yeah, yeah, he figures that out. But let's uh, next week have a discussion with with uh, Walpa, Tony. That sounds good. I'll send Shannon a note and, and maybe good. she can and uh, uh, rope other appropriate Walpa folks in, into it. Is Jen still the um, president? She's outgoing. Uh, so I think that I don't know how their board is structured, but that might still leave her being on the board as a as a past president. I'm not quite sure if they they work that way, but she's rotating off. I, I know that as president, she's rotating off. Okay. And Brandy? So I, I guess I could build an argument that indeed if we're halfway serious today, even about a 2025 moms conference in Portland, then for next year, having uh, our annual conference in Corvallis, where we could do some, maybe some pretty serious student recruitment. Um, yes, for a student director, but maybe for um, you know student memberships. Um, thinking about students that might be willing to help organize for a 2025 event. It may not be too soon to bring it that way. It's a good idea. Yeah, because it's always good to have a big student component mm -hmm. at, at these meetings. So I guess I'm assuming as well that if OSU could be recruited in that kind of way, students, um, you know, the Center for Lakes and Reservoirs of Portland State would be kind of an automatic as well. Well, at OSU, there's a huge amount of water stuff. Yeah. Uh, but it's not really connected with us or with NAMS. It's, mm -hmm. it's, um, where, Ivan, where do your students hang out? And Desiree's not here, but it's not with nuns, is it? Where? So, sorry, I didn't with, listen. With, with, with which societies do your students uh, associate? Uh, Society for, for Fresh Water Science and uh, American Fisheries Society. Those are the main ones. See, we've got a huge amount of of water stuff at OSU, but we don't have a lot of people who are connected with NARS. So, yes, correct. Um, I might argue that we just need some more bodies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, PSU might be, you know, yes. is just as viable as, yep. as OSU. Yeah, is it? yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so Mark, I think let us know, as to Tammy's point, if we've got to decide by next year, you know, uh, yeah. Okay. And I must say, we I think we, you know, we talked about this Abert stuff. That could become a real time sink for like <laughs> Tammy, me, Trish, and Ron. And and it's just super important. I, I'm going to make that, you know, quite a bit more important than the NAMS meeting. So we can only do so much. We'll just have to kind of see. But yeah. Yeah, good. Any other things? Future meetings, Tammy and I can talk maybe a little bit more about citizen science. The whole world is a big old oyster right now. So. Good. <laughs> good. Yeah. Good. Uh, yeah. The, the, the viral oh, supply. Oh, yeah, right. So. Good. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Ivan. Um, enjoy the rest of your sabbatical. And we'll let you know about the November um, board meeting. All right. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Have fun. Bye. Bye, Tony. <laughs> bye, everyone. I wish I could be See there. I hope you all had a great time. I heard lots of laughter, which was awesome. Thanks. See you next week, Tony. <laughs> sounds good. Bye bye. Bye. Are you there, Ron?
Okay. All right. Mission, uh, meeting closed. Thank you. Um, not, I don't know.